on Twitter. It's the gayest soy thing you can do. Shut the fuck up, you little tater tot bitch. We are two minutes and 35 seconds into this video. I'm just as gay as the rest of us, motherfuckers. Just the same. Another sunny day in LA. Everything is fine. So they say. Wonder what the news is today. Cause I know that every day I'm at this fucking job. Her son is streaming. Watch him on the clock. Oh, yeah. Oh, this Listen, bro, the Lyra I does not a, need this. Crazy people crazy. love playing Hearts of Iron anymore. Eating pussy is the basic the bare minimum gun. thing you can do. You can do like you Where have a fucking fat penis people, dude, and women want to have sex. Your job is posting, bro. you're gay. Oh, okay. God, I don't I make hate women move. so much. Is he really a socialist? He's such a himbo. I can handle it. And a house, and it's better than mine. How the fuck can I sit here? California, Los Angeles, folks. We're live and alive, and I hope all the boys, girls, and MBs are having a fantastic one at 64 degrees and sunny out here in California, Los Angeles. That was Teresa Sweetheart, Hassan, a streaming theme song for my favorite socialist himbo official video seven months ago. Came out, and what a banger it is. Why do you look like you're about to read some slam poetry? Because I am whatever you say I am. And if I wasn't, then why would I say I am? And in the paper, the news, every day I am. Bars. I'm the most swagged out white boy at the at the slam poetry session. Um, boomer ass stream. Ah, eh, shut up. Funny biracial slam poetry. Someone who is three fourths. Okay, okay, all right. Jesus Christ, we came in hot. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, and MBs, the Santa Anna wins are actually going crazy nutty mode. Let me tell you, it's like, it's so heavy that if I don't actually close my door and lock it, if I like accidentally don't uh, push my door in all the way, and I got a pretty heavy ass door, it will open it. It slams it open. It is windy as hell here in California, Los Angeles. However, it is also beautiful and sunny regardless of 64 degrees. And this is the part of the broadcast where I tell you a little bit about my personal news about what's going on in the world of Asana and Ivy Piker. And let me tell you, a lot has occurred. That's right. Just kidding. Not really. Um, but I have... I have personally been enjoying myself. Last night, I ended the broadcast after a short nine and a half hour stream, basically a half day. And what did I do? I made myself a little brekkie sendo, yeah? Brekkie sendo, fucking hell. And then afterwards, I watched a little bit of Warrior, but not a lot. Played a little bit of Yakuza, but not a lot. Half day. Um, what else did I do? What did I watch? What did I watch? Oh, I tried watching Ninja Kamui and I did not like it. Sorry. Sorry. Don't get mad at me. I tried watching Ninja Kamui or is it, am I saying it right? I don't know. It was not that good. Not valid. Sorry. Apologies. It was not that good. What is this? I look like the French Algerian singer, Soul King. Okay. I'll take it. Anyway, as I was saying, I didn't personally like it that much. It's not for me. I will be continuing on to uh, not valid. You are deranged. I just don't know. I, I don't know why uh, it, it just wasn't for me. I thought like I watched the first episode and it was like, sure, the action choreography is great, but like what's going on? You know what I mean? Like it didn't hook me at all. It didn't hook me at all. 
it's like kind of the background. Like I didn't feel invested in the family at all. Like the the corny, cheesy like guitar session wasn't great. Tell your moms to stop banning opposing opinions. This chat is legit an echo chamber. It's cringe. There's no debating in this channel. Just bans on opposition, Lamau. I think there is a testament to be said about like the fucking worst person on the planet. Uh, previously, in in prior years, okay, before the internet, if someone just like kind of came in to your to your this uh, video has been corner, made right? Like if you let's say you're having a little gathering somewhere, okay. And if someone actually came in and busted through the door and was like, everybody, calm down. I'm here. You have to pay attention to me. In the physical space, that kind of behavior used to get your ass beat, right? Like, people would beat the fucking shit out of you. And I think that was cool. Like, I think some people do deserve to get their asses beat. People like that. Like, but nowadays, online, you can kind of do that. And then also, like, demand some kind of, like, political retribution for your behavior. As though you're basically, you're literally streaming, it's an open door. Yeah, well, it's not when we shut it to you. You know what I mean? It's not. That's the whole point. I, the only reason why it is, is because unlike many of my counterparts... I do actually allow it to be that way. And that's why when people get really fucking annoyed, imagine a politician said this, brother, you have the brain of someone with fetal alcohol syndrome after a very devastating car crash. If you are making a comparison to a fucking dumbass Twitch streaming in his living room to fucking open forum politicians, which they actually do, by the way, they do kick people out when they're being disruptive. I haven't even gone through my personal news yet. And this fucking asshat is in here losing his goddamn mind. This is not a serious forum, idiot. Learn, learn, learn things. Learn the world, okay? Understand it might be important to you because you have nothing going on in your life. But, like, this is, in deeply, this is a deeply unserious place, Okay. And I think the reason why, and I will admit this, the reason why I assume there's going to be a lot more annoying people in the chat today is because I said Israel-Palestine debate in the title because I realized that Lex Friedman finally posted the Israel-Palestine debate between Norm Finkelstein and, uh, and, and Benny Morris. You literally just admitted to banning opposing beliefs? Yes, of course. Sometimes I do that when people are being fucking annoying. I currently am giving you a forum to be annoying, though. Half the time, if I don't ban motherfuckers like you, let's be real, I try to bring them on to the stream, and then they fucking shit their diapers. They shit their diapies. You shit your fucking diapies when you want to come on. I'm like, all right, here you go. Here's my forum. Go ahead. I get if it's hate speech or something bannable, but you ban people for literally disagreeing. I'm going to die. No, I ban people for being fucking annoying. I ban people for being fucking annoying, and I have every right to do so. This is not like a fucking public forum. You're being banned from a Twitch stream. Live your goddamn life, big homie. Please go out and touch fucking grass. We just started. I haven't even fucking blasted off yet. There's only fucking 8,000 people in here. There's not even 10,000 people in here. And you're like, me, 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 me first, me first. <clears throat> anyway, you could have ignored my chat. Bro, I swear to God, it takes so much. I know this is like, a, 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 a uh, testament to how much of a child I am personally. But sometimes, like, we sometimes there's a word you want to use in this situation, right? Like, to describe someone. And I feel like, like, it just takes so much out of me not to say it. You know what I mean? It's just like, bro, wow, that's fucked up. Yes, bro, it's fucked up. Your brain is fucked up. Your brain is fucked up. I actually have a disorder. Yeah, I can tell, dog. It's called being a fucking asshole. Jesus Christ. You have a disorder. It is true. It's called narcissism. That's the disorder. It's called thinking that everyone has to fucking stop at your beck and call and just hyper-focus on you. Bro, hit the disorder card. I know, bro. It's called narcissistic personality disorder. We know. Pay attention to me. D had to have gotten slapped around if they're already being this annoying. I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't watched, I only watched the beginning of it and it was like, 
like an 18 minute intro from Norm Finkelstein uh, detailing Benny Morris's own personal work against him. So I thought it was pretty awesome. Projecting. Oh, uh, bro, you always choose the most hurt chatters to debate. Dot, 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 L. Okay, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do a purge today, probably. Good job playing into his narcissism. It's just so, you make it so easy to completely derail or stream them out. I know, guys, I know. The problem is, I want to be able to foster conversations. And when I do that, there's a lot of fucking dickheads that want to take advantage of that. You go to therapy, I fucking should. That's the point. And I don't think chatters, I think chatters see streamer yell at chat and chatters think, oh, streamer yell at chat. I am chatter. This is just like he is yelling at me. Not realizing that like, no, I personally have cultivated this space specifically so that we can have conversations with it, so that like my favorite thing is when someone comes in here and is like genuinely confused about a, a subject matter and is like, can you please help me? I'm frustrated. I don't really understand it. Can you please explain this? That's my favorite shit to do. That's why I do what I do. But that's but in order to be able to do that successfully, I always I always uh, will open up this line of communication to every single person unconditionally. I don't do subscriber only chat. All you need to do is follow for 10 minutes, right? And and some people take advantage of that to be fucking annoying. That's the issue. Can you don Lamont that ass already? Don't ban me for this. I, unironically, I started going to therapy when you told me years ago to be normal. You unironically should go to therapy. It helped me so fucking much. Holy shit, it helps. I have a psychologist who calls me every Wednesday to help me unravel. It's so good. And it stopped me personally from unaliving myself in a video game too. Yeah, I mean, that's like, you're talking chronic depression. Like, it, obviously, uh, being suicidal is like a little bit different than my situation. I think part of the problem is like, I legitimately don't know who the fuck I could talk to about my issues. Like, you know what I mean? Who the fuck is going to be like, oh, wow, you're being gang stalked. Um, that's a mental illness that you probably have. How am I going to describe the circumstances? Uh, <laughs> how am I going to describe the circumstances of like the, the <laughs> being the, in the crosshairs of like multiple different ideologies online that are running rampant having like uh, collected enemies like fucking Pokemon over the past 10 years of doing socialist commentary online very publicly, very visibly, and now have like basically a, just a massive, massive community of cyber stalkers that like legitimately get money to cyber stalk and make my life a living hell. Who the fuck am I going to talk to about that? Maybe Dr. K. I guess that's it. That's the one guy. <sighs> Hello, sir. Remember the show where the guy spent 20 uh, millions of dollars in 20 years built into his dream house on the beach in England? The show uploaded several seasons to YouTube, and I think you would love it. Oh, my God. It's the crazy house. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a look at it. Honestly, yeah, I don't need therapy. I need to disconnect. You know what I mean? Um, the Mar watch the rocket launch this morning. You mean the rocket boom? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, um, let's get started. Let's get started. Therapy doesn't make the cyber stalking go away, chat. I don't know why y'all jump on this every time Hassan's being harassed. I know. All right. You've been saying that since the elections wrapped up in 2020. <clears throat> you ever have the urge to just go to Japan? Yes, I do all the time. Um, okay, 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 okay. Listen to me. Listen to me. This morning, I gave uh, an interview to, I believe he's a Hasanabi head. He seemed like one uh, who works at PR, PR Magazine. I don't know. It's like one of those like, Trade publications about TikTok, the Tic Tac band, the Tic Tac Toe. Um, I played guys Destiny lost a debate, so they're here to take it out on Hassan. I suspect that that is probably the case, but we will, uh, of course, like losing a debate is idiotic when it comes to the issue of Israel Palestine. By the way, just want to point that out because like it doesn't fucking matter. You could be the greatest, most like you could be the best. The absolute fucking best, most alpha dog, alpha brained Israel defender. It doesn't matter. You're just the best genocide denier at that point. You know what I'm saying? Like, who the fuck wants to be that? Sick, man. Wow, you really debated, uh, you really debated into the ground like 30,000 dead women and children that Israel has killed in this last round of the ethnic cleansing. You did it. You did it. You fucking popped off, baby. It doesn't even matter no more, actually. I'm totally on board with genocide now. Are we just skipping personal news altogether? Honestly, there isn't much in the personal news category, so I am skipping the personal news, and I'm going right into it, okay? I'm going right into it, baby. I was so excited to shit on Ninja Kamui. Kamui? 
I think it's just kind of mid. It's not for me. If you liked it, then, you know, more power to you. I didn't personally like it. Yeah. Um, Finkelstein X Morris Israel Palestine debate. The show starts to get good at season two. Ninja Kamui, it, it's out already. Season two is out. I thought it was the first season. The fuck? Uh, wait, did you take Kai for a walk? She feels heckin' tired. I did not just take Kai out for a walk. I took her out to the park where she ran around a lot and wrestled with a bunch of uh, doggos. So she's just, she's completely petered out at this point. She's done. Um, Finkelstein Morris is real Palestine debate. Bro, I thought I dodged anime tier list, man. Fuck, what? Wants regime change in Israel. And more. Get in now. Ninja Kamui. Um, it gets better in season two. Signs of a mid show not worth watching. We have a little community in our complex that we all meet at 430 on our tennis course so our dogs can play and we can pass blunts around. That's awesome. You have a favorite Shogun character? Mine's Lady Mudiko. Oh, same. Um, actually, I kind of like Uncle a lot too. What's the guy? The general? I do like the general. Uncle Yoshi? Yeah, the cuck. Yeah, the traitor. Listen, listen. I think what you call a traitor, I call a guy who is a brilliant tactician. That's what I think. Yeah, his son is an incel and a loser and will never get pussy. He's a no pussy have an ass bitch. Actually, anyway, he's a traitor and he's trading employers. Yeah, dude, leverage, like hedge your bets. You know what I mean? Hedge your freaking bets, son. Hedge your freaking bets. Get some leverage out here. Can we do some hogwash today? It's my favorite. Hell yeah, we can do some hogwash today. Um, tomorrow I am going to have Hey Big Mike on, okay? Also known as uh, Michael Malak. Shouts out to Michael. Mike is going to be on the stream tomorrow. Uh, he is Logan Paul's co-host on Impulsive, as you guys might know. Uh, we are going to be talking. We're going to be doing hogwash with him. He is... Uh, I would say one of the most loyal soldiers to liberalism on Twitter. He just refuses to let go and will regularly try to duke it out with some of the most insane people you've ever encountered by trying to talk them off of a ledge like a goddamn social worker, possibly because like he has a lot of experience in specifically that side of like having brain issues, considering his background, considering that he is like a big time, you know, uh, former addict, uh, recovery guy. You know, he is also incredibly chronically online. I have a lot of respect for him, uh, and we are going to do that. We are going to uh, try to broach the subject together uh, tomorrow. Uh, very, very excited. Did you see the couple get arrested at the $8 million makeup retail theft ring? Some of those videos that went viral were from people doing their stealing. Yo, that's crazy. I'm so new to politics and you can make fun of me all you want, but please, what the fuck does fascism mean? His definition has so many words I don't understand. English is my second language. Fascism is is a, a, a devastating political ideology that is self-defeating inherently that is uh, about constantly seeking out an out-group that you must eliminate in order to protect an in-group in, in the simplest terms. There you go. I did not use the big words, I think. Um... There's a huge case of internet about a black lady being forcefully arrested in her own place with the presence of her son filming the fucked up policeman. Uh, what did you think of the fresh and fat debate with Ethan? Did you talk about it? I just saw one part of it where they were trying to defend their like insane anti-Semitism by being like, well, your podcast co-host, like he criticizes Israel way more than we do. And it's like, and Ethan was like, the fuck that has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Fuck you mean. And they just could not comprehend that. Like, uh, criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. Defending a fucking documentary that is like 12 hours long, a Swedish documentary that's 12 hours long denying the Holocaust is the definition, like the textbook definition of being anti-Semitic. He just like could not comprehend in his mind. He was like, well, I don't get it. Like, like, yeah, impressive. Yes, impressively stupid. They literally are impressively stupid. I did not think that you could be that stupid and like, you know, sometimes like that it's that stupid. It's, it's so goddamn stupid that it, it honestly worries me. Like how the fuck do you just survive? Like, I, I feel like these are the type of dudes that forget to breathe sometimes. You know what I mean? They're like, Oh fuck. Someone has to remind me that, to manually breathe that level of stupidity. Oh, 
Can we see a little of that combo? Potentially. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it's on purpose. No, I think, I don't think it's on purpose. I think people are just like naturally interested in watching people that are just as dumb as they are. All right. Uh, anyway, I haven't even freaking blasted off yet. Chat, hit me with uh, a, a meme. Please cover every debate that has happened. I need your take. Come on, Weeby. Don't be annoying, okay? Yes, I know. I know it sucks. I know the vibes are in the pooper every time I, every time I uh, even broach debating a little bit. It just, like, brings in some of the worst cretins of all time. And it brings out some of the worst cretinous behavior of long-term community members, okay? I know that. No One Piece updates. You know the chatter that comes in every goddamn day and asks if you're covering Gaza? That's me in Haiti, but only this once. Okay, but I did cover Haiti already extensively. Showed you the background, showed you contemporary Haiti, uh, and and uh, how we got there. You know what I mean? Like, fucking extensively, extensively showed you, like, the, the, uh, the Haitian Revolution, making uh, analogies to... Making analogies to... Uh, October 7. Anyway, have you seen the ex expose on that CSAM extortion group 764 wired an article? No. Uh, Coconuts admitted on their stream after they hung up, he was pretending to be dumb as fuck to avoid Ethan's questions and then they deleted their stream. Yeah, except he wasn't pretending. He is dumb as fuck. The point is like, he's saying he's just pretending to be dumb as fuck, but he is actually dumb as fuck. Okay. Like, here's how you pretend to be silly and dumb and goofy, okay? For the for the goofs and gaffs, for the laughs, right? Like, sometimes I know the answer to a question, right? But I'll be like, ooh, I wonder if, you know, this is going to pan out in, in the way that I think it is, right? Like, I'll do it every now and then, okay? It's just copium. It's just like a post-debate copium that... It's probably one of the greatest indications that you thoroughly got dismantled and you recognize it. Someone said Destiny did that with Candace Owens. Like your debate with Tate, yeah? Yeah, I got fucking thoroughly destroyed by Andrew Tate. Uh, uh, Matt Gates got subpoenaed about the SA case. Wait, really? You, this is one of those uh, usernames that is like has multiple sock accounts, so I can't trust you. It's crazy when even Candace Owens can clock him yeah, like this. Are you just because I can't tell right now if your thing is just to be contrarian? Okay, hold on. No, I'm, be, I'm being serious. No, I'm asking you because it no. seems like you're just like whatever your position is. I'm gonna take the opposite and I'm gonna say something really quickly and try to say, well, how do we know? Blah, 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 blah. And it's like that's actually quite boring. Sure, I you understand. know what I mean. Like so it's like, dude, like, just, like let's actually have a real conversation because tons of stuff is happening right now. A lot of stuff is being mm -hmm. actually look into the Epstein case. Or are you just because I can't tell right now if you he defended Epstein? Why does she go on a stream? I mean, why wouldn't she? It's like. I think Destiny right now has one of the greatest communities for for uh, right wing radicalization. You're it's like primed. If I'm a right wing dude, I would love to go on him, uh, go on his uh, stream and just fucking spit and be friendly. Um, this is not a joke. He said it doesn't matter how he made his money. Yeah, he he literally has like he's had a a beneficial like a mutually beneficial relationship with Nick Fuentes for a while until it wasn't beneficial. And Nick Fuentes is a literal fucking Nazi, okay? Uh, when you don't, when you're like a mercenary, when you're ideologically a mercenary and only interested in the fucking spirited debate, you can, you're very malleable. You have an audience that just only cares about like the aesthetics of a debate, the aesthetics of winning a debate. So you will very easily, you can very easily funnel your audience in the direction of whatever the fuck you want. It's, there are consistent principles within that audience, obviously. <clears throat> um, consistently, he hates me and anyone to the left of him, for sure, like, a lot. But uh, overall, same as you, same as me, you think I have... I'm so confused when people say this kind of stuff, because you think I have an audience that would funnel into the right, like, pretty easily? Is that what you're saying? Which one is it? Am I too vicious to right-wing people and also create an echo chamber? Or am I just like... um? Am I am I super reactionary and have primed my audience into primed my audience into you know being susceptible to to right wing reactionary politics? No, you're hot, my man. Hit the exit ramp. Thank you. Ah, anyway, can't believe you keep dodging this question by the top of the hour ad break. It's not. Come on, it's eleven fifty three, bitch. That's insane. You have to be at least in the pocket. You can't be hitting me with that. You can't. 
we, we're 40 minutes into the broadcast. It, it's 11.53. You can't. You got to wait a little bit. Yeah. This is a pretty pretty solid lock. Destiny spent all those years trying to put right wingers to the center left. Now he's platforming way too many shitty right wingers, and his community is reverting back into that nonsense. Dude is so butthurt about leftists that he's willing to piss away the work he's done. 100%. Like, he, he thinks he's like, um, he thinks he's still running this whole, like, I'm just making people liberal and reasonable, not recognizing that, like, liberalism as an ideological position, especially if it's like, especially if it's anchored around the Democratic Party, is inevitably going to spit out the same results that the Democratic Party is spitting out. So as time goes on and the Democratic Party becomes more and more reactionary, well, that's all you're doing. You're also doing reactionary politics all of a sudden. It's just so funny to see that, like, this entire community they used to literally shit on Sam Harris. Like, unironically, Destiny's community used to shit on Sam Harris, shit on all of these, like, centrist fence-sitters have now adopted the position of being like centr uh, centrist fence sitters that are just like simply liberal, like true liberals. It's like, dude, you're literally either are too young to remember uh, or don't understand that like you were shitting on Dave Rubin and now you have become Dave Rubin in many ways. <sighs> but yeah, it's just so funny to think about because like the classical liberal shit is exactly what Sargon used to do. And these guys used to shit on Sargon. How the fuck did this happen? Did you see their ending uh, watch parties? Yeah, I heard. I don't know what that means for me. I don't know why they're doing that, but liberal recycling content like conservatives now. Are you going to cover the debate or do you think it'll be boring? It will be very interesting for me because I do care about a lot of the people associated with the debate. I'm not talking about fucking Destiny, by the way, who, in my opinion, sticks out like a sore thumb, who only is there to speak convincingly without offering anything uh, uh, truly of worth. Like, because come on, this is not about like, and I would say the same thing about myself being in a situation like that as well. Like, and I think I'm probably a little bit more knowledgeable than Destiny is on the subject matter. After all, I uh, knew who the Turkish president was and did not think he was the president of Israel, for example, right? Like, you know, just like basic facts. Um, where Israel is. These are things that I've known for, you know, many, many years, right? Issue I've uh, covered for many years specifically. I didn't just like uh, try to try to read uh, as many Wikipedia pages to to find talking points that justify the, the, the pre-canned predisposition that I had towards defending Israel's genocide, uh, you know, and, and do some post hoc rationalizations like that. And even then, I still think it's like ridiculous to to put me up next to fucking Norman Finkelstein, who is an incredibly important scholar in the conditions of Gaza, like one of the most important scholars who's dedicated his entire fucking life um, uh, to, to covering Gaza. Um, uh, and even Benny Morris, <laughs> again, an incredibly important scholar, an incredibly important Israeli scholar who is, who is personally formative in uh in the way that uh israel's history of 1948 was uncovered right like benny morris i don't agree with him i think he's a fucking freak right but his earlier work specifically detailing out plan dalit and uh and and talking about transfer being an inevitability like this is the very the foundation the basis for why so many people now know about like the Nakba, right? He had a change of heart. Obviously, I agree with Ilan Pape. I agree with Avishlaim. That's why I'm not talking about them. Those are the other new historians that I obviously agree with uh, ideologically, and I and and their positions inform mine. But Benny Morris is a really unique individual, and yet, uh, regardless of his his like change of heart despite his earlier work, right, who was so important um, <laughs> in, in basically uh, uh, shedding a light on, uh, on the nefarious history of the, the development of the Zionist state and the calculated attempts, I think, that, um, I think that he's an important guy. You giving people second chances now? What do you mean? Is that a beanie? How do you feel that a lot of left-leaning people have moved right? You giving people second chances now? Um, I have been 
I've been someone who advocates for reform unconditionally since day one. This is an unchanging principle of mine. Uh, I've always, I'm always a firm believer that people who uh, find themselves in the throes of reactionary thinking can always have, and should always have a second chance. I yell at my community regularly for being um, not as understanding as I want them to be. So that's my take on that. I am wearing a beanie yet. It is a beanie. Yes, uh, all of your questions will be answered. Yes, at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. Okay, this is true. Big news on Stan Twitter. This shit is crazy. Do a leap of fan calls cops after Nicki Minaj fan flies to his house to settle Stan Twitter beef. I'm not going to lie. This is exactly what I... The chatter's ad segue was seven minutes ago. That was better. No, it wasn't because he hit it at 11.53. You dress like this, but you actually cry in the shower to Phoebe Bridgers and Boy Genius? Me? Or are you talking about this guy? Okay, I get why you're terrified of the barbs. I'm actually not terrified of the barbs because I think, like, I realized more... I think barbs used to have black Twitter with... Uh, they used to hold on to black Twitter with a vice grip, okay? And I feel like their power over black Twitter has, like, kind of gone away. Twitter has become more right-wing anyway. But as time has passed... And this is a consistent thing that happens with people that are uh, people that associate uh, with me in a negative way. They almost always out themselves as like weirdly enough defending, you know, lowering age of consent, uh, lowering uh, age of consent and and uh, defending some of the worst, most unhinged white supremacists. So like for me, I think. I, I'm no longer as afraid, especially because I'm a hot girl. I, like, I've been a, a Megan Thee Stallion supporter for a very long time now. And I am no longer afraid to say it. They're rebuilding in the, they're rebuilding the, the guild arc right now. Chatter joke reference. It's like this and give off, like, <laughs> tough, like a tough sort of thing going on. Um, and then... Absolutely zero people look at this guy and go, you are giving off a tough veneer. Like, no one thinks that. What? That is I not I cried Phoebe Bridgers in the shower, and I listened to C-Rose and Boy Genius. And um, the dichotomy is crazy. It's really funny. People are making fun of him because he's so cringe. People on Twitter said he dresses like a male manipulator and people got mad. Yeah, I think everyone should chill out about saying he dresses like a male manipulator, okay? That this outfit is not, this is not, this is the, this is, I, I feel like, I feel like you're being a little unreasonable making this assertion, okay? This is, it's just, I'm gonna take the fucking beanie off. Uh, yeah, it's just, I'm vamp life. That's what it is. I'm vamp. I'm fucking vamp. That's what, that's what I am. Why do you wear white socks all the time? I think white socks with Doc Martens look great. That's what I think. Bro, I'm sorry to say, but this video screams Hasanabi Chatter. It's got to be one of you bozos. Which docs you got on? Uh, the regular low tops. Uh, the laced ones. I love those. They're so comfy, too. Anyway. Shoes in the house, brother. Uh, yes, I've talked about this already. I've talked about this already, but um, since, uh, I, since Kaya came into this house and uh started pooping everywhere i've been wearing saw i mean i've been wearing shoes in the house usually anyway 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 anyway, anyway, anyway. let's see this fucking stan twitter beef because this seems fucking awesome and then we'll get into the israel palestine debate cardi tanked Nicki minaj is the queen of rap fuck dua lipa did he just say Nicki minaj is the queen of rape cardi tanked Nicki minaj is the queen of rap fuck dua lipa yo Dude, he literally had, that's, no, she tried to say, he, he tried to say queen of rap and he fucked it up. God wouldn't let him say it. I'm sorry. Are you going against God? God was like, nope, not today. Your ass needed to be defending Dua Lipa shaking my head. Oh, uh, hello. Another fucking queen. Are you kidding me? Uh, Albanian for life. Excuse me. Uh, the world is Albania. Al call, call me. Call me the premier of Australia, Hassan Albanese, the way I'm defending Albania. Mate, hello, I'm Albanese. <laughs> Wants to pretend he's into dogs and calls them low tops law. What do you mean into dogs? It's a fucking shoe and they're comfortable and I've been wearing them for like 10 years now. Suck my dick. 
Okay, stop associating your identity with your commodity consumption, please. Oh my god, oh my fucking god, I'm Albanese. <sighs> ten years, yeah. Like the the boots that I have, I've basically have for like ten years at this point. Maybe not ten, but like five, six years. Here's a full thread explaining what's going on. Oh my god, the stand Twitter beef between Jasmine Onika too. I'm back, not impersonating anyone. Head Barb, and then pops on. Gazette that went too far. Kenzo and Jasmine have been throwing shots at each other over their favorite artists and over disliking each other's artists. Kenzo likes people like Cardi B, Dua Lipa, and Beyonce. Jasmine is a diehard fan of Nicki Minaj. After a few shots thrown back and forth, Kenzo posted a video showing his home and encouraging Stan Twitter to come to his house. Okay, that was dangerous. Dangerous prospect. My friend, what are you doing? This is exactly who I think is on Nicki Stan Twit. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is like Nikki's jealous, Nikki's bitter, <laughs> Nikki tanked, table stiff tanked. Oh, <laughs> Stan Twitter, please come to my house right here. You have that's messed up. You can't do that. You can't do that. Apparently, he's 15 years old. My address. Okay, you, you can't do that. It's Peggy. You have the audacity to block you. Kenzo, you scary ass faggot. You have the audacity to block me and then you try to tweet about me thinking I wouldn't have seen it. Then you hop on Twitter showing your ugly ass Savannah Desert House thinking nobody will pull up. When I just beat the fuck out of Steven's faggot ass at his college, bitch, you lost your mind. You nasty slow need to body me so bad. I feel bad for your ugly ass fat ninjago spin jitsu master ass mama. You growing pubic hair on your chin looking like Swain ne from Nino Cooney. The thing I don't understand about the mental illness of like Stan Twitter oftentimes is like first of all before people go can he say it he's a barb okay what do you think be honest he's running a barb stan account do you think he's gay chat like yeah no shit it's his word dog okay <laughs> this is one of the gayest men in america right now at this very moment do you understand the messier you are, the gayer you are, okay? And honestly, running a Nicki Minaj Barb Stan account is infinitely gayer than taking a million back shots, okay? You could, you could bottom for the entire Marine Corps and you wouldn't arrive at the level of homosexual tendency of the average Nicki Minaj Barb Stan account. Okay, anyway, bro is like 15 kind of cringe to be honest. Bro is also insane. You fat ass, toko toko booty ass bitch. Bitch, instead of speaking on Nicki Minaj or Taylor, speak on your nasty mug hoe. You talk about how you ain't do shit in your worthless life and be a ugly sob story faggot. You don't know that dude? This might be like a Ukraine moment for you when this guy responds with his girlfriend. <laughs> uh. Popping his gums on Twitter. Kill yourself and shut the fuck up, faggot. Kenzo. Okay. So he wrote that whole last thing, right? Jasmine then took it to his own hands to buy a plane ticket from LA to Phoenix to go to Kenzo's house and attempt to fight ticket. him. Um, I go at 4.30 and I'll come to Phoenix at 6 p.m. And by 7 p.m., this fight should happen. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, LA? Like Louisiana? Or are we talking Los Angeles? Because I'm sorry, there is no way... You are legally allowed to have that accent just because of uh, being a Nicki Minaj stan account. Unless, if you're from Los Angeles, you cannot speak like this. I'm sorry. There are levels to this, okay? There are levels to this. There are levels to this. Unless that LA stands for Louisiana, you are not allowed to develop this accent. Where the fuck is gotta be, is gotta be Louisiana. I do not want to believe that he is from Los Angeles. I mean, he's, oh my God, it's got to be Los Angeles, bro. Look at this, 4.30 to 6 p.m., flight duration hour and 30. <laughs> L.A., lower Alabama. I mean, that does make sense, right? One hour and 30 minutes does. Hassan, this is the presidential drama you wanted. Flight time is 1.30. I don't think you can fly from Louisiana to Phoenix. Update, I am still going to cancel. Bro's wearing a Los Angeles, California shirt. Oh my God, oh my God, he literally is from L.A. Oh my God place the fight no it's no no everyone has la california shirts that's normal i'm sure that is just he's not actually from los angeles there's no way bro how 
El Segundo on Hunting Beaches showed up lower Alabama. Brother, I'm sorry. Brother, uh, brother, uh, brother. How? Bro, this is weirder than like Drake developing a fucking British accent, dude. What the fuck? I don't. He's literally talking like he's from the deep south, okay? Chatters in here were earlier saying, oh, he tried to say queen of rap, but with a southern Alabama accent. That's why it came out like it was queen of rape. That's what he said. Bitch, turns out this dude's from like Orange County or some shit. What the fuck? This dude is the Ian Miles Chong of being from the south. It's currently Monday. Um, I might go Wednesday or Tuesday, depending. Um, cause y'all yeah, know I'm going to Rolling Loud. Let me get my wristband in case a whole try to clock my tea. Talk about bitch, no the fuck you not. Here you go. My wristband, VIP bitch. How about that? Okay. I might go on Tuesday or Wednesday. Depends. I get paid 2400 on Wednesday. And I might just beg for- You know, wait, are we talking, are we talking Sephora? What are we thinking? Sephora, right? It gotta be. Like, Ulta? <laughs> It's AAVE, which is very commonly heavy with a southern accent. It's a very specific type of AAVE. That's why I'm like shocked. Money on my TikTok live so I can afford the ticket today and just go tomorrow. I don't know. I'll see. I'm gonna go. Update. It's also not even fully AAVE. It's more like gay AAVE, if that makes sense. Jasmine that took the flight today, 31324, and arrived at Kenzo's neighborhood and made a video showing he was outside of his house. Kenzo quoted his post and said he was actually outside. Kenzo tweeted a few things while Jasmine was in his neighborhood. Cardi tanked. Nicki Minaj is the queen of rape. Fuck Dua Lipa. Yeah, he fucking literally says Nicki Minaj is the queen of rape. <laughs> Dude, there is something really funny about this. He's like whispering. Cardi tanked. Nicki Minaj is the queen of rape. Fuck Dua there's something really funny about doing barb speak in your opposition's neighborhood that you flew into, but you're still like kind of reserved because you're outside in an unfamiliar territory. And you're just like, yeah, Nicki Minaj is the queen of rape. Fuck the Walipa. It's like, come on, bro. Say it with your chest. You're there to fuck this dude up, right? Okay. He's actually outside my house is Kenzo. I think he's on the other side of my block because that's not... My side at timestamp, one second in the video. You really spent a couple hundred dollars on a flight and an Uber to my house over Stan Twitter shit. You're a psychopath. Going outside, maybe, I don't know. If he had the balls, he would be at my house right now. He knows I'll call law enforcement. So then why are you here in the first place? Kenzo then comes outside with his father and cops are called. Watch this video to see what happened. LA to Phoenix ordered an Uber to show up to my house with intentions of hurting me and my family. Can, can we just talk? I don't try to assault nobody. He's been encouraging others to attack my family Bro, turns out Thought Daughter on top, by the way. Can I just say? Can I just... I'm sorry. Don't yell at me, okay? I have never been more in support of Thought Daughter over the gay son Thought Daughter situation than this very moment, okay? Straight up. Thought Daughter's on top, okay? Arrest me. I don't know why I've been doing this a lot. Arrest me, officer. I will go to jail for the truth, okay? It, it's just... This is, this is too much. Via online forum. Girl forums david corrales that's not my name <laughs> last name c-o i'm from louisiana this isn't a deep south accent he's just trying to sound like a stereotypical black woman i guarantee he doesn't speak like this around his family r-a-l-e-s can i talk please girl just let me talk girl they being weird bro there's something so funny about just like being so out of shape like you flew to fucking phoenix to beat this 15 year old's ass over Stan Twitter shit, over defending Nicki Minaj. Oh my God, okay? Like not even, not even like a defensible person. So it's like uh, layers of being unhinged and you're fucking losing your breath trying to talk to the 15 year old whose ass you're trying to beat. You do not have the physical prowess, dumbass. You do not have the physical prowess to conduct this operation. You did not think this through. What the hell, man? It's no point. Yeah, they're trying to call 12. I mean, what the fuck? It's definitely LAAV. I grew up in Inglewood, South he, the, They're trying to flesh me. Like, girl, I just like wanted to talk. Really hard. Flight from LA to Phoenix ordered him. Yeah, all he doing is just following me with his day. And it's Never in the history of the planet have, like, 
dudes who used to just scream racial epithets at one another been so vindicated? Because, like, this activity used to be relegated to, like, Xbox lobbies, right? And, like, these dudes would just say unhinged racist shit, but at least it would end there. You know what I mean? Your father would hear what you're saying in the other room and beat your ass. Now, it has, like, completely gotten out of control. Like, I never thought, I never thought Xbox lobbies would be a preferable situation to what is unfolding in front of my fucking eyes. Okay? Jesus Christ. I'm trying to call the police. I don't know what to do, chill. I ain't doing nothing illegal, so it's whatever. Yes, what? You can't? What? What is he thinking? Are you out of your mind? Yes, you are literally stalking someone and threatening to physically harm them. That is definitely illegal. Nicki Minaj stands obviously don't have a great understanding of the law unless we're talking about age of consent in different states. But like, you know, this is like pretty obvious stuff. You cannot fly to a different state after being like, I'm going to beat this person's fucking ass and then go outside of their fucking house. Nicki Minaj stands need to understand you cannot fucking dox and harass people, okay? I don't know why they just, like, can't fucking comprehend this. God damn it. They need to... Bro, I swear to God, if they put in the Ulta and Sephora manuals, like, some of these things, like, doxing is not valid or permissible. Like, please don't stalk people at the behest of Nicki Minaj. Like, you would eliminate, like, 30% of the fucking problem, I think. Your Rage Gaming? Oh, my God. He is the most normal Nicki Minaj stand on the fucking planet. And I don't mean that ironically. I, I don't even understand how he, like, he is the way he is. Whatever, okay? Yeah, all he doing is just following me with his dad. And they trying to call the police. I don't know what to do, chill. I ain't doing nothing illegal. Here's another POV. Okay. So Kenzo then comes outside with his father and cops are called. Here's another POV of Jasmine father. talking to Kenzo and his dad. Jasmine attempts to run off, but his dad runs after him and they follow him around until hey. the authorities arrive. Hi, I can't see. Can you turn it on? You've been encouraging others on social media to attack my family we can't sit. over Stan Twitter drama. Just because oh. I said I don't like Nicki Minaj? Like really? You booked a flight from LA to <laughs> Phoenix? Yeah! Ooh. Yeah! He's so out of breath. Oh my God, ass crack out. Oh, disrespectful. Barney Frank. Barney Franking it. He's got the plumber's crack. Trying to run away in them slides. <laughs> Don't do it. That's a type 2 kind of run. Dude, what, what do you mean? Type 2 diabetes? The fuck do you mean type 2 kind of run? It's because I said I don't like Nicki Minaj. Really? Should have worn. Should have worn better shoes. Can't do that. Can't stock with them slides on. Oh my God, brother. Oh, the Barb Witch Project. God, you're such a fucking boomer, Emma, Hunt, and so am I. Uh, uh, people, Zoomers don't even know what that reference is, probably. You booked a flight from LA to what Phoenix. You spent a couple hundred dollars on a flight. You went through TSA. You flew over here to Phoenix. <laughs> ordered an Uber to my house to fight me. You better stop it. I think the Kenzo guy is dumb too. Why the fuck did he post the address on Twitter and dare didn't say people to come fight him? I think it's because uh, they doxed him earlier, but even then, yeah, he's a stand too, okay? He's a stand as well. He's also unhinged, bro. Okay, nope. straight light. My father. This is like a cryptid video. This video is incredible. This is Kino. Like, this is actually, unironically, what social media is the best at, okay? Just. Just so much mental illness trapped and is just like desperate to get out. Oh God, this is so, this is so good. You get hurt. I understand you're here from out of state. Uh, I'm not sure where you can go, but- You I wanna say hi? No, not really. Okay. Thank you though. <laughs> it's like kind of funny. Cause like, I think, I, I assume he's also underage because of like the way he's behaving. And I suspect that like, he knows he can kind of get away with it because he is underage. You know what I mean? Or he's just insane, like the most insane. I mean, he is insane, but like even more insane than we previously thought. Hold on, I'm recording the video. Um, okay, yeah. He told the cops, 
hold on i'm recording a video update kenzo and his dad left i guess they done talking to the police but i'm still here i don't know what's gonna happen but if i go to jail i don't know what for i didn't do anything but he did go outside willingly but at the end of the day if i do go to jail i'm gonna have an iconic mugshot but besides that signing off because my phone's at one bye Dude, 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 how are you this oblivious to like who you are as a person? Like what vibes you're putting out there in the world? Like that is, oh my God. Oh my fucking God, dude. I just, that's crazy. How do you get to this? How do you get to this point in your life? Actually, all you needed to know, all you needed to know what was like, was basically just this photo. Immediately, this photo explains everything that's going on. This is the outcome of fatherlessness in in the home of Zoomers. Yeah, maybe TikTok should be banned, honestly, and Twitter too. Maybe social media should be banned. When I see stuff like this, I honestly believe that like a Chinese style restriction on social media is an absolute necessity for this country to fucking whip itself back into reality, okay? I just, I don't know. I don't know how the fuck we, we got here. Kenzo then posted a few tweets after everything settled down. Jasmine is headed to a motel. He has autism, so he isn't aware of the consequences of his actions. The police, my father, and I discussed the possibility of talk, taking him back to Los Angeles so we can get the help that he needs. Social services will take care of him. The compassionate side of things. Ooh. Showing up to a house, a uh, person's house, regardless of an individual is mentally challenged or not, is absolutely insane. <laughs> I mean, you just said insane twice. Stay on Twitter should be a place where you can discuss music and laugh at music artists' issues, but when the fans are being targeted, it's wrong. End of thread. Moral of the story, Stan Twitter is not that serious, except Jasmine was fucking tweeting out things like, things I did in 24 hours. One, I ended Kenzo. Two, ended the lotto page. that be all over Barb's post. Three, got arrested. Four, the cop gave me his number. Kissy face. Five, gagged the timeline. And honestly, I mean, this is... I hate to use this word because I'm a 32-year-old man, but Delulu, okay? This is it. This is the definitional... This is the perfect dictionary definition of not delusional, but delulu, a different type of delusion. Okay. Like this, I, this is what I'm talking about. When I say people online are fucking unhinged mental illness, isn't a free pass to be an unhinged psycho. I just don't say delulu again. Nicki Minaj's impact on the mental health of gay youth through the 2010s needs to be studied. <clears throat> you could power a small city with this level of delusion. Oh my God, dude. I just, I genuinely don't fucking understand. I genuinely don't understand how you can get here, how you can be like this. What are the events that took place that caused you to be this way, to behave this way? Yeah, the Lulu is one of the symptoms of NPD. We are in a bad place, folks. I mean, all jokes aside, we are not all right. We are, we have a crisis in this country, okay? We have a crisis in this country. It is so bad that I forgot to run the three minute ad break at the top of the hour, okay? That's the level of crisis we're at. Because I forgot, I got so sucked in. I got so sucked into the to the insanity of this story that like, I, I, I forgot to run the three minute ad break. Of course, uh, if you no longer wanna see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or free with Twitch Prime. Hot Girls on top, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, that's right, Hot Girls on top. Once again, Nicki Minaj stands uh, as a part of her like uh, dying fandom, the last gasp of air that is coming out of this fandom is always going to be the most devastating, the most dangerous. Um, and uh, yeah, just I, I wish everyone well. That's all I'm going to say. The rest of me is psych, <laughs> bitch. Bye. Like, this is my opinion. Kenzo, you're scary. And you'll always be scary. Because what the fuck? That don't make sense. You literally consented to the fight. You wanted to go out. We literally saw you. A thousand plus people saw you go outside. And then you hide somewhere in a bush and then get your head. And then he started flickering the, the flashlight at me to blind me. What? That's crazy. And then call 12. Scary. But whatever. I'm over it. Um, I finally went. I'm not going to go no more, obviously. But... <sighs> I won the battle. Kenzo has been defeated. End of it. They arrested. These are the kind of dude that puts mask bear in their grinder profile. <clears throat> the education system needs critical intervention. If this is the shit it's pumping out, bro, it is not pumping anything out. Okay, it is pumping in. We are so done. 
We are so done as a society, okay? I'm glad that he's uh, in, in good spirits, though, after this uh, insane, circum insane circumstance that unfolded. I, this is how Alexander the Great behaved before he got poisoned by his generals. Brother, Alexander the Great conquered an unimaginable amount of territory and basically fucking neutered the Persian Empire, okay? The, the, there is no comparison to being a Nicki Minaj stand here. Okay, hello. This man cannot even conquer diabetes. What are you talking about? Alexander the Great was a stan of uh, what's his fucking face? Uh, Achilles, not Nicki Minaj. You are platforming a monster right now. You realize that, right? <sighs> not everything that I show on here, especially in a critical tone, is technically platforming. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> One fourth of humanity needs to lose access to social media. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say about this other than the fact that, like, it is Jover. It is more Jover than it has ever been. There is never, there's never been a moment more Jover than this moment. It will never be as bad as it is. Uh, it, it'll always be worse than it is today. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Take it off the first world and give it to the third. <clears throat> it is, we are at the precipice of rock bottom. If we haven't hit it yet, we will. More proof is on haste the gays. Dude, dude, dude. I would not associate this person with the gays. That's all I'm going to say, okay? Like, yeah, gays can get messy, okay? And gays do love a messy bitch, okay? But this is like, this is, don't claim this guy, okay? Would it be fascist to limit the access to social media to people with serious mental illness? I just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have a solution. I don't have a solution. Oh, my God. I guess the big thing to consider is the fact that he will most likely be emboldened by the attention since you got a pretty big following. Cash 22, though. I mean, this shit is going to go viral beyond me. Let's be real. I just caught it on the front end. That that story is, like, designed for uh, social media. It is a product of social media. It would not exist without social media, and it is perfectly designed for social media. <clears throat> um, fun community centers. Dude, I don't know if anything can save us okay i don't know if anything can save us i don't know i don't know i've just i've lost it i've lost it i i, I feel i feel like it's a perfect time to get into a five hour debate which we're not going to watch all five hours of i will be uh skipping through it but um the israel palestine debate commenced on the lex fridman show it is literally almost five it's five hours long we're not going to watch obviously all five hours and I'm going to be hitting the uh, 1.75 playback speed. But uh, I think that in spite of some of the, uh, or at least one individual that is a part of this debate that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, um, Rabani, Morris, and Finkelstein are, uh, even if you don't agree with them, important figures in this discourse, important figures that have literally put forward work that has, has, uh, changed our understanding of the history of Israel. And I mean, literally, like, I'm talking about Benny Morris, who I don't agree with, right? Well, I do agree with his earlier work, but um, I don't agree with his ideology. He, uh, I don't agree with the things that he says, but still, I'm, going, I'm not going to discount his work, um, which was very important in the New Historians uh, in uncovering uh, some of the... Uh, <clears throat> Some of the aspects of the inception of the Israeli state that was basically kept a secret, even though it wasn't really kept a secret, it was more so just not, I guess, uh, openly discussed as much in uh, the the Israeli uh, Israeli side of scholarly work. Um, but yeah. First question is about 1948. For Israelis, 1948 is the establishment of the state of Israel and the War of Independence. For Palestinians, 1948 is the Nakba, which means catastrophe, or the displacement of 700,000 Palestinians from their homes as a consequence of the war. What to you is important to understand about the events of 1948 and the period around there, 47, 49, that helps us understand what's going on today and uh, maybe helps us understand the roots of all of this that started even before 1948. I was hoping that Norm can speak first, then Benny, then Wien, and then Norm. After World War II, the British decided that they didn't want to deal with the Palestine question anymore, and the ball was thrown into the court of the United Nations. Now, as I read the record, the UN was not attempting to arbitrate or adjudicate rights and wrongs. It was confronting a very practical problem. There were two national communities in Palestine, and 
there were irreconcilable differences on fundamental questions. Is Benny Morris the one that said they did the Nakba but thought it was poggers? Benny Morris is uh, Benny Morris's earlier work, very important, which Norm will get to in a second. He's going to bring it up because it's impossible not to. Uh, very openly details alongside Elon Pape's work, which was originally controversial, considered controversial, but he was vindicated afterwards. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to relitigate this. I've talked about it quite a bit. But Benny Morris's early work basically uh, detailed out a planned attempt of ethnic displacement, which is the Nakba, it is true, at a time when like other Israeli scholars had never considered this or outright denied it. Benny Morris later on in his career took this weird turn where he could not obviously disparage his uh, previous work, which was very important uh, for Israeli history, right? And, <clears throat> and, and basically started saying, yeah, sure, it was forcible ethnic displacement, it was deliberate, but it was a good thing. So in the, in the simplest terms, yes, he, he was one of the people who uncovered uh, some of the atrocities in the Nakba or like the deliberacy of the atrocities in the Nakba and then turned around and was like, but it was actually kind of chill because there was nothing we can, there was nothing else we could have done as Israel. You know what I mean? A sad change of affairs, uh, a sad change of, of uh, pace. Yes, uh, but still his work is important regardless. He said the Nakba was a product of Zionism. Exactly. This is like very important to understand. <laughs> especially considering that he's making a point that it was just the response to the Arab attack, therefore justified. Yeah, except it doesn't really matter because he openly fucking was the one who said there was a deliberate attempt, which uh, a lot of other historians have used his work and investigated further to find that like this deliberate attempt was also calculated, uh, it crafted. He didn't say that. You're just making this up. I d You're just lying. Benny Morris's thesis in birth was that it was not a systematic plan. It was a complicated process. You know what? I'll just let Benny and Norm discuss it. They're there. They're in front of you. You'll see in a second. Questions, most importantly, looking at the historic record on the question of immigration and associated with the question of immigration, the question of... <laughs> Dudes who defend Israel love saying complicated, okay? It's their favorite fucking word. It's not that complicated, brother. It's actually not complicated at all. As a matter of fact, it was complicated in the way that we understood it. But thankfully, due to his work and many others in The New Historians, it's no longer as complicated. You can do the smug laugh thing, but you clearly haven't read his books if you're claiming that. <sighs> Let's continue. The UN Special Committee on Palestine, which came into being before the UN 181 Partition Resolution, the UN Special Committee, it recommended two states in Palestine. There was a minority position represented by uh, Iran, India, Yugoslavia. They supported one state, but uh, they believed that if forced to, the two communities would figure out some sort of modus vivendi and live together. The United Nations General Assembly supported partition between what it called a Jewish state and an Arab state. Now, in my reading of the record, and I understand there's new scholarship on the subject, which I've not read. My favorite part of this process, we're not going to talk about contemporary Israeli history and like what this version of the genocide looks like, is that like there is a 3000 year jump that you need to have to be able to justify even the buildup to the Nakba. Okay. Like it is a settler colonial operation through and through, like objectively, that is what it was, right? Planned and designed by the British empire. Are there good justifications for uh, obviously a lot of uh, Jewish people escaping Europe, certainly, right? Especially uh, with the Holocaust. Having said that, however, there were people there. That is the major point. And those people understandably were like, what the fuck are you doing, British Empire? Stop doing settler colonialism, British Empire. That's it. That's it. That is like, it, it is a, it's so simple. So because of that reason, because of that reason... It wasn't planned and designed. Again, there is zero evidence of that. Yes, it was, dude. Planned Dalit is exactly that. And that comes from Elon Pape's work, which originally was considered controversial and maybe even false. One of his actual, uh, one of his actual uh, uh, research associates 
was the one who then went and fucking interviewed the people. And now we know because the people that did plan Dalit were there. They were alive. They're still alive. So no, it is not fucking uh, wrong at all. What I'm explaining to you is not wrong at all. You just want it to be wrong. You, you act like this is a, a contentious conversation when all you're doing is just trying to wash away atrocity. No, Plan D was a military operation that called for the expulsion of villages used in military bases along major routes and border regions. It was a military plan. Yes! Yes! And these were not mute villages being used as military bases. You're fucking lying. And the very same original Zionist brigades that used, uh, that, that basically did the atrocities at Deir Yassin, okay, and many of these other Palestinian villages openly admit that it is a fucking lie, that they were basically spying on villages with no military in them. So all you're doing right now is the worst Hasbro troll on the planet with the same exact fucking username that you use on Reddit, where you post in the fucking Destiny uh, subreddit, is to try and minimize the atrocities. Ugh. I gave you one of the villages. Deir Yassin is a village that was in, uh, in the original inception of the Nakba. A village where atrocities occurred in the hands of Irgun and uh, in the hands of, of uh, Lihi. Why do you know that? You know why we know that? You know why we know that? Because the motherfuckers that did the atrocities are still very much alive. And some of the people were left alive as well so they could go and carry on fear to the other Palestinian villages so the forcible expulsion would be easier when they inevitably move to other Palestinian-occupied areas. Palestinian Occupied areas, I can't believe I'm using that terminology. It's not even occupied, it's just where they lived. The notion that like, yeah, Tantura is another one. The notion that this is like controversial, if anyone fucking tells you this, if anyone tries to tell you this is a controversial thing, okay? I'm talking about knowing his Reddit because I have the CIA in here. Immediately they fucking found out that he has the same exact, um, he, he has the same exact fucking uh, name on Reddit and, and people were talking about it in the chat. 500 villages were destroyed. This is not up for debate. Lamau Palestinians were ethnically cleansed by explicit design. I know. Wow, amazing. I'm aware of Deir Yassin, which was an atrocity. You made a claim about systematic policy. Yes, the systematic policy under Plan Dalit was to forcibly expel and do atrocities in certain villages that they were spying on, villages that had no military usage whatsoever. You can claim that there was military usage for the villages, but there were no militants in those villages. It was just villagers. As a matter of fact, Deir Yassin, famously, the one that you know about as well, and the one that you have to admit was a massive atrocity, famously had a peace agreement with the surrounding Jewish villages. That is why they were so easily slaughtered by the two militia groups that I just described to you. One of those two militia groups, as a matter of fact, openly called themselves terrorists. Stern Gang. Lehi is literally a terror cell. Participated in the King David bombing. But also beyond that, openly fucking consider themselves terrorists. <sighs> Why do you have to look into who I am? Fucking weird. That's not what Plan D was. There were literally battles in these villages. Oh my God. Okay. The Israeli plan was pretty obvious. Everyone understood that forcible expulsion must occur. How do we get everyone to be forcibly expelled from the villages without actually killing all of them? Well, we do some atrocities in two of the villages, three of the villages, four of the villages, maybe 10 villages. And then when we go to the other places where there's a shit ton of Palestinians, we can just do psychological operations, psyops. That's the modern terminology for it. What are some of these psyops? Like going in and blasting machine gun fire in these surrounding cities, basically fucking kettling in, corralling the Palestinian civilian population that you tell that you are openly telling they must leave if they do not want to face the same atrocities. That's exactly what happened. That is exactly what they did. They would shut off access to all parts of cities with the exception of like one area where they can funnel every single citizen, every single civilian. Why did that work? Why was it effective? Benny Morris will say, well, they, it's because the Arab leaders told them to leave and even like forced them to leave. Okay. The Arab leaders told them to leave and forced them to leave. And that's why they left. Meanwhile, 
The real reason as to why many left, which, by the way, even if the Arab leaders told them to fucking leave, it doesn't matter. They should have still been allowed back in. And then the IDF, after the uh, formation of the Israeli state, definitely still kept killing Palestinian villagers that were trying to sneak back into their fucking homes or sneak back to tend their own crop, mind you. More atrocities that are open and... and uh, uh, very easy to find. Okay, so that's just, just another thing that you need to remember. Benny Morris explicitly said the Arab leader leaving stuff was way, way overblown. You're lying about him again. Benny Morris, in this conversation, is going to literally bring up Arab leadership also telling people to leave. It does not matter. It's the major reasons as to why people left from these villages, even if it was literally Arab leaders who said, leave the fucking villages, we will surround them and we will save you, and then you can come back. It still doesn't matter because these are civilians, dumbass. Unless you think Arabs are a fucking monolithic barbarian horde that must be ethnically cleansed by the supreme Jewish state that came afterwards. And the reality is you do think that because you're a fucking Zionist. And that's what Zionism is. Literally, Judeo supremacy, an ethno state that must be built. And how do you build that demographic nightmare of an ethno state? Well, you build it by forcibly displacing Palestinians that live there that aren't Jewish. That's how you do it. That's the whole point. These are civilians. These are farmers, okay? The fact that they were not allowed back into their homes is fucking unacceptable. Even if the Arab leadership was like, yes, leave now and you can come back, which disputed, right? Obviously, if that was the case, then they wouldn't have needed to do Deir Yassin and Tantura and many other atrocities so that they could fucking uh, put the fear of God into the hearts of all these Palestinian civilians that were forcibly displaced, okay? The notion... Interesting how debate weirdos usually aren't this bad when you aren't watching specific people. Yes, of course, it's Destiny's fucking audience of, like, psychotic Hasbara uh, defenders. It's so weird. It's so fucking weird, too. Already said that Benny Morris changed his stance and further research expanded on his original ideas. I don't know what you're tripping about the semantics for, because he has nothing to do. The only thing he has is semantics, because he's butthurt and trying to defend... A person's earlier work that was formative and important, as I openly recognized and mentioned, while simultaneously parse it from a pro-Zionist position. But so far as I've read the record, there's no clarity on what the United Nations General Assembly meant by a Jewish state and an Arab state, except for the fact that the Jewish state would be demographically, the majority would be Jewish, and the Arab state demographically would be Arab. The UNSCOP, the UN Special Committee on Palestine, it was very clear, and it was reiterated many times, that in recommending two states, each state, the Arab state and the Jewish state, would have to guarantee full equality of all citizens with regard to political, civil, and religious matters. Now, that does raise the question, if there is absolute full equality of all citizens, both in the Jewish state and the Arab state, with regard to political rights, civil rights, and religious rights, apart from the demographic majority, it's very unclear what it meant to call a state Jewish or call a state Arab. In my view, the partition resolution was the correct decision. I do not believe that the Arab and Jewish communities could, at that point, be made. For the record, it's pretty gross to call me a Zionist ethno supremacist when I'm just disputing you through historical, disputing you historical claims. Apparently, that's all you can do, though. Keep fucking crying bitch what do you mean are you not are you an anti-zionist is that your claim here is that what you're gonna do you're an anti-zionist you're an anti-zionist benny morris defender like what, what's going on so you disagree with benny morris what what, what do you mean it's because the moment that you say the nakba is a complex event you've already conceded you've already conceded you've already told me what your position is i'm not taking a political position i'm interested in the fucking history yes you are Yes, you are. You are a cowardly fence sitter who is not actually a fence sitter at all. Because guess what, dude? Neutrality in the face of clear opposition is siding with the oppressor. And that's precisely what you're doing. And you're doing it in the most cowardly way possible. Oh, I'm not a Zionist. But also, the forcible ethnic displacement of 750,000 Palestinians that was a deliberate attempt made by the inception of... Uh, that, that followed the inception of the Israeli state actually is not that much of a catastrophe. As a matter of fact, even if it is a catastrophe, it was kind of, it had to happen. So yes, why did it have to happen? So that there could be a majority Jewish state planted on top of this indigenous population that was forcibly uh, expelled from their lands. 
you are no different in many respects to a Holocaust denier trying to be like, well, I'm just asking questions, bro. Is it actually 6 million? But the only difference is our reception of this information is not seen the same because the atrocities obviously are not the same, right? In severity, but one is, a, is not even up for debate. If someone comes in here, I ban them immediately. If someone came in here and tried to fucking do this exact same kind of like atrocity denial, I would ban them. For, for the Holocaust, I would ban them. Understandably so, because why the fuck would I debate a fascist? But when it comes to, when it comes to talking about Israel, that same kind of atrocity denial is so perfectly permissible, it seems. It's ridiculous. And it's not even just, it's not even just, it's not even just the fact that 750,000 people had to be forcibly displaced, right? It's also the fact that they were not allowed to come back. That's it. Not allowing 750,000 farmers, civilians, doctors, teachers to go back to their fucking homes that their families have had for multiple generations is a disgusting atrocity. Okay? It is disgusting. And any kind of defense of this kind of behavior is gross. It's inhumane. He's just debating the semantics and nitty-gritty facts when it doesn't matter because the displacement of atrocities still happen. Yes. Are you incapable of separating your politics from academic investigation? A complex process can lead the facts that can be endorsed by pro or anti-Zionists. And yes, they barred return. I'm not denying that. I'm saying that you're lying about the systematic pre-planned policy part. Brother, you are trying to dispute the inception of these actions without addressing the consequences. Okay, the intent, in my opinion, from where I'm standing after everything I have read, especially when you compare it to what came after, is pretty obvious. If you look at early Zionists, which, by the way, it's so funny. Why am I debating this guy? This is everything that Norm Finkelstein is going to lay out right now. It is so fucking stupid to have this conversation. Oh, it just kind of happened like that. 750,000 Palestinians just kind of happened to leave their homes and then kind of could not come back. It just happened on accident. What a beautiful accident. What a beautiful accident it was. Okay, what about now? What about all these fucking civilians now? Can they not be a part of like a singular state? No, we can't have that. Why? Because of demographic concerns why is this a demographic concern mind you why is this a demographic concern why should we concern ourselves with what ethno-nationalist fascists are concerning themselves with unimaginable unimaginable no other world in which this is like a a, a genuine uh, a, a genuine perspective okay <laughs> so smug eight to live together i disagree with the minority position of india iran and yugoslavia and that not being a practical option, two states was the only other option. In this regard, I would want to pay tribute to what was probably the most moving speech at the UN General Assembly proceedings by the Soviet Foreign Minister Romiko. I was very tempted to <sighs> quote it at length, but I recognized that would be uh, taking too much time. Uh, so I asked a young friend, Jamie Stern Weiner, to edit it and just get the essence of what Foreign Minister Romiko didn't just kind of happen. There was a war that had many factors involved. Okay, brother, um, I love your interest in continuing this derailment, but you are literally taken away from a five-hour conversation of dudes, with the exception of Destiny, that know a shit ton more about this issue than yourself or myself, including the very guy whose work we are currently disputing for no fucking particular reason. I'm going to give you an hour off. You'll probably be back by the time the... Because I'll probably still be watching this, but like... Go write your manifesto, talk about how I'm fraudulent or whatever the fuck, and maybe that will help you sleep comfortably and soundly at night, like that you're simply defending the academic principles behind Benny Morris's work. Um, yeah, it's complicated. It was just a war. It was just a war. Yeah, they're going to address all of that, dumb fuck, okay? It wasn't just a war. There is no, it was just a war when it comes to 750,000 fucking civilians being ethnically displaced from their ancestral homes. Okay, what comes after just the war is only it only works if you legitimately in your mind believe that like Arabs are a monolithic force of barbarian primitives. Okay, like apes. It's so stupid. Miko had to say during the last war, Gromiko said the Jewish people underwent exceptional sorrow and suffering. 
without any exact. Let's be honest. Would you cover this debate if D wasn't in it? Fuck yes. One million percent. Norm Finkelstein versus Benny Morris. I would absolutely cover. Norm Finkelstein is one of the most obsessive freak lords on the planet when it comes to going through each individual minutia of the work of other academics. Okay. He literally destroyed Alan Dershowitz over his very obvious plagiarism after Alan Dershowitz plagiarized another work from another scholar who Norm Finkelstein had fucking eviscerated beforehand. He is, this is not just some random fucking old guy who's an asshole, okay? Many people don't understand, I don't think. He's written so many fucking books on the matter. Come on. Exaggeration. This sorrow and suffering are indescribable. Hundreds of thousands of Jews are wandering about in various countries of Europe in search of means of existence and in search of shelter. The United Nations cannot and must not regard this situation with indifference. Past experience, particularly during the Second World War, shows that no Western European state was able to provide adequate assistance for the Jewish people in defending its rights and its very existence from the violence of the Hitlerites and their allies. This is an unpleasant fact, but unfortunately, like all other facts, it must be admitted. Gromyko went on to say, in principle, he supports one state or the Soviet Union supports one state. But he said, if relations between the Jewish and Arab populations of Palestine proved to be so bad that it would be impossible to reconcile them and to ensure the peaceful coexistence of the Arabs and the Jews, the Soviet Union would support two states. I personally am not convinced that the two states would have been unsustainable in the long term if, and this is a big if, the Zionist movement had been faithful to the position it proclaimed during the UNSCOP public hearings. At the time, Ben-Gurion testified, quote, I want to express what we mean by a Jewish state. We mean by a Jewish state simply a state where the majority of the people are Jews, not a state where a Jew has in any way any privilege more than anyone else. A Jewish state means a state based on absolute equality of all her citizens and on democracy. Alas, this was not to be. As Professor Morris has written, quote, Zionist ideology and practice were necessarily and elementally expansionist. And then he wrote in another book, Transfer, the euphemism for expulsion, transfer was inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism because it sought to transform a land These are Benny's own which words he's saying he's was back. Arab into a Jewish state. And the Jewish state could not have arisen without a major displacement of Arab population. And because this aim automatically produced resistance among the Arabs, which in turn persuaded the Yeshuv's leaders, the Yeshuv being the Jewish community, the Yeshuv's leaders that a hostile Arab majority or a large minority could not remain in place if a Jewish state was to arise or safely endure. Or, as Professor Morris retrospectively put it, quote, a removing of a population was needed. Without a population expulsion, a Jewish state would not have been established, unquote. The Arab side rejected outright the partition resolution. I won't play games with that. I know a lot of people try to prove it's not true. It clearly, in my view, is true. The Arab side rejected outright the partition resolution, while Israeli leaders acting under compulsions inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism found the pretext in the course of the first Arab-Israeli war to expel the indigenous population and expand its borders. I therefore conclude that neither side <clears throat> was committed to the letter of the partition resolution and both sides aborted it. Thank you, Norm. Norm asked that. You make a lengthy statement in the beginning. Norman only quoting stuff. Lamau, you guys are delusional if you don't think this looks bad on him. Using your interlocutor's formative work uh, in talking about the deliberate nature of the ethnic displacement campaigns is crazy. See, Pan Stan, he literally is a historian confirming everything he says, though. That is like, you are the most baby-brained person I've ever fucking encountered if you literally are, are, are looking at a situation uh, where he is describing the source material directly to the person in front of him that wrote the source material as evidence of his position. What more can you do in this, in this circumstance? Like, what? Motherfucker, I know that if your 
favorite debate lord did the using your own words against you technique, you would love that. He's basically doing that in an academic setting, as close to an academic setting as you can get. You know what I mean? That's crazy. But once again, betraying the ultimate uh, the, the, the ultimate position supposedly being about arriving at the truth. You care about the aesthetics. You care about the aesthetics of justifying ethnic cleansing in this circumstance. Okay? This is the problem with simply liking debate for the debate aspect of it. You can try to moralize it. You can try to moralize it by saying, no, 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 debates are how you arrive at the truth. But you very openly recognize how superficial your interest is in debating when you go well the optics of this look really bad not only are you wrong because the optics of it are not bad as a matter of fact but you're also demonstrating that you don't give a fuck about the truth at all please uh benny i hope it's okay to call everybody by their first name in the name of camaraderie norm has quoted several things you said uh, perhaps you can comment broadly on the question of 1948 and maybe respond to the things that norm said yeah UNSCOP, the united nations special committee on palestine um, recommended partition, the majority of UNSCOP recommended partition, which was accepted by the UN General Assembly in November 1947, essentially looking back to the Peel Commission in 1937. Ten years earlier, a British commission had looked at the problem of Palestine, the two warring national groups who refused to live together, if you like, or consolidate a unitary state between them. And Peel said there should be two states. That's the principle. The country must be partitioned into two states. This would give a modicum of justice to both sides, if not all their demands, of course. And the United Nations followed suit. The United Nations and then the UN repeat. General Assembly, representing the will of the international community, um, said two states we'll is the here. just solution in this complex situation. The problem was that immediately with the passage of the resolution, uh, the Arabs, the Arab states and the Arabs of Palestine said no, as Norman Finkelstein uh, said. Uh, they said no, they uh, rejected the partition uh, idea, the principle of partition, not just the idea of what percentage which side should get, but the principle of partition they said no to. The Jews should not have any part of Palestine for their sovereign uh, territory. Uh, maybe Jews could live as a minority in Palestine. That also was problematic in the eyes of the, uh, the Palestinian Arab leadership. Husseini had said only Jews who were there before 1917 could actually get citizenship and con continue to live there. But the Arabs rejected partition and the Arabs of Palestine launched in a very disorganized fashion war against the resolution, against the implementation of the resolution, against the Jewish community in Palestine. Um, and this was their defeat in that civil war between the two communities while the British were withdrawing from Palestine um, um, led to the Arab invasion, the, Arab, the invasion by the Arab states in May 1948 uh, of, of the country. Again, basically with the idea of eradicating or preventing the emergence of a Jewish state in line with the United Nations um, decision and the will of the international community. Norman said that the Zionist enterprise, and he quoted me, meant from the beginning um, to transfer or expel the Arabs of Palestine or some of the Arabs of Palestine. Um, and I think he's sort of um, quoting out of context. The context in which the statements were made that, that um, um, the Jewish state could only emerge um, if there was a transfer of Arab population was preceded in the way I wrote it and the way it actually happened by Arab resistance and hostilities towards the Jewish community. Had the Arabs accepted partition, there would have been a large Arab minority in the Jewish state which emerged in 1947. And in fact, Jewish um, economists and state builders took into account that there would be a large Arab minority and uh, its uh, needs would be cared for, etc. Um, uh, but this was not to be because the Arabs attacked. And had they not attacked, um, uh, perhaps a, a, a Jewish state with a large Arab minority could have emerged, but this didn't happen. Uh, they went to war. The yeah, um... It, it uh, happened because the, because the Arab states attacked, or the Arab state attacked, but it simultaneously didn't uh, exist, which he also recognizes, um, basically saying that uh, this was an inevitability. You just oopsied your way into doing settler colonialism, even though you definitely did do settler colonialism, uh, which is never done through pure happen happenstance, okay? not it's not done through pure happenstance it doesn't happen over an oopsie um so no matter what happens no matter what happens you will always get back to obviously the Balfour declaration and everything beyond that is going to turn into well 3000 years ago uh, Jews were expelled from this land okay there's like a there's like a like a massive period of time that you cannot account for to justify, which is why, which is why Ben Shapiro and others who are way worse at doing this, by the way, uh, than than Benny Morris, of course, uh, will will consistently just like talk about that aspect of it to establish a moral foundation as to why Zionism actually is like biblically backed, okay, both historically and biblically backed, because ultimately, when you just simply leave it at well, there was a partition without 
uh, without talking about like why this was completely unacceptable because it was a settler colonial project that the Arabs were understandably not fond of considering that they were losing their ancestral lands, okay, to a empire that was voluntarily bringing up new settlers, like consistently bringing in new settlers into historic Palestine. Like, if you don't mention this part, if you don't frame it uh, as what it is, then yeah, you can try to, uh, you can try to engage with it, but uh, you, you can try to justify it, but it's still silly. Jews resisted, and in the course of that war, um, uh, Arab populations were driven out. Uh, some were expelled, some left because Arab uh, leaders uh, advised them to leave or ordered them to leave. Um, and at the end of the war, uh, Israel said they can't return because they just tried to destroy the Jewish state. Um, um, and, and that's the basic uh, reality of what happened in 48. Uh, the Jews created a state. The Palestinian Arabs never bothered to even try to create a state uh, before 48 and in the course of the 1948 war. And for that reason, they have no state to this day. Uh, <laughs> they the Jews do have a state because they prepared to establish a state. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to establish a state when you're like 750,000 people are just like removed from their homes. You know what I mean? Yeah. As a as a uh, victim of colonial occupation, I my oh my, how did that not happen? <sighs> Crazy. State fought for it and uh, um, established it um, uh, uh, hopefully lastingly. When you say hostility, in case people are not familiar, there was a full on war where Arab states invaded and Israel won that war let me just add it took the reason why i'm doing this is because like um obviously there's rules around this but there's a banned streamer on screen i'm not trying to bring attention to it but um he is not the focal point of this uh otherwise uh debate between academics on the subject matter which is why it's allowed so i'm just trying to you know do my very best clarify the, the war had two parts to it the first part was the Arab community in Palestine, its militiamen, attacked the Jews in, 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 from November 1947. In other words, Even from the though, day like, after the UN partition resolution it was passed, Arab gunmen were busy shooting up Jews, and that snowballed into a full-scale civil war between the two communities in Palestine. In May 1948, a second stage began in the war in which the Arab states invaded the new state, attacked the new state, um, and, and they too were defeated, and thus the state of Israel emerged. In the course of this two-stage war, um, a vast Palestinian refugee problem um, um, occurred. And so after that, the transfer, the expulsion, the the thing that people call the Nakba uh, happened. Um, Wien, could you speak to 1948 and the historical significance of it? Sure. Um, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. I'll try to limit myself to... Benny just almost bar for bar repeated what you just said he would say. Yes, because I'm very familiar with his work. I, I know I know what his perspective is, and I know how his perspective... Uh, I know what, what he's saying. That is why uh, it's not like it's called... It's not pre-watching something. It's just knowing that. Um, it's just knowing what he is uh, going to say because I've I've read his work. Just a few points regarding Zionism and transfer. I think Heim Weizmann, uh, the head of the World Zionist Organization, had it exactly right when he said that the objective of Zionism is to make Palestine as Jewish as England is English or fr France is French. Um, in other words, um, as as Norman explained, um, a Jewish state requires Jewish political, demographic, and territorial supremacy. Without those three elements, um, the state would be Jewish in name only. And I think what distinguishes Zionism is its insistence, supremacy, and exclusivity. That would be my first point. The second point is um, I think what the Soviet foreign minister at the time, Andrei Gromyko, said is exactly right, with one reservation. Um, Gromyko was describing a European savagery unleashed against Europe's Jews. At the time, you know, it wasn't Palestinians or Arabs. Uh, the savages and the barbarians were European to the core. Um, it had nothing to do with developments in Palestine um, uh, or the Middle East. Secondly, at the time that Gromyko was speaking, um, those Jewish uh, survivors of the Holocaust and, and others who were in need of safe haven were still overwhelmingly on the European continent and not on Palestine, not in Palestine. And I think um, given um, the scale of the savagery, I don't think that any one state or country um, should have borne the responsibility uh, for addressing this crisis. I think it should have been an international uh, responsibility. Um, the Soviet Union could have contributed. Germany certainly could and should have uh, contributed. Um, the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, which slammed their doors shut to um, uh, the persecuted Jews of Europe as the Nazis were rising to power, they certainly should have uh, played a role. But instead, what passed for the international community at the time decided to partition Palestine 
And here I think we need to um, uh, judge the partition resolution against the realities that obtained at the time. Um, two, two thirds of the population of Palestine was Arab. Uh, the Yishuv, the Jewish community in Palestine, constituted about one third of the total population and controlled even less of, um, of, of the land uh, within Palestine. As, as a preeminent Palestinian historian, uh, Walid al-Khalidi has pointed out, the partition resolution in giving roughly 55% of Palestine to the Jewish community, um, and I think 41-42% uh, to the Arab community, to the Palestinians, did not preserve the position of each community or even um, uh, favor one community at the expense of the others. Rather, I'm cringing so fucking hard at my community. Listen to the words that are coming out of uh, these people's mouths instead of hyper focusing and hyper fixating like a bunch of brain broken, drama obsessed fucking perverts about why destiny is there. We already fucking covered it. Okay, stop. Jesus Christ. I'm not watching this because destiny's there, okay? Please stop obsessing. You are behaving exactly in the same way that his community obsesses. Please, Jesus Christ, dude. Just like you're, you're missing the forest for the trees. I've seen thousands of comments at this point in the chat, hyper-focusing, hyper-fixating on one aspect of this, okay? It thoroughly inverted and revolutionized uh, the relationship uh, between between the two communities. And as many have written, the Nakba was the inevitable consequence of partition, given the nature of Zionism, um, given the territorial disposition, given the weakness of the Palestinian community whose leadership had been largely de uh, decimated during a major revolt at the end of the 1930s, um, given that the Arab states uh, were still very much under French and British influence. Um, uh, the Nakba was um, inevitable the inevitable product of the um, partition uh, resolution. And, and one last point also about um, the, the UN's partition resolution is, yes, um, formally, that is what the international community decided in, on the 29th of November, 1947. It's not a resolution that could ever have gotten through the UN General Assembly today for a very simple reason. It was a very different General Assembly. Most African, most Asian states um, were not yet independent. Um, were the resolution to be placed before the international community today. And I find it telling that um, uh, the minority opinion was led by India, Iran, and Yugoslavia. I think they would have represented the clear um, uh, majority. So partition, given what we know about Zionism, given that it was entirely predictable what would happen, given um, uh, the realities on the ground in Palestine, um, was deeply unjust. And the idea that either the Palestinians or the Arab states could have accepted um, such a resolution is, is I think, um, uh, an illusion. That was in 1947. We saw what happened in 48 and 49. Palestinian society was essentially um, uh, destroyed. Over 80%, I believe, of Palestinians resident in the territory that became the state of Israel were either expelled or fled uh, and ultimately were ethnically cleansed because ethnic cleansing consists of two components. It's not just forcing people into refuge or expelling them. It's just as importantly preventing their return. And here, and, and, and Benny Morris has written, I think, an article about Yosef Weitz and the transfer committees. Um, there was a very detailed initiative to prevent their return, and it consisted of raising hundreds of Palestinian villages to the ground, which was systematically implemented, and so on. And so Palestinians became a stateless people. Now, um, what is the most important reason that no Arab state was established um, in Palestine? Well, since the 1930s, um, the Zionist leadership and um, the Hashemite um, uh, leadership of uh, Jordan, as has been uh, thoroughly researched and written about by the Israeli-British historian Avi Shlaim, essentially colluded um, to prevent the establishment of an independent Arab state um, in Palestine uh, in the late 1940s. Um, there's, there's much more here, but I think um, those, yeah, those are the key points know, I, I would make about... Uh, my... That, also beyond uh, the, the uh, already you know, 750,000 people being forcibly moved and, uh, and not allowed to return to their homes at gunpoint is uh, kind of kind of a big deal. Uh, basically destroys any kind of like state development project that you could have had. You know what I mean? A lot of this argument basically does resort back to, it re always reverts back to might is right. That's it. Might is right politics. Like uh, the Europeans got, got to do a little bit of a colonialization. Why can't we type shit? 1948. We may talk about Zionism, Britain, the UN assemblies, and all, it, all the things you mentioned. There's a lot to dig into. So, again, if we can keep it to just one statement moving forward sure. uh, after Stephen, if you want to go a little longer. Uh, also, we should acknowledge the fact that the speaking speeds of, of people here are different. Stephen speaks about 10 times faster uh, than me. Uh, Stephen, do you want to comment on 1948? Yeah, I think it's interesting where people choose to start the history. Um, I notice a lot of people like to start at either 47 or 48 because it's the first time where they can clearly point to a catastrophe that occurs on the Arab side that they want to ascribe 100% of the blame to the 
newly emergent Israeli state to. Uh, but I feel like when you have this type of reading of history, it feels like the goal is to moralize everything first and then to pick and choose facts that kind of support the statements of your initial moral statement afterwards. Um, whenever people are talking about 48 or the establishment of the Arab state, uh, I never hear about uh, the fact that a civil war started in 47. Uh, it was largely instigated because of the Arab rejectionism of the 47 partition plan. Uh, I never hear about the fact that the majority of the land that was... Yeah, the rejectionism comes from rejecting a settler colonial operation that the British Empire had put forward, and it, and it predates 1947 as well, just for the record. Bro's so scared of Zest and he's covering his face, or because he's fucking banned, dumbass, you know. Was acquired happened by purchases from Jewish organizations of uh, Palestinian Arabs of the Ottoman Empire before the mandatory period in 1920 even started. Um, funnily enough, King Abdullah of Jordan uh, was quoted as saying the Arabs are as prodigal in selling their land as they are in weeping about it. Uh, I never hear about the multiple times that Arabs rejected partition, uh, rejected living with Jews, um, rejected any sort of state that would have even uh, had any sort of Jewish exclusivity. It's funny because this is literally rehashing like all the things that they just talked about, by the way. It was brought up before that only being presented as like, uh, well, it's really interesting that you're refusing to reckon with some of these facts, right? The partition plan was unfair, and that's why the Arabs rejected it. So they rejected it because it was unfair, because of the amount of land that Jews were given, and not just due to the fact that Jews were given land at all, as though a 30% partition or a 25% partition would have been accepted. But I don't think that was the reality of the circumstances. I feel like most of the other stuff has been said, but I, I noticed that um, whenever people talk about 48 or the years preceding 48, um, I think the worst thing that happens is there's a there's a cherry picking of the facts where basically all of the blame is ascribed cherry, to this. Cherry picking of the fact. Dude, the, okay. I just want to point out something here, but th there is no... This is basically just a rehashing of, of, you know, the argument that Benny Moore has presented, which in the simplest, perhaps a little too reductive, but in the simplest terms, is ascribing blame to the victims of ethnic displacement. They deserved it, and also everything that came afterwards, they also deserved. And you can't really make this argument unless you are personally of the mind the the mindset the opinion that like again arabs are monolithic and also cannot uh re cannot be reasoned with they only understand force and also um and also other than the fact that arabs are monolithic that they were asking for it like they were asking for this ethnic displacement to occur and that is why uh, beyond the, the ethnic displacement that they were, the Palestinians were subjected to, uh, there's a good reason for why they also were made to not return to their ancestral homelands after as well. Like they resisted, they resisted settler colonialism and therefore, you know, might is right. They resisted settler colonialism and that's why uh, we, we had to, you know, carve out the the uh the israeli state in the way that we did uh this built-in idea of zionism that because of a handful of quotes or because of an ideology we can say that transfer or population expulsion or the the basically the mandate of all of these arabs being kicked off the land was always going to happen when i think there's a refusal sometimes as well to acknowledge that regardless of the ideas of some of the zionist leaders there is a political social and military reality on the ground that they're forced to contend with and unfortunately the arabs because of their inability to engage in diplomacy and only to use tools of war to try to negotiate everything going on in mandatory Palestine, basically always gave the Jews a reason or an excuse to fight and acquire land through that way uh, because of their refusal to negotiate on anything else, whether it was the partition plan of 47, whether it was the uh, the Lusain peace conference afterwards where Israel even offered to annex Gaza in, in 51, where they offered to take in 100,000 refugees. Every single deal is just rejected out of hand because the Arabs don't want a Jewish state anywhere in this region of the world. I would like to engage Professor Mark. I mean, he literally did say that. Okay, he, he said Arabs cannot be reasoned with, basically, <laughs> like... That's insane. Um, the problem is, the problem is that this kind of argumentation does work when uh, the audience that's like receiving this information also kind of has that same underlying assumption to due to war on terror, Islamophobia, anti-Arab sentiment that is so ever present in American society in the Western world in general. So. You know, that that is, yes, it's motivated reasoning, and a lot of people do have it, and they don't want to go against their learned prejudices, their learned biases that uh, are, are basically permanent, like always there. So you're not just arguing against, um, you're not, in that situation, you're, you're never really arguing against like the fundamental facts uh, of, of history. You're basically arguing against like the, the, social conditioning of a person who uh, is, is going to have this underlying premise that like Arabs, you can't deal with them. You just have to be violent with them. That's the only way you can 
Uh, they, that's the only way you can deal with them. Morris, if you don't mind, I'm not with the first name. It's just not my okay. way of relating. You can just call me Morris. You don't need the professor. Okay. <laughs> There's a real problem here. And it's been a problem I've had over many years of reading your work. Apart perhaps from his grandchild, I suspect nobody knows your work better than I do. I've read it many times. Not once, not twice. At least three times, everything you've written. And the problem is, it's a kind of quicksilver. It's very hard to grasp a point and hold you to it. So we're going to try here to see whether we can hold you to a point. And then you argue with me the point. I have no problem with that. Uh, your name, please? Stephen Bunnell. Okay. Mr. Bunnell referred to cherry picking and handful of quotes. Now, it's- Isn't it funny that the, the dude in the chat, by the way, was basically repeating exactly what uh, Mr. Bunnell ended up saying, <laughs> being like, oh, you're cherry picking Benny Morris's work, actually. Turns out I was already fucking duking it out with the video, goddammit, ahead of time. It's true that when you wrote your first book on the Palestinian refugee question, you only had a few lines on this issue of transfer. Four pages. Yeah. In the first book. In the first book, four pages. Maybe four. You know, I'm not going to quarrel. My memory is not clear. We're talking about 40 years ago. I read it, I read it, but then I read other things about you. Okay. And you were taken to task, if my memory is correct, that you hadn't adequately documented the claims of transfer. Let me Allow me to finish. And I thought that was a reasonable challenge because it was an unusual claim for a mainstream Israeli historian to say. The reasonable challenge for me is fucking not getting so invested in this conversation that I forget to run the top of the hour ad break again and then only running it in the middle of the hour again, two hours in a fucking row now. And the challenge for you is to avoid said ad break by subscribing for $5 or for free. Here's a three minute ad break now. Say, as you did in that first book, that from the very beginning, transfer figured prominently in Zionist thinking. That was an unusual, if you read Anita Shapira, Shapira, you read Shabtai Tevit, that was an unusual acknowledgement by you. And then I found it very impressive that in that revised version of your first book, you devoted 25 pages to copiously documenting the salience of transfer in Zionist thinking. And in fact, you used a very provocative and resonant phrase. You said that transfer was inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism. We're not talking about circumstantial factors, a war, Arab hostility. You said it's inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism. Now, as I said, so we won't be accused of cherry picking, those were 25 very densely argued pages. And then in an interview, and I could cite several quotes, but I'll choose one. You said, removing a population was needed. Let's look at the words. Without a population expulsion, a Jewish state would not have been established. Now, you're the one, again, I was very surprised when I read your book. Here I'm referring to righteous victims. I was very surprised when I came to that page 37, where you wrote that territorial displacement and dispossession was the chief, chief motor of Arab resistance to Zionism. Territorial displacement and dispossession were the chief motor of Arab resistance to Zionism. So you then went on to say, because the Arab population rationally- Minor, minor F, minor F, minor F, mini F, wheezy F baby, it's fine. Fear. You then went on to say- I'm, gonna, I'm going back to the point, if you missed it. A little bit of turbulence. Because the Arab population rationally feared territorial displacement no. and dispossession, it of course opposed Zionism. That's as normal as Native Americans opposing the Euro-American manifest destiny in the history of our own country, because they understood yep. it would be at their expense. It was inbuilt and inevitable. And so now for you to come along and say that it all happened just because of the war, that otherwise the Zionists made all these plans for a happy minority to live there, that simply does not gel. It does not cohere. It is not reconcilable with what you yourself have written. It was inevitable and inbuilt. Now, in other situations, you've said that's true, but I think it was a greater good to establish a Jewish state at the expense of the uh, indigenous population. That's another kind of argument. That was Theodore Roosevelt's argument in our own country. He said, we don't want the whole of North America to remain a squalid refuge for these wigwams and teepees. We have to get rid of them and make this a great country. But he didn't deny that it was inbuilt and inevitable. I think you've made your point there. First, I'll take up something that Muin said. He said that the Nakba was inevitable. 
As have you. And predictable. No, no, no. I, I've never said that. It was inevitable and predictable only because the Arabs assaulted the Jewish community and state in 1947-48. Had there been no assault, there probably wouldn't have been a refugee problem. There's no reason for a refugee problem to have occurred, expulsions to have occurred, a dispossession, massive dispossession to occur. These occurred as a result of war. Now, Norman has said that I said that transfer was inbuilt into Zionism in one way or another. And this is certainly true. In order to buy land, they had, uh, the Jews uh, bought tracts of land on which some Arabs sometimes lived. Sometimes they bought tracts of land on which there weren't Arab villages, but sometimes they bought land on which there were Arabs. And according to Ottoman law and the British, at least in the initial uh, years of the, the uh, British mandate, uh, the law said that the pe people who bought the land could do what they liked with the people who didn't own the land, who were basically squatting on the land, which is the Arab tenant farmers, which is, we're talking about a very small number, actually, of Arabs who were displaced as a result of land purchase in the Ottoman period or the Mandate period. But there was dispossession in one way. They didn't possess the land. They didn't own it, but they were removed from the land. And this did happen in Zionism. And there's, a, 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 if you like, an inevitability. Yeah, no, he was just talking about, he was talking about like uh, the, the, the peaceful ways in which dispossession occurred, you know, through land ownership. It's just real odd that like the land ownership did not pertain to like historically Arab villages, right? Because... Nobody disputes that, like, there was definitely land ownership that occurred, okay? By the way, the very same argument that Benny Morris is presenting here, literally, right now, is disputed in Israeli courts when we talk about Sheikh Jarrah, okay? The land and the homes that are owned by Palestinians under the Ottoman era are still owned by those families to this day, and yet the Israeli courts, for some reason, refuse to acknowledge that as they consistently try to expel the Palestinian population in that area. Just something to consider. This whole like, oh, well, you know, people just came in and, and they bought the land. Yes, they did. This part is true. There are definitely villages and, and houses and whatnot were, that were actually purchased. Okay, I agree. This is, this is a historic fact. Having said that, however, it went far beyond those territorial boundaries. Even the UN partition goes far beyond the, the purchased land that was bought by um, the, the original, the original uh, settler, the original settlers that were brought there with, uh, uh, that were brought there by the, the British Empire in Zionist ideology of buying tracts of land and and for the record you know it is really funny to bring this up as an American you know like as we are living in the United States of America because the inception of Israel and the and the claim that like well you know some of the land was actually purchased by the settlers is pretty funny yeah dude you know we did that too I don't know if you know that but I don't think he would deny the indigenous genocide, right? I, I didn't see an F on my end, by the way. <laughs> I don't think Benny Morris, uh, I, I don't know, maybe he denies the, the uh, maybe Benny Morris denies the indigenous genocide. I don't know, but it'd be real odd. Starting to work it yourself and settle it uh, with your own people and so on. That made sense. But what we're really talking about is what happened in 47, 48. And in 47, 48, uh, the Arabs started a war. And actually, people pay for their mistakes. And the Palestinians have never actually agreed to pay for their mistakes. They make mistakes. They attack. They suffer as a result. And we see something similar going on today in, Ga in the Gaza Strip. They do something terrible. They kill 1,200 Jews. They abduct 250 women and children and babies and um, old people and whatever. And then they start screaming, please save us from what we did because the Jews are counterattacking. And this is what happened then. And this is what's happening now. Uh, it, there's something fairly similar in the situation. You know, what happened then is happening again. But I don't think this argument favors Benny's position. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, no, he's he's not wrong, technically. Technically, he's not wrong. What happened in the Nakba is continuous. It's still happening. Okay? It's still happening. Except it's not exactly a, a favorable position for Benny, in my opinion. A huge majority of Palestinians were ethnically cleansed before Arab armies attacked. He is wrong. Well, that too. But again. Yeah. Expulsion, and this is important, Norman, you should pay attention to this. You didn't raise that. Expulsion, transfer, were never policy of the Zionist movement before 47. It doesn't exist in a Zionist platforms of the various political parties, of the Zionist organization, of the Israeli state, of the Jewish agency. Nobody would have actually made it into policy because it was always a large minority. If there were people who wanted it, always a large minority of Jewish politicians and leaders would have said, no, this is immoral. We cannot uh, start a state on the basis of an expulsion. So it was never adopted and actually was never adopted as policy, even in 48, even though Ben-Gurion wanted as few Arabs in the course of the war 
staying in the Jewish state after they attacked it. He didn't want disloyal citizens staying there because they wouldn't have been loyal citizens. But uh, this made sense in the war itself. But the movement itself and its political parties never accepted it. It's true that in 1937, when the British, as part of the proposal by the Peel Commission um, to divide the country into two states, one Arab, one Jewish, which the Arabs, of course, rejected, uh, Peel also recommended that the Arabs, most of the Arabs in the Jewish state to be, should be transferred. Because otherwise, if they stayed and were disloyal to the emergent Jewish state, uh, this would cause endless disturbances, warfare, killing, and so on. Um, so Ben-Gurion and Weizmann latched onto this proposal by the fa most famous America, uh, democracy in the world, the British democracy, uh, when they proposed the idea of transfer side by side with the idea of partition, because it made sense. Um, and they said, well, if the British say so, we should also advocate it. But they never actually tried to pass it as Zionist policy. And they fairly quickly stopped even talking about transfer after 1938. So just to clarify, uh, what yeah. you're saying is that uh, 47 was an offensive war, not a defensive war. By the Arabs, yes. By the Arabs. Yeah. And you're also saying that there was never a top-down policy of expulsion. Yes. Just to clarify the, the point. If, if I understood you correctly, um, you're making you're making the claim that transfer, expulsion and so on was was in fact a very localized phenomenon result, okay. resulting from individual land purchases. Um, and that, if I understand you correctly, you're also making the claim um, that the idea that a Jewish state requires a um, removal or overwhelming reduction of the non-Jewish population was if the Arabs are attacking you, yes. But but that, let's say prior to 1947, it would be your claim um, that the idea that a significant reduction or wholesale removal of the Arab population was not part of, of Zionist thinking. Well, I, I think there's two problems with that. Um, I think what you're saying about localized uh, disputes is correct. But I also think that um, uh, there is a whole literature that demonstrates um, that transfer was envisioned by Zionist leaders on a much broader scale than simply individual land purchases. In other words, it's, it, it went way beyond, we need to remove these tenants so that we can farm this land. The idea I love the, the concept of like, well, it's just a few bad apples that were doing the, you know, the, the bad stuff, including like the ethnic displacement. But ultimately, uh, but ultimately it's, it's silly because like, okay, well, originally Zionism in its inception also wasn't even like consistently uh, or, or wasn't already uh, uh, agreed upon that they like that Israel would be settled on historic Palestine either. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter if there were like arguments, right? Einstein himself would be considered uh, a labor Zionist originally in the inception of the Israeli state. And right now his sentiment would be considered anti-Zionist. Like everything that Einstein said would be seen as anti-Zionist. There were plenty of people in the inception of the, uh, of the Israeli state that had opinions that uh, that talked about like, well, we got to put all these refugees somewhere, right? That would now, if you look at their entire body of work, uh, uh, especially on uh, the development of the Israeli state, would be considered anti-Zionist, like rugged anti-Zionist. The idea was we can't have a state where all these Arabs remain and we have to get rid of them. And the second, I think, impediment to, to that view is that long before the UN General Assembly convened um, to address the question of Palestine, Palestinian and Arab and other leaders as well had been warning ad infinitum that the purpose of the Zionist movement is not just to establish a Jewish state, but to establish an exclusivist uh, Jewish state and that transfer, forced displacement um, uh, was fundamental um, uh, to that uh, project. And just responding to, um, uh, sorry, was it uh, yeah, Stephen, Bonnell or, or Donnell? Yeah. With a B. Yeah. yeah. Um, you made the point that um, uh, the, the problem here is that people don't recognize is that the first and last result for the Arabs is always war. Yeah, show the contradiction. Benny is not showing problem in the idea that colonization may have been nonviolent, which is impossible because you can't colonize without the removal of peoples. Exactly. Like, Benny's argument ultimately reduces to, because of his earlier work, basically uh, uh, mapping out uh, the, the expulsion of and, and the ethnic transfer of Palestinians from their ancestral homes, almost always will result in um, either A, it was for a higher purpose that was ultimately good, which then still justifies the, the same colonial endeavors, or... Uh, or, or basically this, this false reality that never happened that, uh, you know, oh, well, they intended to do like a peaceful uh, colonial project uh, without any resistance whatsoever. And because the people that were there resisted uh, at the incredibly violent means that the early uh, Zionist brigades took uh, in this forcible ethnic 
uh, displacement campaign that, uh, you know, they kind of asked for it. They were just deserving of this, uh, this inevitable ethnic displacement. Or, I think there's a problem with that. I think um, you might do well to recall um, the 1936 general strike conducted by Palestinians um, at the beginning of the revolt, which at the time was the longest recorded uh, general strike in history. Um, you may want to consult um, the book uh, published last year by Laurie Allen, A History of False Hope, which discusses in great detail the consistent engagement by Palestinians, their leaders, their elites, their diplomats, and so on, with all these international committees. If we look at today, the Palestinians are once again going to the International Court of Justice. Um, they're consistently trying to persuade uh, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to um, do his job. Um, they have launched widespread uh, boycott campaigns. So, of course, the Palestinians have engaged in um, uh, military resistance. But I think the suggestion that this has always been their first and last resort and that they have somehow spurned civic action, spurned diplomacy, I, I think really has no basis uh, in reality. I'll respond to that and then a question for Norm to take into account, I think, when he answers Benedict. I am curious, obviously, uh, I have fresher eyes on this and I'm a newcomer to this arena versus the three of you guys for sure. Um, a claim that gets brought up a lot has to do with the inevitability of transfer in Zionism or the idea that as soon as the Jews envision yeah, the state... Fresher, fresher for sure, considering that, one, didn't know where Israel was on a map, two, thought Recep Tayyip Erdogan was the president of Israel at a certain point. So yeah, I mean, this was, of course, after he had already made up his mind on why genocide is... Uh, uh, definitely what must happen. Everything is post hoc rationalizations after that original point that he made weeks before he even started looking at, oh, did he say uh, Erdogan was the president of Egypt? Is that what he, is that what you mean? So, you know, he does have, he does definitely have uh, fresher eyes on it. In Palestine, they knew that it would involve some master. Yeah. Fresher eyes, like I'm rushing to do my homework after I refuse to do it until the very last moment. Transfer of population, perhaps a mass expulsion. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about Plan Dalit or Plan D at some point. The issue that I run into is, while you can find quotes from leaders, while you can find maybe desires expressed in diaries, I feel like it's hard to truly ever know if there would have been mass transfer in the face of Arab peace, because I feel like every time there was a huge deal on the table that would have had a sizable Jewish and Arab population living together, the Arabs would reject it out of hand. So for instance, when we say that transfer was inevitable, when we say that Zionists would have never accepted you know, a sizable Arab population, how do you explain the acceptance of the 47 partition plan that would have had a huge Arab population living in the Jewish state? Is your contention that after the acceptance of that, after the establishment of that state, that Jews would have slowly started to expel all of these Arab citizens from their country? Or how do you explain that in well, here's a really good argument for that, but um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel didn't actually get full-blown rights until 1967, so uh, it was already an apartheid state from its inception. So yeah, I think it's a pretty pretty solid argument to present that, yeah, no, uh, it, you know, Israel had no interest in like making the lives of the Arab citizens that were now living in what we know as Israel uh, meaningful or or fine i think that they were doing exactly what they are doing in the west bank right now on occupied territory that they're illegally occupying but they they were doing that to the palestinian citizens of israel that lived inside of the territorial boundaries of what we know as israel between the time frame of 1948 till 1967 for those of you who don't know until 1967 palestinian citizens of israel the Arab Christians and Arab Muslims living inside of the Israeli territory were not uh, subjected to the normal civil uh, court system that Israeli citizens, Jewish citizens of Israel, uh, were, were uh, utilizing. Even now, by the way, Palestinian citizens of Israel, post-1967, when they were afforded the same you know, uh, uh, due process instead of being uh, subjected to the the... Uh, martial court, the army court, okay, they still, for example, can be expelled from neighborhoods or be refused entry into, well, not entry, but be refused if they want to, like, rent an apartment, for example, in a community that is designed specifically for Jewish people. This happens right now, by the way. In 2024, inside of the territorial boundaries of Israel, where Israel consistently says, well, what are you talking about? We have a Arab Supreme Court justice uh, in our Supreme Court. You know what I mean? Like, how could you say this is an apartheid state? This is before we, of course, consider the millions of people trapped inside of Gaza and the millions of people that are trapped under the brutal, oppressive apartheid regime of Israel in occupied West Bank. Lusan, a couple years later that... By the way, um, before we uh, move on with this, I do have to say here that, like, 
Lex having uh, uh, Destiny on to argue on behalf of Israel is kind of really bad for Benny Morris because while he is good at uh, invoking emotion and trying to like uh, uh, point out inconsistencies and flaws in the arguments by using like quips and whatnot, um, ultimately Norm is a massive debate lord himself, 100%. And he is infinitely more well-versed in this subject matter. This is his life's work. You know what I mean? And all, all Lex did in this circumstance is basically fucking uh, put, put ankle waist, uh, as someone pointed out in the chat, uh, on, on Benny Morris. Like, he, he's literally going... It, 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 it turns into, like, a, like a 3v1 at points, I, I suspect. He's fucking bronze in a diamond lobby? Yes. <sighs> Israel was willing to formally annex the Gaza Strip and make 200,000 or so people those citizens. But, I, but I'm, I'm just curious, how, how do we get this idea of Zionism always means mass transfer when there were times, at least early on in the history of Israel and, and a little bit before it, where Israel would have accepted a state that would have had a massive Arab population in it? Is your, yeah, is your idea that they would have just slowly expelled them afterwards? Or? Is that question to me or Norm? Either else? one, I'm just curious for the incorporation of the answer, yeah. Um, there's some misunderstandings here, so let's try to clarify that. Number one, it was the old historians who would point to the fact in Professor Morris's terminology, the old historians, what he called, not real historians, he called them chroniclers, not real historians. It was the old Israeli historians who denied the centrality of transfer in Zionist thinking. It was then Professor Morris who... He's laughing because, once again, Benny's in already a shitty position because of his work. He has spent, like, the past decade basically trying to justify the, all of the all of the research that he did in the matter. And so he's already in a shitty position to, to have to defend his like work while simultaneously justify the morality behind it. Um, the morality behind like the actions that he uncovered, I guess. So, so having, uh, having destiny there makes it even harder for him to do that. Contrary to Israel's histor historian establishment, who said, now you remind me it's four pages, but it came at the end of the book. It was No, no, it's at the beginning of the book. Transfer. Yeah, yeah. transfer is dealt with in four pages yeah. at the beginning okay. of my first book on the Palestinian yeah, okay. refugee problem. It's a fault of my memory, but the point still stands. It was Professor Morris who introduced this idea in what you might call a big way. Yeah, but I didn't say uh, okay. it was central to the Zionist, okay. I, the Zionist allow me, uh, experiment. Okay. Allow, allow, allow me. You're saying centrality. Okay. I never said it was central. I okay. said it was there, okay. the idea. It's, by the way, it's okay to respond back and forth. This is great. Okay. And also just a quick question, if, if I may. Mm -hmm. You're using quotes from, from Benny, from Professor Morris. Uh, it's also okay to say those quotes do not reflect the full context of so like if we go back if you know to quotes we've said in the past and you both here have written the uh, three of you have written on this topic a lot is we should be careful and just admit like well yeah well that's just well, real quick just to be clear that the contention is that norm is quoting a part and saying that this was the entire reason for okay. this whereas benny's saying it's a part I, of i'm not quoting a part i'm quoting 25 pages where professor morris was at great pains to document the claim that appeared in those early four pages of his book now you say it never became part of the official Zionist platform. It never became part okay, of I, policy. I, I, fine. Yeah, yeah, no, fine, 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 fine. Yeah, okay. We're also asked, well, this is true. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? It's because it's a very simple fact, which everybody understands. Ideology doesn't operate in a vacuum. There are real world practical problems. You can't just take an ideology and superimpose it on a political reality and turn it into a fact. It was the British mandate. There was significant Arab resistance to Zionism. And that resistance was based on the fact, as you said, the fear of territorial displacement and dispossession. So you couldn't very well expect the Zionist movement to come out in neon lights and announce, hey, we're going to be expelling you the first chance we get. Okay, That's I, not realistic. Okay, can no. I, let, let me okay. respond. Look, you said, you've said it a number of times mm -hmm. that uh, um, um, the Arabs from fairly early on in the in the conflict from the 1890s or the early 1900s said the Jews intend to expel us. This doesn't mean that it's true. It means that some Arabs said this, maybe believing it was true, maybe using it as a political instrument to gain support to mobilize Arabs against the Zionist experiment. But the fact is, transfer did not occur before 1947. Um, and Arab it's just funny because like history absolved them. So it's like odd to still make this position. I guess he's, I guess it goes back to like, well, you know, I guess some of the, uh, early Zionists wanted to do expulsion. Uh, and, you know, I guess because it's a settler colonial operation that like some of the natives understood the assignment and recognized what was happening and resisted. But ultimately, but ultimately it's like, uh, you know, maybe they just got lucky and, uh, and, and knew that it was going to happen, but like not everyone knew. And they were just what being anti-Semitic. 
so many of the most rugged, like the most fundamentalist dudes have openly said time and time again, like the fucking guy that wrote uh, the, the 1988 charter himself personally was like, and, and there are, there is a shit ton, uh, the 1988 Hamas charter. There's a shit ton of anti-Semitism baked into that thing. Okay. Into that document. And even he has time and time again, even he has time and time again said like, listen, the reason why uh, we, the reason why we hate these people is because they are the ones who, who, who took our land. Not the Balfour Declaration. I'm talking about 1988. Uh, what was it? The, the fucking blind sheik or whatever his name is. I'm Not the blind sheik. I'm forgetting uh, his name right now. Um, he's like, if it was Christians, we would hate fucking Christians. Like, it's that simple. Yassin, I think. No. Is that it? I don't remember. Uh, Ahmed Yassin. But yeah, that's that. It's, he's like, it's that simple. Arabs later said, and then and since then, have said that the Jews want to build a third temple on the Temple Mount, um, as if that's what really the, the mainstream of Zionism has always wanted and always strived for. But this is nonsense. It's something I that Husseini used to use as a way to mobilize masses um, um, for the cause, using religion as as the way to get them to to join join him. Um, it, the fact that Arabs said that they're uh, the, the Zionists wanted to dispossess us doesn't mean it's true. It just means that there's some <laughs> Arabs thought that maybe <laughs> and maybe said it sincerely and maybe professor, insincerely. Professor Morris later it became a self fulfilling Pro prophecy. This is true. Professor Morris Arabs attacked the Jews. Professor Morris, I read through your stuff even yesterday. I was looking through righteous victims. You should read other things. You're wasting your time. <laughs> no, no, actually no. I do read other things, but I don't consider it a waste of time to read you. Not at all. Um, you say that this wasn't inherent in Zionism. Now, would you agree that ben David Ben Gurion was a Zionist? A major Zionist leader. Right. Would you agree Chaim Weizmann was a Zionist? Yeah. Okay. I believe they were. I believe they took their ideology seriously. It was the first generation. Just like with the Bolsheviks, the first generation was committed to an idea. By the 1930s, it was just pure rail politik. The ideology went out the window. The first generation, I have no doubt about their convictions. Okay? They were Zionists. Transfer was inevitable and inbuilt in Zionism. You there keep was, repeating yeah, the same for, thing. Because I have, as I said, Benny, Mr. Morris, I have a problem reconciling what you're saying. It either was incidental or it was deeply entrenched. Here I read, it's deeply entrenched. Two very resonant words, inevitable and inbuilt. Deeply entrenched, I never wrote well, it. Well, I'm not it's sure. A, it's something you I just invented. Okay. But, but in the, inevitable there. and no, no, inbuilt. The idea, okay. let me concede, fine, let me concede fine. something. No. The idea of transfer was there. Mm -hmm. uh, Israel Zangville, a British Zionist, talked about it early on in the century. Uh, even Herzl, in some way, talked about according transferring to 25, population. According to your 25 pages, everybody talked well, about it. We keep bringing up this line, in the 25 pages and the four pages. Uh, you know, we're lucky to have Benny in front of us right now. We don't need to go to the quotes. At, like, we can legitimately ask how... I mean, it, it is... I'm glad that he's stepping in, but it, it is important because like it is inconsistent with the it is inconsistent with what he is saying now, I guess, or unless unless he's openly uh, uh, saying that it was good, which I think he is. How central is expulsion to Zionism uh, in its early version of Zionism and what, whatever Zionism is By today? The, way, the thing that Lex and has in front of him, I have power, here as well. Uh, influence the Zionism and ideology have in Israel and the, like influence the, philo the philosophy, the ideology I think Zionism it's like have a on humidity Israel and, today. And the Zionist movement up to 1948, Zionist ideology was central to the, the whole Zionist experience, the whole enterprise up to 1948. Mm -hmm. And I think Zionist ideology was also important in, in the first decades of Israel's existence. Um, slowly, the the, the um, hold yeah, he's not rebutting the inconsistency. He's just avoiding the justification. Exactly. Zionism, like if you like, like like Bolshevism, held the Soviet Union gradually faded, and a lot of Israelis today think in terms of individual success and then the uh, capitalism and all, all sorts of things, which have nothing to do with Zionism. But Zionism was very important. But what I'm saying is that the idea of transfer wasn't the core of Zionism. The idea two, of Zionism yeah. was to save the Jews who had been vastly persecuted uh, in, in Eastern Europe and incidentally in the Arab world, the Muslim world, for centuries, um, and eventually ending up with the Holocaust. The idea of Zionism was to save the Jewish people by establishing a state or re-establishing a Jewish state on the ancient Jewish homeland which is for the record this is also not disputed the problem is the problem is that there were people there <laughs> that's it there were people there you, you can't do that you, you just can't fucking expel these people that were there oh what a cutie patootie she is this place i'm gonna give you a treat girl good girl a banana Ugh. Let's see how fast it, uh, she just rips through that. The fact that they use the saying, a land without a people for a people without a land gives away the game. They clearly want to say with them Palestinians or yeah. Oopsie, there are people uh, there in the land. Oops. Anyway. 
they're cooking. I think they're cooking Benny here. Maybe I'm too biased, but it does feel like it feels like he's getting cooked a little bit. Just something the Arabs today even deny that there were Jews in Palestine or the land of Israel uh, 2,000 years ago. Arafat famously uh, said, "What temple was there on Temple Mount? Maybe it was in Nablus, which of course is nonsense." But but they um, uh, they had a connection, strong connection for thousands of years to the land to which they wanted to return and returned there. They found that on the land lived hundreds of thousands of Arabs, and the question was how to accommodate the vision of a Jewish state in Palestine alongside the existence of these um, um, Arab masses living on were indigenous, in fact, to the land by that stage. Um, and the idea of partition uh, because they couldn't live together because the Arabs didn't want to live together with the Jews. And I think the Jews also didn't want to live together in one state with Arabs in general. The idea of partition was the thing which um, the Zionists accepted. Okay, we can, we can only get a small part of Palestine. Uh, the Arabs will get in 37. Most of Palestine in 1947, the, the ratios were changed. But we can we can uh, live side by side with each other in a partitioned Palestine. And this was the essence of it. Uh, the idea of transfer uh, it was there, but it was never adopted by, as policy. But in 1947-48, the Arabs attacked trying to destroy essentially the Jewish the Zionist enterprise and the emergent Jewish state. And uh, um, the reaction was uh, transfer in some way. Uh, not as policy, but this is what happened on the battlefield. And this is also what Ben-Gurion at some point began to want as well. Right. Well, you know, one of the first um, books on this issue. Yeah, I mean, it's like, this is, uh, this is once again, I'll, I'll use an example that is similar to the inception of the American state, stating that, well, the indigenous populations that lived here started resisting once they started getting fucking murked. And once they started recognizing that, like, they were losing their ancestral territorial land and then uh for that reason it was totally justified to do manifest destiny it was totally justified to it was totally justified to to basically forcibly expel them and kill them you know it's ridiculous which is why the argument then devolves into well who's the real natives to that land and it's ironic because when people say well jews were native to that land yeah the people that they're fucking expelling are also native to that land. Many of them can trace their lineage back of shit ton of the people that are still being slaughtered, have ancestral lineage that can be traced back to the, the inception of Judaism. The fuck? Yeah. They might no longer be Jewish now, but they were back then. The idea that uh, we can account for 3,000 years of history here and make a blood and soil argument for the the inception of the the uh, Jewish ethno state is ridiculous. Okay, it's already ridiculous because that's not an argument you can make. Just like right now, if let's say in a magical situation, let's say the the indigenous populations, but even even before the indigenous populations lived here, because like uh, it's two thousand years. You know what I mean? It's like you can't. Make a justification for why, I don't know, the, the entire territory that spans the fucking France belongs to the Mongols, you know what I mean? Like, greater Mongolian territory, like, you can't do that, you can't say that. It, uh, it, it's just, it's not an argument you can make. The entire world belongs to Africa. Like, how far back are we going for? How, how far back are we going until we make a justification? I honestly think Putin has a better argument for annexing Ukraine using this logic. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous when Putin makes that argument. It's ridiculous when Israeli, uh, when when uh, Zionists make this argument. Anyway, um, was that a real banana or a toy? It was a toy, of course. Um, I will make a justification for the top of the hour coming exactly at the top of the hour. This time, many of you have reminded me in the chat, I will admit, and the three-minute ad break is upon us. Now, those who justify the top of the hour ad break most likely are also subscribed. I wonder if they'd be on the side of Native Americans if Natives just started just murking Americans. Exactly. Like now, if now Native Americans came in and were just like nuking fucking population dense areas, like people would be like, what the fuck are you doing? That's insane. All right. Here's the three minute ad break now. Uh, I read uh, when I was still in high school because my, my late father had it. It was the diaries of Theodore Herzl. And I think, you know, Theodor Herzl, of course, was was the founder of, of the contemporary Zionist movement. And I think if you read that, it's very clear. For Herzl, the model upon which the Zionist movement would uh, would proceed, his model was Cecil Rhodes. His, um, I think, you know, Rhodes, from what I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, has quite a prominent place in uh, Herzl's diaries. I think Herzl was also corresponding uh, with him and seeking his support. Cecil Rhodes, of course, was um, uh, was the uh, British um, colonialist after whom the former white minority regime in, uh, in Rhodesia uh, was named. And Herzl also says explicitly in his diaries 
that it is essential um, to remove uh, the existing population from Palestine. Can I respond to this quite uh, in a moment, please. He says we shall have to spirit the penniless population across the borders and procure employment for them elsewhere. Or something. And, and Israel's Anglo, who you mentioned, a land without a people for a people without a land. They knew damn well it wasn't a people, uh, a land without a people. Um, I'll continue, but I'll but please go ahead. Just to this, mm. There is one small diary entry in Herzl's vast... Uh, it's five diary. volumes. Yeah, five volumes. There's one paragraph which actually mentions the idea of transfer. There are people who I think that Herzl was actually pointing to South America when he was talking about that. The Jews were going to move to Argentina and then they would try and uh, buy out to buy off for spirit the wait a minute doesn't that literally also still say that like no matter where the zionist project was going to be incepted that the transfer was going to occur regardless what the fuck bro it happened like it, it already happened why is he acting like it didn't happen when he recognizes that it happened it's just the same argument it's such a weird it, it's such a weird situation Okay, let's... The, the penniless uh, natives um, uh, to make way for Jewish settlement. Uh, maybe he wasn't even talking about the Arabs in that particular passage. That's uh, the argument of some people. But, does it, but that doesn't even matter. That doesn't even matter because, they, because guess what? Whether it's Argentina, whether it is, uh, what was it? Was it Alaska was another one? And then, uh, and then uh, was it Rwanda or Uganda? I think it was Argentina and, and, uh, and Uganda that were the two places they were talking about part of the reason why uganda was actually cast aside as um uganda was cast aside as a as a place for the the uh jewish homeland to exist in was because the british thought that the british thought that uh, the the indigenous tribes there would put up too strong of a fucking resistance and therefore uh and therefore it would be better to to uh settle uh, the the uh, Jewish people living in uh, the British Empire into Palestine, mandatory Palestine. But that still does not change the underlying very valid argument that no matter where these guys were going to go, they were going to do ethnic transfer, forcible displacement, or rather displacement of some sorts of the ethnicity that already existed in that land through peaceful means somehow there is you know what's really funny about this i remember back in the day when this guy used to debate fucking nazis and white supremacists and ethno-nationalists of different sorts i remember very distinctly an argument he used to make that there can never be a peaceful transfer and peaceful ethnic displacement i remember to the T, one of his arguments, every single time he talked to a Nazi was like, okay, let's say you're an ethno-nationalist. Here's why you can never be a peaceful ethno-nationalist. And then he would walk the Nazis through the steps of argumentation until they had to forcibly concede that yes, there would always be some kind of violence and the removal of people from the land that they wanted to live in and not leave. I, I, I'm sure there are some, uh, uh, you know, Destiny dick riders in the chat or former uh, fans of Destiny that could pull it up personally. Because I remember distinctly him making this argument. Now he's on the other side uh, when it comes to defending Israel, of course, which is, again, still an ethno-nationalist project and therefore just as fascist and just as violent. Maybe he was. But the point is it, it has only a... One hundredth of a one percent of the diary, which is devoted to the subject, it's not a central well, idea I'll, I'll in, in, Herzl, in Herzl's thinking. Now, what Herzl wanted, and this is what's important, not Rhodes. I don't think he was the model. Uh, Herzl wanted to create a liberal, democratic Western state in Palestine for the Jews. That's that was the idea, um, not some uh, imperial enterprise serving some uh, imperial years, master, which is what Rhodes was about. Uh, but to have a Jewish state which was modeled on the Western democracies in in Palestine, and this incidentally was more or less what Weizmann and Ben Gurion Ben Gurion wanted. They Ben Gurion was more of a socialist. Weizmann was more of a liberal. Uh, uh, a Westerner, but they wanted to establish a social democratic or liberal uh, state in Palestine. And they both envisioned through most of the years of their act activity that there would be an Arab minority in that Jewish state. It's true that Ben Gurion strived to have as small as possible an Arab minority in the <laughs> Jewish state because he knew. <laughs> oh, okay. They just, dude, dude, they just wanted to do a little bit of ethnic displacement. You know what I mean? And they wanted to do it peacefully. And, you know, they wanted to make sure it was as small as possible. But, like, but hey, look no further. Okay, how? How do you make it as small as possible? Uh, no, this is an old one. This is like when he uh, used... And residential building.
Okay, okay, it's fine. I, this is a, the very old uh, debate. That if you want a Jewish majority state, uh, that, that would be necessary, but it's not something which they were willing to translate into actual policy. Uh, okay, just so, a quick pause, just to mention that for people who are not familiar, Theodor Herzl, we're talking about over a century ago, and everything we've been talking about has been mostly 1948 and before. Yes, just one clarification on Herzl's diaries. I mean, the other thing that I recall from those diaries is he was, um, he was very preoccupied with, in fact, getting great power patronage, seeing yes. Palestine, um, uh, the Jewish state in Palestine, I think his words, an outpost of civilization against barbarism. Yes. In other words, very much um, seeing his project as a, prox as a proxy for Western imperialism no, no, in the Middle East. Right Not proxy. He wanted to establish a Jewish state which would be independent. To get that, he hoped that he would be able to uh, garner support from major imperial powers. Including, the, including the Ottoman Sultan, yes, who yes, he tried exactly. to cultivate. I just want to respond to a point you made earlier, which was that people expressed their rejection of the partition resolution um, on the grounds that it gave the majority of, the, of Palestine to the Jewish community, which formed only a third. Um, whereas in fact, uh, if I understood you correctly, you're saying the Palestinians and the Arabs would have rejected any partition resolution. Yeah, I, I think a couple I, things that one, they would have rejected any two, a lot of that land given was in the Negev. It was pretty terrible land at the time. And well, three, the land that would have been partitioned to Jews, I think would have been, um, I think I saw it was like 500,000 Arabs, it would have been 500,000 Jews, 400,000 Arabs, and I think like 80,000 Bedouin would have been there. So the, the state well, would have been- I, I, I think you raise a valid point um, because I think I think the Palestinians did reject the partition of their homeland in principle. And I think the fact that um, the United Nations General Assembly then awarded the majority of their homeland um, uh, to the Zionist movement only added insult to injury. I mean, um, uh, one doesn't have to sympathize with the Palestinians um, to recognize that they have now been a stateless people for 75 years. Can you name any country, yours, for example, or yours, that would be prepared to give 55 percent, 25 percent? 10% of your country to the Palestinians? Of course not. And so um, the issue was not the existence of Jews in Palestine. Um, they had been there for centuries. And of course they had ties to Palestine and particularly to Jerusalem and, and other places going back centuries, if not millennia. Um, but the idea of establishing an exclusively Jewish state at the expense of those who are- Unless you're Neil Gorsuch, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're Neil Gorsuch and we're talking about the wonderful state of Oklahoma. <laughs> The only instance in, in modern society where land has been given back by uh, massive quantities to the indigenous population. We're already living there. I think <laughs> it was right to reject that. And I don't think we can look back now, 75 years later, and say, well, you should have accepted losing 55% of your homeland because you ended up losing 78% of it in the addition, and the remaining 22% was occupied in 1967. That's that's not how things work. Yeah. Um, and I can, I, can imagine, I can imagine an American rejecting giving 10% of the United States to the Palestinians. And if that rejection leads to war and you lose half your country, I doubt that 50 years from now, you're going to say, well, maybe I should have accepted that. Sure. So I like this answer more than what I usually feel like I'm hearing when it comes to the Palestinian rejection of the 47 partition plan. Because sometimes I feel like a weird switch happens to where the Arabs and the- He's like, you've presented a good argument, which is why instead of addressing that good argument, I am now going to talk about bad arguments that actually suit my position a little bit better. It's like, bro, you're sitting- across the table from academics dog what do you mean like well let me actually now uh argue against the stupid argument that i think is stupid and and force you to basically defend the argument that i've presented in a way that is probably not going to look good it's ridiculous the area are actually presented as entirely pragmatic people who are simply doing a calculation and saying like, well, we're losing 55% of our land. Jews are only maybe one third of the people here. And we've got 45 and now nah, the math doesn't work basically, but it wasn't. And by the way, most people don't argue on the, the way that he is uh, uh, behaving. And also it is still pragmatic. It is still understandable that people were like, Hey, what the fuck? We're losing our land to people that just came here 10 years ago. I've been living here for 100 years. My family's been here for 100 years. Okay. So, it still makes sense. And history has also, you know, vindicated them in the worst way possible, but still. It's a math problem. I think, like you it said. It was a matter of principle. It was an ideology problem. No, it was a matter of principle. Yeah, ideologically driven. That, that they, as a, as a people, have a right to or are entitled to this land that they've never actually had an independent state on, that they've never had even a guarantee of an independent state on, that they've never actually ruled That's, That, that last point is actually not correct because <laughs> for all its injustice, um, the mandate system recognized Palestine as a class A mandate, which provisionally recognized the independence of, of that territory. Of what would emerge from that territory, but of not that the Palestinian. It was provisionally mm -hmm. recognized. But not... Yeah, it's, it's, it, oh, it's also ahistoric. Like, oh, let's not talk about the morality of the situation is a really fucking cowardly way to, to talk about the forcible ethnic displacement of an entire population, but it's also ahistorical. But the, the territory itself was, but not of the Palestinian people to have a right or well, a guarantee to a government. Well, that would it was a British from. mandate. I found the debate where D takes step by step I why the ethno state would be bad. But then we'd still be losing, like, 
okay, so another big one is like I value white whiteness and white culture. Okay, there right? we go. So it sounds like are you familiar with the term motivated reasoning? Uh, I can probably guess what it means. Okay, sure. So j just to be clear, like motivated reasoning is let's say I really want to um, let's say that I really want to stick my dick inside of a fucking car exhaust, right? Um, let's say that I go out and somebody's like, hey, you shouldn't do this, and then I like make like fifty million arguments for why I should be allowed to do it or why it's okay to do it, and you can tell that I'm just arguing it because I really want to be able to do this thing. I don't really care what the argument is. I just really want to get that end result of fucking my car's exhaust. It feels like when when I talk to a lot of ethno state people, it feels like we are, we're engaging constantly in this weird motivated reasoning where it's very clear that you don't want colored people in your country, but why not just do that? Like let's do the ethical or let's do the philosophical argument of having colored people in the country. Don't bring up like crime or taxes or any weird stuff like that because it's clear that you don't really I mean, care if about I, that. If I just say I just want black colored people gone just because I like white people more, mm -hmm. I think I think I think it would stand a lot better if I just. Like if I had some numbers as to why. Well, but the problem is all of those numbers. Like the but the problem is that those numbers betray you. I mean, it works on the average normie because the average. Person Bro, we have no. We know he has no idea now. What is he talking about? Why do we need to listen to him knowing less five years ago? Because the argument that he's presenting is is not one where you need to have knowledge. He's just logically walking through the steps of why you cannot have a peaceful ethno state. Okay, in order to develop an ethno state. You have to engage in population transfer. You don't need Wikipedia pages of, of historical information to arrive at this conclusion. It's a pretty basic one. I mean, obviously, you know, a, a little bit of historical lessons could help you, right? But he's actually doing a logical uh, uh, argument here. He's making an argument based on logic. And that argument, if he was actually a consistent person would absolutely fit the bill when talking about the inception of the Israeli state. The difference is he's on the side of the ethno-nationalists on this issue. That's why I'm showing you this. And I'm also not just showing you this, I'm showing his fans this. Because some of his fans probably started watching him after his like red pill debates as he presented himself as like, uh, you know, a pretty solid debater, which I've always said he is, you know. Um, and and maybe don't know that like this is actually profoundly inconsistent with his original moral posturing and his positions, or even just pure. It defies pure logic. Person's a fucking moron. But if you really want right. to have like a solid good argument, right? You can't like if somebody says I want to get rid of all the colors, you're like, okay, well why? Well because of crime. Well why not get rid of all cr criminals? Okay, well because of taxes. Well why not get rid of everybody that takes more in taxes? Okay, well IQ. Well why not just get rid of all the low IQ people, right? But the, but it always comes back to well I would want to keep the white ones and get rid of the black. Ones. So let's just right. go okay, to yeah, the. Okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I I think I am engaging in your motivated reasoning. Sure. And so, I, I I probably couldn't tell you why. And like all the stuff I've given you today is just like like my confirmation bias and just like trying to t sell you on why I want these things. But I, I, I probably can't articulate why I want it. I just want it. And okay. I just, I like, I like the, no, no, I actually, I think I can't. So like, do you think uh, culture? Well, yeah, is... wait, 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 real quick. Okay. So we're moving away from all of the hard empirical stuff. So things like crime attack, right. And we're going to move into more softer things. I just want to make sure so that I'm understanding, right. We're moving into like culture and whatnot now. Sure. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Go for it. Now we're on to culture and stuff. Okay, so do you think uh, culture would be like intertwined with race in any way? Um, I would say it is in a correlated way. Um, like people of certain races probably tend to do certain things a certain way, but that's just because of geographically where they live and the type of stuff they participate do you, in. Do you think like a certain race could share certain values? Just inherently? yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay, from there, I'd like to say I value whiteness and white culture in that, like, we could just look around and see all the countries, so, like, like all the prospering ones. Like, well, if I was going to do that, I could just do it by IQ, since, like, all, like, the prospering countries are, like, are above the IQ threshold. I don't know if this is relevant, but I just wanted to say I'm kind of shocked that this guy's a platform on any of these respective albums with a level of hate he spewed lately. Even your most controversial quotes aren't a faction of what he said. Yes, because he positions himself as a progressive or rather a liberal who is a defender of Joe Biden. And then he can like hide under that umbrella fairly well. Um, it doesn't really, yeah, he, he can just present himself as a liberal and then people will go, oh, well, he's just a liberal who's like a little edgy. No one fucking basically has the same dedicated audience that he has to have entire pace bins dedicated to all the shit that he has said, not even out of context, like in context, in the same way that like 
I have a dedicated audience of haters that are probably in here right now uh, that have an entire pace bin full of uh, data that they can point to to be like, he's a piece of shit for this, 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 and this reason. Um, so most people don't even know all of the, uh, the weird, horrifying, awful things that he said. Damn, Kaya has already fucking destroyed the banana peel. Um, he, he does not have obsessed haters. Uh, he has some, I think, but um, they are nowhere near as obsessed as his community is. And therefore, most people are unaware of his like quotes because no one is like as permanently brain broken and as permanently online uh, as, as we are or as his community is. So they just, um, they just probably don't know. No one has like really made like a big stink about it. You know what I mean? That's it. But um, another one would be, I would want my Wait, hold on, children. hold on, hold on, hold on. Because I have to make sure that we're not doing the proxy bullshit again. When you say, I could just do it by IQ, does that mean that you think that a white person with an IQ of 120... No, that was just, that was just me thinking out loud like a dummy. Okay, so but, we're, get, we're getting ready like, because my question is going to be, would a person, would a white IQ 120 person share more in common with a black 120 IQ person than with a white 100 IQ person? That, I'd say no. Okay, so then the IQ, that was total garbage. So I'm throwing that out. Okay, go ahead. You, so, so we're at value, um, whiteness, and white culture. White, oh yeah, value, whiteness. Oh yeah, so it's just like, like I think whites, oh, because we can just look at like voting patterns. Okay, oh, I don't care about the voting patterns. Where is... I, I'm fairly certain that he walks him through the steps of like how you can't have a peaceful uh, uh, transfer of an ethnic population here. See, like, okay, so I have to think like, first, second, overwhelmingly for these things like smaller government, uh, individual liberties and whatnot, like first, second amendments. And this is not the, the best part of this. Bro, just turn on a Hitler speech. Okay, chill. It's Let's Palestine, not the British Mandate of Israel. <laughs> The word exclusive. As an Israeli, I recognize that settling in a land that you are not wanted is intrinsically violent, no matter your intentions or ways. But the Zionist idea was that we would settle a state whether people want it uh, or not, because Jews can't trust other people's states to keep them safe. Zionism is about making your existence a fact. It doesn't make it right, but you seem to think Zionism tries to be purely driven by rationale. No, I, I think that's a really good way to describe it. I, 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 I know. I, that's why I think like pogroms and the Holocaust play a uh, uh, really, no, I, I don't think this guy is wrong at all. I, I don't think Zionism is, is, um, purely driven by rationale. I think it is driven by the understandable fear in shared Jewish history due to pogroms and the Holocaust. So I, I, I bring this up regularly. It is a very important part of, uh, Zionism in general, I just, I just don't think it's a, it's a justifiable proposition, if that makes sense. I do believe that this guy is definitely an Israeli, by the way, because, like, most people don't even understand this aspect of it and usually just, like, repeat Hasbara or shit that they've heard or shit that they learned in school. Do you really agree with what he said? Doesn't that justify anti-immigration somehow? No, I don't agree. I agree with what he's saying, which is facts. He literally is saying... It doesn't make it right, but you seem to think Zionism tries to be uh, purely driven by rationale, like rational thinking. No, I, I do think it's, uh, it's, it's driven by understandable fears. It's driven by understandable fears. Fears of, of centuries of shared Jewish history, from pogroms to the Holocaust, that, that this is like, if there isn't a, a Jewish-only state, then it'll happen again, Right. That is the underlying fear. And that fear is understandable. But fear makes you do irrational things. So I don't think that it is a... Uh, the intergenerational trauma justifies the actions that the, that the uh, early Zionists engaged in. Uh, every single person that is important in this uh, conversation, all three of the people that are having this conversation right now would agree to everything that you said. They would probably take a different uh, approach to it, though. Like... <laughs> all three of the uh, significant people in this conversation would agree with that. I, I agree with that as well. I'm talking about the idea that settling in a land that you are not wanted is, is violent. Yes. Yes. Settling in a land that you are not wanted is almost always going to be violent. This is at the foundation of settler colonialism. Do you really agree with what he said? Doesn't that justify anti-immigration somehow? No, because immigration under normal circumstances is voluntary and is done with consent 
That's the difference. Even the most aggressive, like right wing reactionaries still recognize the role that that immigrants play in this country. Only the most delusional racist people don't. The difference between immigration, however, in the way that it occurs currently in the United States of America, is not that it's it is not guided or directed by a state with a deliberate attempt to displace the local population. Like, even asylum seekers themselves currently that come into this country, one, are not actually, like, being directed by their uh, host nation to go and, like, invade the country in the same way that settler colonialism exists, right? Uh, and two, they're actually abiding by the rules that we created. When they touch base, when they touch American land, they are literally doing what they are legally uh, and, and morally, but certainly legally within their rights to do. Immigrants are not trying to displace America. They are trying to become a part of America. That is the major difference. Settler colonialism does not have uh, the, the ultimate goal of being a part of the local population. Settler colonialism has the express purpose of, of erasing the local population, which is precisely what uh, the, the, uh, the Zionist project did. But you keep using yes. is nonsense. The state which Ben Gurion envisioned would be a Jewish majority state, as they accepted the 1947 partition uh, uh, resolution, as Stephen said, uh, that included 400,000 plus Arabs in a state which would have 500,000 Jews. So the idea of exclusivity wasn't anywhere in the air at all among the Zionist leaders in 47, 48. They wanted a Jewish majority state, but were willing to accept a state which had 40% Arabs. That's one point. The second thing is the Palestinians may have regarded the land of Palestine as their homeland, but so did the Jews. It was the homeland of the Jews as well. The problem was the Arabs were unable and remain to this day unable to recognize that for the Jews, that is their homeland as well. And the problem then is, how do you share this homeland, either with one binational state or separate this partition into two states? The problem is that the Arabs have always rejected both of these ideas. The as homeland belongs to the Jews, as Jews feel, as much as it does, I think, if not I would more say than for the Arabs. Jews. I would say for the Jews. It's the Jewish people's I would also, homeland. Real quick, I just want for both of you guys, because I haven't heard these questions answered. I really want these questions to be, I'm just so curious how to make sense of them. Um, it was correctly brought up that I believe that Ben-Gurion had, um, I think Shlomo ben -Ami describes it as an obsession with getting validation or support from Western states, um, Great Britain, and then a couple decades later, that it explains comes explains this yeah, crisis. exactly. Correct. That was one of the major motivators, the idea to work with Britain and France on a military operation. Imperial stooge. But then the question, again, I go back to, if that is true, if Ben-Gurion, if the early uh, Israel saw themselves as a Western fashion nation, how could we possibly imagine that they would have engaged in the transfer of some 400,000 Arabs after accepting the partition plan? Would that not have completely and totally destroyed their legitimacy in the eyes of the entire Western world? No. Would it not have been? How not? Well, first of all, I think that that Zionist leadership's acceptance of um, the partition resolution, um, and, and I think you may have written about this, that they accepted it because it provided international endorsement of the, the legitimacy of the principle of Jewish statehood, and they didn't accept the borders, um, and in fact, uh, later expanded the borders. Second of all- For that previous ethnostate video, while it's him not walking through the logical conclusion, it's a summary of your point you make, it's at 1.0830, what, in this one? Dude, what? I enjoy, dude. You know how much time I spend in here. All these people disagree with me. I enjoy talking to like outside. Like I'm being friendly with you in a conversation, but I think that it would be morally permissible for like people of color to murder people like you in society. Like I think that your moral views are actually fucking atrocious. Ooh, like I don't. <laughs> okay, that's. That's uh, all right. <laughs> We're moving away from that. But the borders, the borders, borders. Expanded war. They ex accepted the UN partition resolution, borders and all. They, they, accept, they, accepted, they accepted. You the... can say that some of the Zionists, deep in their hearts, had the, the idea that. I think that that in and of itself probably helps people understand, though, that uh, <laughs> that why uh, why many people were duped early on back in the day about um, you know Destiny's uh, ideology. Maybe well, at some including point they would most, be able to get yeah, more. Including but, but their most senior leaders who said yes, so, and I think you've quoted them but saying they so. they accepted what the United Nations, yes. the world community, yes. had said, this is what you're yes. going to get. And, and second of all, I mean, removing dark people, darker dark people, it's, it's, dark. it's intrinsic. In it's in intrinsic. Israel, dark it's, it's intrinsic it's to Western history. So the idea that... America also, his argument here in this circumstance is also fucking stupid. It's like, oh, how could they ever, how could they ever be accepted if they have Arabs in their, uh, in their ranks? Okay. The fucking majority of the Jewish population in Israel now is Arab Jews. What? Like, what do you mean? Clearly, uh, the the concept of like uh, building a a Western society. I think you're missing the point. Yeah, no. The argument I think he's trying to make here is that like um, Ben Gurion wanted to be accepted by the Western world. If the if Ben Gurion wanted to be accepted by the Western world, like 
Am I? And maybe I am missing the point. Actually, I, did I misunderstand what you were saying? I was running. Leaders who said so, and I think you've quoted them. And in fact, the, the logistics. I'm going to work with Britain and France on a military operation. Imperial stooge. But then the question again, I go back to: If that is true, if Ben Gurion, if the early uh, Israel saw themselves as a Western fashion nation, how could we possibly imagine? Yeah, he's not saying he's uh, Israel. He's trying to argue that Israel didn't fancy itself as a Western uh, fashion nation, and and basically. Uh, Am I wrong? He's saying Israel did not actually uh, see itself as like a, a nation that was going to be accepted by the West and instead uh, was actually genuinely interested in uh, genuinely interested in having uh, Arab population. Imagine that they would have engaged in the transfer of some 400,000 Arabs after accepting the partition plan. Would that not have completely and totally destroyed their legitimacy in the eyes of the entire Western world? No. Would not have been? How not? Well, first of all, I think that that the Zionist leadership's acceptance of um, the partition resolution. Oh, oh, yeah. He's saying that if they really planned on expelling the natives, then why would the Western world expect, uh, yeah, accept them? I wonder why. Well, they did, and they have. So that's such a weird thing to say, because they did do that, and the Western world did accept them, because the Western world, I mean, here, you want to know why? He's saying the West wouldn't accept the transfer of Arabs. Yeah, which is so funny because, like, we know that they did. And secondly, here is why. This is it. You want to know why? Here's the answer. Obviously, not everyone is going to have their, their, um, not everyone is going to have their Churchill quotes ready to go, locked in, okay? In the way that I do. Where is it? Hold on. Where the fuck is his take about how uh, the Palestinians are dogs? And I do not believe that uh, they... You let the, you let the dog, I'm not locked in. I'm paraphrasing the, here's, here's what he said, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, a dog in the manger. There it is. Winston Churchill. I think the Winston Churchill example is inappropriate. Winston Churchill compared Palestinians in 1937 to the dog in the manger after reading the Peel Commission, which suggested partitioning British mandated Palestine into Arab and Jewish states. Churchill said of the Palestinians in 1937, I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. So basically the the stance that he's taking here is exactly why um it, it, the stance that he's taking here is is exactly the reason why they would not have cared and they didn't and they haven't. Like historically, if you look at it, this is not something that I think anyone on that table would uh disagree with. Ethnic transfer did happen, right? Whether it was whether it was inevitable due to the circumstances of the Arab states like warring with Israel or whether it was because of a, a, a deliberate attempt to create a, an a ethno state with a overwhelming majority uh, Jewish population. Ultimately, it did happen. And the Western world did actually um, they, they did actually totally abide by that and thought it was OK. So the fact that. He would bring this up in this circumstance is kind of silly solution um and, and i think you may have written about this that they accepted it because it provided international endorsement of the, the legitimacy of the principle of jewish statehood and they didn't accept the borders um and in fact uh later expanded the borders. second of all no, they the, the borders, they the borders expanded the borders. war they accepted the u.n partition resolution borders and all they, they, accepted, they, accepted, they accepted you the, can say that some of the zionists deep in their hearts had the, the idea that maybe well, at some point including they their most, be able to get yeah, more including but, their but most senior accepted, leaders who said yes, so and i think you've quoted them but they grudgingly so. accepted what the united nations yes. the world community yes. had said this is what you're yes. going to get and, and second of all i mean removing dark people Darker dark people, it's, it's, dark. it's intrinsic, in it's in intrinsic, as dark as it's, Arab. it's intrinsic it's to Western history. So the idea that Americans or Brits or the French would have an issue with, I mean, the French had been doing. That's why it's good to bring the Churchill quote in this situation, um, because he's right, but he could just either A, it, I think the better argument here is to either mention the Churchill quote or B, just simply say, well, they clearly had no issue with the ethnic transfer of Palestinians, as you can see, the Western world is offering full support to Israel as is currently conducting its genocidal campaign right now and historically also offered full support to Israel 
when it was doing the uh, forcible ethnic transfer. So it, it's like odd to have this conversation uh, as though it the past 75 years does not exist and is not like ongoing. Doing it in Algeria for decades. The Americans have been doing it in North America for centuries. So how would Israel forcibly displacing um, Palestinians somehow besmirch um, uh, exactly. Israel in the eyes exactly. of the West? In, in the 1944 resolution of the Labour Party, and at the time, even Bertrand Russell was a member of the Labour Party. It endorsed transfer of Arabs out of Palestine. As Muins pointed out, that was a deeply entrenched idea in Western thinking that there was nothing, uh, it doesn't in any way contradict or violate or breach any moral values to displace uh, the Palestinian population. Yeah, the, that only, that, that operational thinking there is like still ascribing some kind of like morality to the Western world that has never been demonstrated throughout history, okay? It's it's in a way it literally reaffirms the position that Israel wanted to be and successfully did become like a West adjacent state because you are abiding by these like Western supremacist principles in an effort to defend this state. It's so funny. Now, I do believe there's a legitimate question. Had it been the case, as you said, Professor Morris, that the Zionists wanted to create a happy state with a Jewish majority, but a large Jewish minority. And if by virtue of immigration, like in our own country, in our own country, given the current trajectories, non-whites will become the majority population in our United States quite soon. And according to democratic principles, we have to accept that. So if that were the case, I would say maybe- the, Is it me or does Steven seem massively outclassed by the other three? Listen, uh, dude, most people who are very knowledgeable on the subject matter would be massively outclassed by the other three for the record like it, it's just there is no like my man is a youtuber whose interest on the subject matter was revitalized after he said something about how like yeah israel's doing a genocide and it has to and then he spent like the next couple of weeks trying to fucking fish for quotes as he was doing his research streams literally trying to engage in ro uh, post hoc rationalizations as he openly demonstrated his uh, lack of knowledge on the subject matter, okay? Motivated reasoning, as he would call out. So to be fair, most people would be outclassed in this situation, but he's extra outclassed as well. It's like he was brought to represent the stupid faction of the Palestinian-Israel conversation. I mean, he's good at throwing out talking points in a way where um where it seems like i mean he's speaking from uh, a position of like confidence that invokes knowledge in the eyes of the people that are watching so i think he's very good at being like uh he's very good at presenting the pro-israeli position i will say because the pro-israeli position does not require you to legitimately know history as a matter of fact you're worse off, like Benny Morris, when you are a legitimate Israeli historian in the argument, because then they can use your fucking work against you. Do you understand? There is no pro-Israeli position that is actually, um, there is no pro-Israeli position that is like deeply invested in the truth and historical facts. Okay? That's, it's kind of better if you don't have any fucking understanding of the situation and you're just trying to like, uh, find good ways of massaging the narrative because ultimately most people kind of cringe at the idea of an ethno state and most people kind of cringe when they have to reckon with the reality of what it takes to maintain an ethno state what it takes to create an ethno state which is ethnic transfer of a of a of a population like forcible uh, ethnic displacement death destruction genocide all the things that Israel's is doing right now so um you you kind of you kind of really, I guess this is the reason why, and I've pointed this out before, like on the one side, the people who are not ultra Zionists, right? You have genocide scholars, both Israeli and also uh, a Jewish in the Western world, right? And then on the other side, you have people like Rabbi Shmuley defending the Israeli position and the Michael Rappaports of the world. And that is not because, you know, that is not because like Israel wants to present the worst possible argument possible. That's because there aren't that many people with like actual uh, uh, backing in academia that will present a reasonable argument when it comes to Israel. Do you understand? That's why all of these debates always look very slanted in one direction 
because it's very difficult. You have to have like a like a fraudulent individual like Alan Dershowitz or or Rabbi Shmuley defend apartheid because most people with historical knowledge on the matter is going to come across like Benny Morris. Benny Morris is probably the best person that you can bring to the table as an academic, and his work reflects uh, <laughs> Israel's actions being unjustifiable and violent in today's, uh, uh, today's moral lens. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand what I'm trying to say? That's why you're always going to have a Prager you guy versus like academics. Yeah, it is the exact same reason why the right spectrum politics never occur naturally in academics unless you're talking about like business school or some shit, okay? That is the same reason why on the issue of like vaccines, for example, you have one side that's fucking slanted, chock full of like scientists, and then the other side is like a chiropractor because it's just objectively, you, you like, so you're supposed to objectively defend something that is objectionable and, and untrue so you can't do it maybe there's an argument that had there been mass jewish immigration changed the demographic balance in palestine and therefore he is literally just a liberal answer ben shapiro he fucking owns dumbasses don't know nothing about a certain topic just like he does but once he goes against someone who knows a shred of something about the topic he gets fucking cooked like ben he is seen as a he's seen as smart because he talks fast and knows talking points yeah and also, like Ben, he's oftentimes on the wrong side of arguments, unless he's like arguing with red pilled fucking idiots who are literally talking about how like you should be able to beat the shit out of your wife. You know what I mean? For uh, Jews became the majority, you can make an argument in the abstract that the indigenous Arab population should have been accepting of that, just as whites in the United States, quote unquote, whites have to be accepting of the fact that the demographic majority is shifting to non whites in our own country. But that's not what Zionism was about. I did write my doctoral dissertation on Zionism. And I don't want to get now bogged down in abstract ideas. But as I suspect, you know, most theorists of nationalism say there are two kinds of nationalism. One is a na like it just blows my mind. Like we're talking about a dude who wrote his doctoral thesis on the concept that we're talking about literally before the other YouTuber was born. OK, like that's how that's how insane this conversation is. It's so slanted academically and intellectually on one side. Oh, my fucking God nationalism based on citizenship. You become a citizen, you're integral to the country. That's sometimes called political nationalism. And then there's another kind of nationalism. And that says the state should not belong to its citizens. It should belong to an ethnic group. Each ethnic group should have its own state. It's usually called the German romantic idea of nationalism. Zionism is squarely in the Jew German romantic idea. That was the whole point of Zionism. We don't want to be Bundists and be one more ethnic minority in Russia. We don't want to become citizens and just become a Jewish people in England or France. We want our own state. Like, the, like the Arab 22 states. No, wait, let's, before we get to the Arabs, let's, get, let's stick to the Jews for a moment or the Zionists. We want our own state. And in that concept Down. of wanting your own state, the minority at best, lives on sufferance and at worst gets expelled. That's the logic of the German romantic Zionist idea of a state. That's why they're Zionists. Now, I personally have shied away from using the word Zionism ever since I finished my doctoral dissertation. Because as, painful? I, <laughs> because as I said, I don't believe it's the operative ideology today. It's like talking about Bolshevism and referring to Khrushchev. I doubt Khrushchev could have spelled Bolshevik. But for the period we're talking about, they were Zionists. They were committed to their exclusive state with, with a minority living on sufferance or at worst expelled. That was their ideology. And I really feel there's a problem with your happy vision of these Western Democrats like Weizmann and they wanted to live peacefully with the Arabs. Weizmann described the expulsion in 1948 as, quote, the miraculous clearing of the land. That doesn't sound like somebody shedding too many tears at the loss of the indigenous population. Let me you, respond you, to the word on sufferance. The on sufferance okay. I don't agree with. I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. The Jewish state came into being in 1948. It had a population which was 20% Arab when it came into being mm -hmm. after Arab refugees. Uh, many of them had become refugees, but 20% remained in the country. 20% of Israel's population at inception in 1949 was Arab. 80% and... went missing. No, 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 no. I was talking about what remained in Palestine, Israel, after it was created. Um, the 20% who lived in Israel received citizenship and all the rights of Israelis, except, of course, the right to serve an army, which they didn't want to. Uh, 
um, and uh, they have Supreme Court justices, they have Knesset members, they enjoy they basically, under emergency basically laws they, until they, uh, yeah, for, a, for a period. Sure, they yeah. lived under emergency. So they didn't no, 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 at, no, no, wait a second. At the beginning, at the beginning, it's not fantasy. At the beginning, they received citizenship, mm -hmm. could vote in elections for their own people, and they were put into parliament. Um, but in the first years, the Israeli, uh, the, the Jewish majority, suspected that maybe the Arabs would be disloyal because they had just tried to destroy the Jewish state. Then they dropped the military government and they became fully equal citizens. Um, so if the whole idea was they must have a state without Arabs, uh, they, this didn't happen in 49. Then and it didn't happen awesome. in the... Then, in then some, why, some, then why did you... Awesome. He's literally... Dude, 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 dude. You can't just like... You can't just justify an incredibly racist position like this. I'm sorry. That is insane. That is actually fucking insane, dude. It's, it's just... Again, motivated reasoning. Well, guess what, dude? They just thought the Arabs were disloyal. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, guess what, dude? Well, the whites thought blacks were subhuman and deserved and wanted to be servile because of their skulls. So I guess chattel slavery is kind of justifiable too. What the fuck do you mean? He didn't completely skip over the emergency rules for 20 years. He's justifying the emergency rules for 20 years. That is a ridiculous... That is a ridiculous thing to say. Or wait, was he, or did he skip over it? I thought he was trying to justify it by saying, well, they, well, the Israeli state originally thought that they were disloyal. I am sorry, but this argument is insane. You say state with the Jewish majority suspected that maybe the Arabs would be disloyal because they had just tried to destroy the Jewish state. Then they dropped the yeah, No, military. he is. He is justifying the first 20 years between 1948 and 1967, Palestinian citizens of Israel did not have any rights that the israeli citizens of israel had palestinians like arabs who were christian and arabs who were muslim did not get the same rights as the jewish citizens living inside of the boundaries of israel he is justifying this the the same exact thing that was happening in the west bank was happening to the palestinian citizens of israel then and he's saying that he's basically saying that like in that first you know military court uh, military mandate where they lived under martial law well it was because they were suspected of being uh they were suspected of, of being fucking disloyal to the to the uh uh to the israeli uh to the israeli state government and they became fully equal citizens um so if the whole idea was they must have a state without arabs uh, this didn't happen in 49 and, and it didn't happen bad take this is bullshit and ahistorical and arabs didn't immediately get citizenship inside israel no he said immediately Top of the hour. Oh, fuck you. 253 again? God damn it, dude. What's happening today? Before the boundaries of 255, you can't hit me with the top of the hour ad break, but I'll fucking do it this time. Fuck you, okay? At the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. You get one free Prime subscription a month. Oh my gosh, she was hiding more uh, of, the, of the fluffy stuff underneath her. I just realized it's cold in here he is justifying due to the 47 war by saying it happened in 1949 here's a three minute ad break now you can avoid those ads by subscribing for five dollars or for free in the then, in some, why, some why did you say professor Marx? yes then why did you say without a population expulsion a jewish state would not have been established because the, the, you're missing the first section of that paragraph which was they were being assaulted by the arabs and as a result a jewish state could not have come into being unless there had also been an expulsion of the population which was trying to kill norm them. i'm officially forbidding you referencing that again <laughs> I, we I think hold on a second wait. uh we responded to it so the, the main point you're making we have to take Benny at his word is like there was uh, a war and that's the reason why he made that statement i think to, just one last point on this i, I remember reading your book when it first came out and 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 reading you know one incident after the other and, and one example after the other and then getting to the conclusion where you said um uh, the nakba was a product of war not design i think we were and i remember reacting almost in, in in shock to that that i felt you had mobilized overwhelming evidence that it was a product of design not war and i think mm -hmm. our discussion today very much uh reflects let's say the dissonance uh between the evidence and the conclusion you don't feel that that the um, uh, the research that you have conducted and published demonstrates that it was in fact um, inherent and inbuilt and inevitable. Um, and I think the point that Norm and I are making is is that I'm not gonna lie. I think Lex is, I think Lex's uh, approach here forbidding Norm from addressing Benny's take. It comes across as one sided, but it's actually good. Okay, I'm serious. Here's why, because Norm. This is a five hour conversation. Norm will absolutely go back to that point 
and hammer it into the fucking ground and never move away from it because, and this is why he is a, a, a phenomenal scholar, he's a profoundly stubborn man to a fault. That stubbornness actually makes him one of the goats, okay? For sure. But when we're doing a five-hour conversation of back and forth, you kind of got to move on and cook the dude in other angles, okay? He, he does get tunnel vision, I think, um, and, and I think it's admirable because he has, like, been that stubborn about issues that matter his whole life. He's staked his whole fucking reputation uh, on this. But I do think it's good to, to move on from this. Hassan, you are an idiot. Thank you. I agree. I'm not a very smart person. I do, however, uh, read and listen to a lot of much smarter people than me. So when I, you know, tell you their positions, I guess, you know, maybe people mistake me as being smart. Your own historical research, together with that of others, indisputably demonstrates that it does. I think that's a fundamental disagreement we're having here. Can I, well, yeah, can I actually respond to that? Because this is actually, uh, I think this is emblematic of the entire conversation. Um, I watched a lot of Norm's interviews uh, and conversations in preparation for this, and I hear Norm will say this all over and over and over again. I only deal in facts. I don't deal in hypotheticals. I only deal in facts. I only deal in facts. And that seems to be the case, except for when the facts are completely and totally contrary to the particular point you're trying to push. The idea that Jews would have out of hand rejected any state that had Arabs on it or always had a plan of expulsion is just betrayed by the acceptance of the 47 partition I don't plan. think you understand politics. Did I just say that there is a chasm that separates your ideology from the limits and constraints imposed by politics and reality. Now, Professor Morris, I suspect would agree that the Zionist movement from fairly early on was committed to the idea of a Jewish state. I am aware- He's right though, Norm is right, because he doesn't understand politics because he's a liberal and liberalism dictates that like politics is not fucking real. Liberalism, liberalism inherently, uh, in order in a in a liberal world at least, because of its hegemonic status, implies that you can get away with acting like you're not talking about politics at all. When in fact, politics is about the distribution of power and resources. That's all politics is, but historically, okay. Liberalism, on the other hand, makes it seem like it's it's some it's anything but that, and it can only do that. Because it's the default state of society nowadays. Obviously, uh, you know, in, in uh, pre-industrial revolution times or before, uh, you know, in, in the feudal era, liberalism was very political, right? Like, but the, the, I guess, liberals of that time, or rather those who are defenders of the existing constructs of that time, could get away with claiming that they were not being political and simply pointing to everything and going, well, this is just how things are and it's good aware of only one major study, probably written 40 years ago, the, uh, the binational idea in mandatory Palestine by a woman, I forgot her name now, you remember her. I'm trying to. Yeah, okay, but you know the book. I think so. Yeah, she is the only one who tried to persuasively argue that the Zionist movement was actually, not formally, actually committed to the binational idea. But most historians of the subject agree the Zionist movement was committed to the idea of a Jewish state, having written my doctoral dissertation on the topic I was confirmed in that idea because Professor Chomsky, who was my closest friend for about 40 years, was very committed to the idea that binationalism was the dominant trend in Zionism. I could not agree with, I couldn't go with him there. But Professor Morris, you are aware that until the Biltmore Resolution in 1942, the Zionist movement never declared it was for a Jewish state. Why? Because it was politically impossible at the moment until 1942. There is your ideology, there are your convictions, there are your operative plans, and there's also separately what what you say in public. The Zionist movement couldn't say in public, we're expelling all the Arabs. They can't say that. And they couldn't even say we support a Jewish state until 1942. You're conflating two things. The, the, the Zionists wanted a Jewish state, yes. correct? That didn't, that didn't mean, mean expulsion of the Arabs. Saying, yeah. It's not the same thing. They wanted a Jewish state with a Jewish majority, but they were willing. Dude, this literally, I'm telling you, this is, <laughs> yo, that's why I pointed to this debate. I know for a fact that Somewhere along the transcript, someone can find it. There, there is the underlying argument that he made five years ago against the fucking ethno nationalist that there is no peaceful, there's no concept of a peaceful ethnic displacement. It cannot happen. People are not going to want to fucking leave. You cannot, you cannot advocate for the ideology, the ideological underpinnings of the Zionist movement being like inherently peaceful without 
reckoning with that reality. It's just not a thing that existed in history and it will never exist. It's also ironic because, yes, it, like you also pointed out, Chatter, he said expulsion is needed like multiple times throughout this conversation and also in his work. <laughs> it's crazy. As it turned out, both in 37 and in 40, 47, and subsequently, to have an Arab minority, a large, oh. a large Arab in 37, minority. There was a transfer. They were willing to have a large Arab minority oh, in the country, and they ended up with a large Arab minority in the country. 20% oh, right. of the population they, they in 49 was Arab, up, and it's still They ended up for percent. about five minutes before they were expelled. They agreed to no, win no, until no, 47, I, and then they were gone by March 1949. No, they, what they, happened in between the rejection of the partition plan and the expulsion of the Arabs? The Arabs launched the war. Well, yeah, well, I mean, cool. like, it's not, it wasn't random. Like, there's a potential I that. It wasn't random. I totally agree with that. It was by design. You can say that. You can say that but in this case, the facts betray you. There was no Arab acceptance of anything that would have allowed for a Jewish state to exist. Of number not. one, and number two, I think that it's entirely possible given how things happen after war that this- I think like we have to pull ourselves out for a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, get back on there. That's crazy. Y'all see that? Y'all see that? She just took one little baby step off that. Okay. Oh my God. That's crazy. She tried it. Um. If colonization of the Americas happened today, they would justify the native resistance to colonization as a justification to exterminate them. Yes, I, I made this point earlier. And pretty sure many people do that already right now. Like, if you pull yourself out of this conversation, you are forced to reckon with the reality that one side is currently saying, why didn't the Palestinian population sit back and take their ethnic displacement? And the other side is saying, why the fuck would the indigenous population sit back and take their fucking ethnic displacement, which inevitably happened? It's so, so odd. This exact same conflict could have played out and an expulsion would have happened without any ideology at play. That there was a people that disagreed on who had territorial rights to a land. There was a massive war afterwards and then a bunch of their friends invaded after to reinforce the idea that the Jewish people in this case couldn't have a state. There could have been a transfer regardless. Anything could have been. But that's not what history is about. History uh, is about Palestinian yeah, rejections okay. to any peace deal as I over said, and over and as over I again. Said, when the war was thrown into the court, of the United Nations, they were faced with a practical problem. And I, for one, am not going to try to adjudicate the rights and wrongs from the beginning. I do not believe that if territorial displacement and dispossession was inherent in the Zionist project, I do not believe it can be a legitimate political enterprise. Now, you might say that's speaking from 2022 or 2024. Four now, now. Okay. <laughs> but we have to recognize that from nearly the beginning, for perfectly obvious reasons, having nothing to do with anti-Semitism, anti-Westernism, anti-Europeanism, but because no people that I am aware of would volunteer. He's absolutely right on this, by the way. The 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 justifications always uh the justifications always go back to uh a historical approach is like, oh well, they were always like anti-Semitic. It's like, no man, no, they weren't. They fucking were not. If it was a Christian population that came in and did this, if it was the Catholics, if it was the Zoroastrians, they would be the fucking anti Zoroastrians. Voluntarily cede its country. Like you, can per you, can per you can perfectly understand Native American resistance to Euro colonialism. You can perfectly well understand it without any anti Europeanism, anti Whiteism, anti Christianism. They didn't want to cede their country to invaders. That's completely understandable. You're minimizing the anti Semitic element you in, minimize uh, in it. Arab nationalism. In all your books, you minimize No, no, no. The, uh, Husseini was an anti-Semite. The leader yeah. of the Palestinian national movement in the 30s and 40s was an anti-Semite. This was one of the things which drove him and also drove him in the end to work in Berlin for Hitler for four years with a Nazi, uh, giving Nazi propaganda to the Arab world, calling on the Arabs to... Dude, dude, come on. You're a historian. You can't do this fucking Palestinian Grand Mufti shit, dude. Come on. No. <laughs> like, it, it, it's, it's crazy. No, he is a historian. Like, he knows. Come on, dude. Like, you know better. That's ridiculous. That's This is the first time in this conversation beyond, like, obviously the... Okay. Benny Morris is an ideologue. Benny Morris is a propagandist. Benny Morris is a Zionist. Okay? This is true. But Benny Morris is also a scholar. So, for him to do propaganda is one thing, which is, you know, it, it's his ideological positioning... But for him to also do propaganda by by going to this length of like Hasbara shit is something that I expect from Benjamin Netanyahu, not from Benny fucking Morris. You know what I mean? It just like this is this is the type of shit that like I, I would suspect most historians would look at and go, what the fuck, dude? Come on.
the other stuff at least you can kind of try and justify by being like well you know that's his underlying position it's fine but i think he's like he's getting a little riled up here to to take it to this level because it's a it's a level of intellectual dishonesty to claim that it was anti-semitism as the leading motivator in the in the in the refusal of the indigenous population uh, to to just sit back and idly stand by and take their ethnic displacement is a ridiculous fucking approach. It's so 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 silly. Murder the Jews. That's what he did in World War II. That's the leader. Did he say it was a leading motivator, oh, dude? If you're if you're doing that to try and justify, why would he bring it up if it wasn't a leading motivator? Like. He said it played a factor. Why is he bringing it up? First of all, it did not play a fucking factor. It's ridiculous. It is an intellectually dishonest argument. He's bringing it up because anti-Semitism is a real problem. Anti-Semitism is a real bigotry, and you're only bringing that up to basically pr provide underlying justifications for why the, the uh, Zionists behaved in the way that they did, in the violent ways that they be, uh, behaved. Okay? Surely it played a factor? No, the fuck it didn't. Especially because I assume that you are unfamiliar with how the fucking Palestinian Mufti came into power to begin with, which was, again, a fucking British... He was like a, a, like a British mandate Palestinian position of power. He was brought into that position, not because he was, uh, uh, you know, beloved by all. More Palestinians died in World War II fighting against Nazi Germany. Not only is this ahistorical, but it's also completely fucked to bring this up. Palestinians died fighting against Nazi Germany. It is utterly irrelevant in the subject matter because the real reasons were resisting against settler colonialism. But that's a valid reason. And in order for you to reckon with the invalid and immoral aspects of the Zionist project, you can't look at the valid reasons. You have to desperately grab onto anything that you can to basically minimize their moral justification. Because inherently, you also recognize that they are morally just in resisting settler colonialism. History has, has absolved them 10 times over, but even back then. No, you're minimizing the genocide of... You're being as dishonest as he is? Oh, okay. Uh, he was talking to the chatter. I thought he was talking to me. I was like, what the fuck? Anyway, <laughs> you guys are so dumb. <sighs> okay, okay, okay. Where the fuck was I? Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Of the Palestinian Arab National Movement. Why is it and he wasn't alone. He wasn't Professor alone. Mark, he wasn't, why he wasn't, is it that if you read your book, Righteous Victims, you can read it and read it and read it and read it, as I have, you will find barely a word about the Arabs being motivated by anti Semitism. It exists. It, even, I didn't say it doesn't exist. Ah, you agree, agree that it exists. Okay, <laughs> hey, I don't know a single non Jew who doesn't harbor anti Semitic We're sentiment. talking about Arabs now. Yeah, but I don't know anybody that's just part of the human condition. Anti Semitism. Yes, was saying it was a word. And among the Arabs. So, Professor Mars, here's my problem. I didn't see it. Damn, Norm, chill. <laughs> Bro really said anti-Semitism is natural. <laughs> what does he mean? Oh no, he's cooking too hard. Uh-oh. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh. See that in your righteous victims. Even when you talked about the first intifada, and you talked about the second intifada, and you talked about how there was a lot of- Why do you find that funny? Because it's an insane thing to say. And- if you know anything about Norm, he does have some insane tendencies. So it's textbook, it's a, a, a textbook Norm Finkelstein moment. <laughs> Influenced by Hamas, the Islamic movement, you even stated that there- He's saying that, by the way, to be basically concede that like, yes, of course, there's going to be uh, motivating principles of bigotry amongst every person. You can find every person that has like some level of anti-Semitic tendencies or something like that. It's inherent in us all, which I don't agree with. Uh, because I do think that uh, I do think that bigotry is taught; it's learned behavior, uh, and you can unlearn it. But having said that, um, yeah, he's saying prejudice is a part of the human condition, exactly. Uh, but he worded it in a weird way. Uh, regardless, regardless, um, his his larger point here is to basically his larger point here is to basically say that, like, regardless of the 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 prejudice that people have, their cause 
across the board was not motivated by anti-Semitism, but instead, um, but instead uh, motivated by a, a completely understandable uh, uh, motivation to not be victims to a settler colonial state. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in those movements, but then you went on to say, but of course, at bottom, it was about the occupation. It wasn't about, and I've read it. Yeah, but you're moving from different no, I'm not moving. ages, across I'm the ages. I'm talking about your whole book. The, the your occupation whole book. began in 67. I, I, I think he's, I, I think this is a fair assessment too, by the way. He's saying, if anti-Semitism played any role whatsoever, why didn't you fucking bring it up in your book? I looked and looked and looked for evidence of this anti-Semitism as being a chief motor of Arab resistance to uh, Zionism. I didn't see it. You like, did, did he make that claim? I don't remember the word chief. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very binary, it's binary thinking. Elements. Sorry, binary. Binary. Yes, binary. Yeah, please don't give me this postmodernism binary. You're the yeah, one. You are thinking you're the <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Norm, don't do it. Um, <clears throat> so, so, oh, it's not binary thinking. Why would you bring it up then? I'm sure some Palestinians were were also uh, bad guys. I'm sure some Palestinians, like for example, did murders. I'm sure some Palestinians stole. Would you ever bring that up as an argument, as a justification? No, you only are bringing the anti-Semitism aspect, even though it is nowhere near an important motivator in Palestinian emancipation to justify your position, to justify the fears to justify why Israel had to be violent. That, in my opinion, that, in my opinion, is basically, a, a, that, that gives a revelation to the, to the listener, to the careful listener, okay? The revelation is, yes, Israel's actions are unjustifiable, but, because if Israel's actions were totally justifiable on its face, you wouldn't have to grasp at, like, random, nonsensical uh, uh, fucking uh, the bigotries that you think are motivators that you didn't really think were primary motivators at all. This is reactionary thinking in display. For those of you who don't understand, um, this basically goes back to, you know, old colonialist justifications of, uh, of, of civilizing the, the barbarians. It happened in the Roman times, you know, and it happened uh, during the conquistadors uh, in their conquests. In, it, it happened in Manifest Destiny. It is always the same exact, uh, well, they're barbarian, they're fucking violent, and, uh, and they want to kill us, and, and, and that's why we have to, you know, we have to civilize them. I want to say the chief motor. Point. Do you, you have your book here? You talk about page one thirty-seven. You talk in black and white. Page thirty-seven. You, you're talking in black and white concepts when history is much grayer. Lots of things happen because of lots of reasons, not one or the other. And and you don't you don't seem to see that. Can I ask you a question? Because it's for them to talk to. Talk to you a very quick yes. question. What was what do you think the ideal solution was on the Arab side from forty-seven? What would they have preferred? Well, and what would happen if and, and then the second one? What would have happened if Jews would have lost the war in forty-eight? What do you think would have happened to the oh. Israeli population? Well, population? I, I think the, the Palestinians and the Arabs uh, were explicit that they wanted a unitary, I think, federal uh, state. And and they made their submissions to uh, UNSCOP. Uh, they made their um, uh, appeals at the UN General Assembly. What do you mean by unitary? It always goes back to the they weren't perfect victims narrative, by the way. Notice, notice, they were not perfect victims. The Palestinians were not perfect victims. This victim of police brutality is not a perfect victim. You only bring up George Floyd's track record if you want to justify why he was executed, okay? You don't just bring that up randomly in a situation where, like, one party is doing an objective wrong. You're doing it because, you know, you just want to be like, eh, they, they kind of, they were asking for it, right? I mean, think about it. It's a little valid. It's a little valid, especially when that track record or that, that argument does not, make any sense because it plays no role in the motivations of the people at the time it is a post hoc rationalization audit the audit gives the palestinians an a minus in their genocide and ethnic cleansing yeah oh. i federal i don't get that they wanted an arab state they wanted palestine to be an arab state. yes yes simply, but, but, but that's the word unitary yeah. federal they wanted palestine yes, but as I an think... arab and exclusively arab state no it wasn't an ex... no it wasn't an exclusively arab state i think we have to distinguish the... oh that's another good that's another good ethno-nationalist argument okay there were there were Jews that were Arab. There were Jews living there that were Arab in historic Palestine, in mandatory Palestine. 
He's trying to be like, oh, well, the Palestinians were trying to do Israel, but Arab, uh, <laughs> the Arab version of Israel. What about the Christians, Lamau? No, no, no. That's, he, he says Arab because he's using the current Israeli state's demographic designation because he is a Zionist and he does agree with that, right? So he's, this is also always a losing argument in the Western world. You can only present it as such if the audience that's listening in are completely uh, devoid of the, the knowledge. Because Judaism is a, is, is, uh, a religion, but Jewish is an ethno-religion, right? It contains multiple different ethnic backgrounds, including Arabs. As a matter of fact, a big chunk of Arabs. But when he's talking about it, he's simply mentioning Muslims and Christians. Okay? Yet another reason why it's a very difficult uh, journey for a Zionist to justify um, their, their project in the face of, like, actual knowledgeable opposition. It's hard. Between Palestinian and Arab opposition to a Jewish state in Palestine, on the one hand, and um, Palestinian and Arab attitudes to um, Jewish existence in Palestine. And there's a fundamental well, difference. Well, the leader of the movement said that all the Jews who had come since 1917, and that's the majority of the Jews in Palestine in 1947, yes. shouldn't be there. Well, he did they say shouldn't that. be citizens and shouldn't be there. He, he, did, he did say that. Yes, I'm not saying that. Yes, 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 it's true. Yes. I can understand the sentiment, but I think it's wrong. But also, you guys are the ones who agree with I want to answer your question. You used the words earlier that it was supremacy and exclusivity that the Zionists... Well, I want to answer your question. As you Hussein did say that, and I'm sure there was a very substantial body of Palestinian Arab public opinion that endorsed that. Um, but by the same token, I think um, a unitary Arab state, as you call it, or a Palestinian state could have been established with arrangements, with guarantees um, to ensure the security and rights of, of both communities. How that would work in detail had, had been um, uh, discussed and proposed, but never uh, resolved. And again, I think, you know, Jewish fears about what would a have happened. The second Holocaust. That's what well, no, I, I think that was the Jewish fear. A second that, Holocaust. That, that, that may well have been the Jewish fear. Yeah. It was an unfounded uh, Jewish fear. It was unfounded? Of course it was unfounded. What about like in 48 you, you, you and you really, 56? You really, think, you really think that the Palestinians, had they won the war, were going to import ovens and crematoria from Germany? Bad, and, and, but there were programs across in almost every single Arab state where there were Jews living after after 48, after 56, mm -hmm. after 67. There were always programs. There were always flights from Jews from those countries to Israel afterwards. I wouldn't I wouldn't say there were always programs in every Arab state. I think there was flight of... of um uh, Arab Jews for multiple reasons. In some cases, for precisely the reasons you say, if you look at the Jewish community in Algeria, for example, yes, their flight right. had virtually nothing to do with um, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. The issue of, of Algerian Jews was that the French gave them citizenship during their colonial rule of Algeria, and they increasingly became identified uh, with French rule. And when Algeria became independent and um, all the French um, ended up uh, uh, leaving, out of fear or out of disappointment or out of whatever, um, the Jews were identified as French rather than Algerian. This is a bit of a red herring. There were pogroms in the Arab countries, in Bahrain even, where there's almost no Jews. There was a pogrom not, in I'm, 1947. There was a pogrom in Aleppo in 1947. I'm not, I'm not denying there any were, of that uh, history. killings uh, of Jews in Iraq and Egypt I'm not in 1948-49. I'm not so, denying so, any... But the, Arabs, the Jews basically fled the Arab states, not for multiple reasons. They fled because they no, felt they... that the governments there and the societies amid, amid, amid which they had lived for hundreds of years no longer wanted them. Look, without, without getting into the details, I yeah. think we can both agree that ultimately a clear majority of Arab Jews who believe that after having lived in these countries for wait, se for wait, centuries, wait, for, for, centuries for centuries, wait, for, for centuries, for centuries, for centuries, if not millennia, um, came to the unfortunate conclusion that their situation had become untenable. Yes. Um, I also think um, that we can both agree that this had never been an issue prior to Zionism, but the emergence of the state of Israel. Look, I'm, I'm not... Pogroms didn't begin with Zionism. Oh, that's a, a disingenuous. Disingenuous. Pogroms didn't begin with Zionism is disingenuous. Pogroms didn't begin with Zionism is a correct take historically if you're talking about fucking Europe. There's a reason why you're bringing up, there is a reason why you are bringing up pogroms as a statement because you are trying to invoke the historic pogroms that occurred against the Jewish population in Russia and all around Europe when... Anyone who is knowledgeable on the issue, including Benny Morris, knows that, at least under the Ottoman Empire, Jews found safe haven, according to historical record. This does not mean, worthwhile to note that pogrom is not an Arabic word, exactly. Uh, worthwhile also to, to mention that this doesn't mean that there, was no, uh, there were no issues for Jews in the Arab world, but the majority issues for uh, Arab Jews in the Arab world came after Zionism, or if it predated Zionism, 
it usually was a byproduct of Arab nationalism. In the Arab world. The issue is, 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 is the point I raised, which is whether these communities had ever come to a collective conclusion that their position had become untenable in this part of the world. No, they were Arab Jews. Well, because untenable meant there was no alternative. But with the creation of Israel, there was an alternative, right? A place where they could go and not be discriminated against or live as second-class citizens or be subject to Arab-majority states. I, I also think it's interesting that like, when you analyze the um, the flight of Jewish people, and I've seen this, that there, it's, it wasn't just, I agree with you, it wasn't just a mass expulsion from all the Arab states. There were definitely push factors. There were also pull factors. Now, I don't know how you guys feel about the Nakba, but when the analysis of the Nakba comes in, again, it's back to that, well, that was actually just a top-down expulsion. Um, you know, The retreat of wealthy Arab people in the 30s didn't matter. Uh, any of the messaging from the surrounding Arab states didn't matter. It was just an expulsion from. Jewish people or people running from their lives from Jewish massacres. Um, th again, it's like, I feel again, like that's a selective, it's a selective critical analysis of the term Jewish here because it wasn't the, you know, the Jews of England or the Soviet. Well, Jews I said Jewish because prior to 48, I think, think, Israeli, the issue I think, I think, I think we should, I think I it's I, useful to, to say, um, refer to Zionists before 1948 and Israelis after 48. We don't need to implicate uh, well, sure, but the, Jews but, the, but the Jewish people that were being attacked in Arab states weren't Zionists. They were just okay, Jews I'll living there. just comment on that. I was rereading Shlomo Ben Ami's last book. And he does, at the end, discuss at some length the whole issue of the refugee question bearing on the so-called peace process. And on the question of 48 and the Arab emigration, if you allow me, let me just quote him. Israel is particularly fond of the awkwardly false symmetry she makes between the Palestinian refugee crisis and the forced emigration of 600,000 Jews from Arab countries following the creation of the state of Israel, as if it were, quote, an unplanned exchange of unpopulations, unpo unquote. And then Mr. Ben Ami, for those of you who are listening, he was Israel's former uh, foreign minister, and he's an influential historian in his own right. He says, in fact, envoys from the Mossad and the Jewish agency worked underground in Arab countries and Iran to encourage Jews to go to Israel. More importantly, for many Jews in Arab states, the very possibility of emigrating to Israel was the culmination of millennial aspirations. It represented the consummation of a dream to take part in Israel's resurgence as a nation. So this idea that they were all expelled after 1948, it's... Again, D highlights he is founded on rhetoric, not information, not an academic scrutiny. He is an orator. Yes. But the reality is that most people are not fucking academically inclined. Okay? Hassan is wrong. Look it up. In Libya, 130 Jews were killed. And 266 injured in December 1947. 13 Jews were killed in Damascus, including eight children, and 26 were injured. What about blood libel spread throughout the Middle East and North Africa? Aleppo, Damascus, Beirut, Dar al Kamar, Jerusalem, Cairo, Mansoura, Alexandria, Port Said, and Daman Hur. This is a very common, this is a very common retort to the things that I said by people who don't listen to the words I am using. I used very specific language. OK, I used very specific language. You also kept the Wikipedia citation number in your fucking argument. I did not say that there were no problems for Jewish people. I said in comparison to the systemic annihilation that Jewish people faced in Europe and in Russia in general. OK, Jews regarded at least the Ottoman Empire okay, as a safe haven, because it was a safe haven. The Ottoman Empire, despite being Muslim, gave Jewish people the opportunity to have full-blown rights that the Christians also had. Throughout that, throughout the Ottoman Empire, throughout the history of the Ottoman Empire, this does not mean that there were no, uh, there were no problems for Jewish people, of course in comparison to the mass expulsion and ethnic uh, ethnic cleansing. I'll, we, I'll use Wikipedia unless you can tell me why the data is wrong. No, the data, the data that you are using is incomplete because you're using it in an ar against an argument that I am not making, okay? That's the issue here. Following since 10, 17, 23, weird fucking timing. I'm not saying that the Wikipedia copy pasting operation that you engaged in is is showing false information. I'm simply stating that I already addressed that. Okay, my dude, you literally pulled a oh, you care to claim about uh, you you claim that you care about Jewish people? Name all of the pogroms, and you didn't even name them yourself. You just copied and pasted it off the fucking Wikipedia bracket. No, Wikipedia can be a reliable source of information. It's just that if you don't understand what your interlocutor is saying, you end up just copy-pasting something, basically like an like a AI bot.
that's one area, Professor Morris, I defer to expertise. That's one of my credos in life. I don't know the Israeli literature, but as it's been translated in English, there is very little solid scholarship on what happened in 1948 in the Arab countries and which caused the Jews to leave. Arab Jews. Uh, Arab Jews, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Shlomo ben Ami knows the literature. He knows the scholarship. He He's a historian. From Tangiers. Yeah, He's from Morocco. So, right. So yeah, he knows this. Uh, from Iraq. And, he has written on this issue. And, and they wrote oh. that the Jews in the Arab lands were not pro-Zionist. They weren't Zionists at all. So certainly Avi Schleim's family was anti-Zionist. It implied that Benny's claim was disingenuous based on your statement. It mainly came from the West when not a single piece of Benny's literature primarily blames... Huh? I don't even know who you're arguing with at this point. I don't think you're arguing with me. I think you're arguing with what you think I've said. I don't even know what you just... When he was interviewed by Merrin Rappaport on this question, he said, you simply cannot say that the Iraqi Jews were expelled. It's just not true. Wow, wow, it shattered with balls. Better ban them, dude. My favorite... My my favorite is like the guy who personally thinks like it's heroic to get banned on a Twitch stream. I'm not going to ban you and I'm not I didn't ban any of those other guys either, but it's so funny that you think that this is like a heroic posturing. You're engaging in a battle. You're engaging in a battle and like the battle of wits was won because your cowardly uh opposer took your freedoms away. It's like, dude, are you okay? Is this praxis, dude? Are you doing praxis? God damn. Is this how you guys operate when you feel like your your debate lord hero daddy is getting genuinely outmatched by people who are infinitely more knowledgeable than he is on a subject matter that he has a lot of reading to do on? Is that is that what's going on? So you just come in here and you just fucking try to derail? Please don't watch this. Listen to me instead. True. And he was speaking as an Iraqi Jew who left with his father and family in 1948. They were pushed so, out. They weren't expelled. Well, that, that's probably yeah. the right phrase. I, I, think it's, I think it's more complex than, than that. I think it was... Sorry, I interrupted no, you. No, you're not interrupting me because I don't. I, I only know what's been translated into English and the English literature on the subject is very small and not scholarly. Now, there may be a uh, Hebrew literature. I don't know. But I was surprised that even Shlomo Ben Ami, a stalwart of his state, fair enough, uh, on this particular point, he called it false symmetry. No, no, Stephen is right. There was a pull and the push <laughs> mechanism in the departure of the Jews from the Arab lands post-48. But there was also a lot of push. Uh, that's that's indisputable. Oh, there was well, that's and on the point of agreement, say. let us, on this one brief light of agreement, let us wrap up with this uh, topic of history and move on to modern day. But before that, I'm wondering if uh, we could just say a couple of last words on this topic, Stephen. Yeah, I think that when you look at the behaviors of both parties uh, in in the time period around 48, or especially 48 and earlier, um, there's this assumption that there was this huge built-in mechanism of Zionism and that it was going to be inevitable from the inception of the first Zionist thought, I, I guess, that appeared in Herzl's mind that there would be a mass violent population transfer of Arab Palestinians out of what would become the Israeli state. Uh, I yeah, I can't argue my position, so I'm just going to make up your position instead. Very cool. Thank you. I like that at least Benny Morris is like trying to present like a comprehensible thought instead of just spear-dicking points that the other person did not make. Yeah, dude, that's what Norm was arguing for. He was saying that, like, from the very moment, actually, Theodore Herzl was simply motivated by a, a mass expulsion of Arabs. Dude, it's so embarrassing. It's such a fucking... Why is it that dudes who talk about how important debate is oftentimes bastardize that very same thing that they're claiming they're engaging in? It's like all his, all of his, his, his personal, like everything he's done so far is basically either a, well, you guys made a good argument, but here's an argument that I think is really bad. Okay. Or B going into the subject matter and being like, well, guess what? Here's what I think you actually said. Here's what I'm claiming. You said in the most disingenuous way possible, you have a real opportunity here to just, you know, present your argument in a solid way. You don't have to resort to these like silly, silly tactics. I understand that there are some quotes that we can find that maybe seem to possibly support an idea that looks close to that. But I think when you actually consult the record of what happened, when you look at the populations, the massive populations that Israel was willing to accept uh, within what would become their state borders, their nation borders, uh, I just don't think that the historical record agrees with the idea that Zionists would have just never been okay living alongside Arab Palestinians. Uh, but when you look at the other side, Arabs would out of hand reject literally any deal that apportioned any amount of that land for
for any state relating to Jewish people or the Israeli people. I think it was said even on the other end of the table that uh, Arab Palestinians would have never accepted, the Arabs would have never accepted any Jewish state whatsoever. So it's interesting that on the ideology part, where it's claimed that Zionists are people of exclusion and supremacy and expulsion, uh, we can find that in diary entries, but we can find that expressed in very real terms on the Arab side, I think, in all of their behavior around 48 and earlier, where the goal was the destruction of the Israeli state. Um, it would have been the dispossession of many Jewish people. It probably would have been the expulsion of a lot of them back to Europe. And I think that very clearly plays out in the difference between the actions of the Arabs versus some diary entries of some Jewish leaders. Benny? Well, one thing which stood, stood out in the that's the most insane thing I've ever heard. Brother, 750,000 Palestinians were ethnically displaced at the inception of the Israeli state. What the fuck do you mean it was just a diary entry? This is such a fucking idiotic, like, what, what a stupid point. No, man, it's not just diary entries. What the fuck? This argument is so fucking brain dead. If someone walks into your house and says, this is mine now, but I'm willing to generally give you half of it. You'd be like, oh, no, fuck off. Imagine 80 years later, some YouTube asshole being like, I can't believe they didn't accept the generous offer to give them half. Yeah, the funniest part is it's not even just directly like some asshole comes into your fucking house and takes half of it. There is another much larger asshole that owns the house that you're renting and goes, yeah, guess what, dude? Half of this is now going to belong to this guy who I uh, brought in here, okay? And then they turn around and go, Actually, you know, uh, we're, we're bringing more people. His entire family's coming here. And uh, they're going to murder some of your family members. And also now half of the house is definitely permanently his. The, I think Moeen made this point, is that the Arabs had nothing to do with the Holocaust, but then the world community forced the Arabs to pay the price for the Holocaust. That's the traditional Arab argument. Um, this is slightly distorting the reality. The Arabs in the 1930s, did their utmost to prevent Jewish immigration from Europe and reaching Palestine, which was the only safe haven available because America, Britain, France, nobody wanted Jews anywhere and they were being persecuted in Central Europe and eventually would be massacred in large numbers. So the Arab effort to pressure the British to prevent Jews reaching Palestine's safe shores contributed indirectly to the slaughter of many Jews in Europe because they couldn't get anywhere and they couldn't get to Palestine. Wait a minute. Once again, another incredibly idiotic take from Betty Morris. Shocking. The last fraction of respect I have for him has diminished completely. Brother, by this same ver by this very same metric, don't you think as I'm covering D law with a child, I'm doing it because he is banned. Okay, I'm trying to do my very best to to maintain terms of service. Trust me, it is uh, stupid to do this. I, I understand. He is not the major he is not the focal point of this five hour video, so it's still allowed but i'm still also taking extra precautions okay the argument that he made is fucking so dumb because like then americans are infinitely more responsible the british are infinitely more responsible it is also kind of funny that i'm doing it but i'm sure because his fans can like come up with fabulous reasons for it the fuck like why what is this it is not and never has been the responsibility of the palestinian people that were defending their ancestral homeland to to sit back and and take a colonial power England forcibly uh moving settler colonialist populations into their fucking homes like that's crazy because the Arabs were busy attacking Jews in Palestine and attacking the British to make sure they didn't allow Jews to like do you think this is some fucking random Palestinian farmer was like oh man Jews are really getting uh fucked up over over there in Germany but we really shouldn't let them come here. It, like, do you think that was what was going on in the minds of the fucking Palestinian population? Americans did know that Jews were getting fucked up in Europe. British people did know that Jews were getting pogromed and, and, uh, and we're, in a, we're in a horrifying situation. And they voluntarily refused to admit them. The Palestinian population, by and large, didn't even, did not know that. And they still were made to be victims in this situation. Yeah, Benny straight up just said UK and US wouldn't allow Jews in, so of course we should force Arabs to give up their land instead, and yet it is the Arabs who are the bad guys here somehow. Blows my fucking mind. Oh reach the safe haven. That's important. The second thing is, of course, there's no point in belittling the fact that the Arab 
a Palestinian Arab national movement's leader, Husseini, um, worked for the Nazis in the 1940s. He got a salary from uh, the German foreign ministry. He raised troops uh, among Muslims in Bosnia for the SS, uh, and he broadcast to the Arab world calling for the murder of the Jews in the Middle East. This is what he did. And the Arabs uh, since then have been trying to whitewash uh, Husseini's role. Um, I'm not saying he was uh, the instigator of the Holocaust, but he did say he helped helped the Arab the uh, Germans along uh, in in doing what they were doing and and uh, supported. Them. Once again, very fucked up that who's bringing this up, considering that Palestinians died fighting Germany, Nazi Germany, like tens of thousands of Palestinians died fighting against Nazi Germany. You are. He didn't go the Benjamin Netanyahu route of like saying Hitler learned about hatred of the Jews from the Palestinian Mufti, which is direct Holocaust revisionism. But he got right there, right up until the point only to be like, well, you know, I wasn't I'm not saying that that was like a big reason. That's crazy, bro. Is he trying to say Palestinian resistance is partially a fall for Jews dying to European pogroms? Yes. No, he literally is saying that he directly is saying that. He's not even implying it. He's actually, he said that. He said those words. He said, well, England and America didn't want the Jews. So if Palestinians indirectly contributed to Jews dying in the Holocaust is what he said. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, uh, Itzhak uh, Shamir broke with the Irgun to form Stern Gang because he felt that the British were the bigger enemy and wanted to work with the Nazis. And Shamir ended up being Israel's prime minister in the 1980s. So you're, th there, is a, there are two different agreements about the Havara Agreement with uh with with nazi germany originally and also after that as well where there were obviously deviations from uh the zionist project that thought that nazi germany could potentially be a better ally more valuable ally now that is extreme and the reason why i don't pay any fucking emphasis or attention to that is because it's idiotic okay of course in this role reversal, Benny will do exactly that, but on the Arab side, because he has no additional facts to defend him. I have brought up uh, what you just mentioned, Chatter, before, only to talk about how irrelevant it is in the grand scheme of things, okay? them in doing that. So this can't be removed from the fact that the Arabs, um, as you say, paid a price for the Holocaust, but they also participated in various ways in helping it happen. Right. I'll make two points. Um, the first is, um, you mentioned Haj Amin al-Husseini and his uh, collaboration with the Nazis. Entirely legitimate point to raise. But I think one can also say definitively, had Haj Amin al-Husseini never existed, the Holocaust would have played out precisely um, as it did. Certainly. As far as um, Palestinian opposition to Jewish immigration to Palestine um, during the 1930s is concerned, it was of a different character than, for example, British and American um, rejection of uh, Jewish immigration. They just didn't want Jews on their soil. Yeah, objectively, it helped the Germans kill the Jews. In the Palestinian case, their opposition to Jewish immigration was to prevent the transformation of their homeland into a Jewish state that would dispossess them. And I think that's an important distinction to make. 100% great fucking take. America and other countries not taking Jewish refugees during the Holocaust 100% resulted in mass Jewish deaths, just to be fair. Yes, it did. But Benny here... It's almost making it more of a, the legal responsibility of the Palestinians rather than pure anti-Semitism from the American government and the, and the English government that fucking knew what was going on. Does that make sense? That's what's really fucked up about it. Imagine turning a ship back around full of Jewish refugees, knowing full well what the fuck is happening. That's crazy. That is what is incredibly fucked up about this argument. Because when you look at... <clears throat> When you look at the intent of certain actions, the Palestinian motivation here is to resist against settler colonialism. The American motivation to reject Jewish refugees from coming in to the United States is pure anti-Semitism with full-blown knowledge of what fucking Adolf Hitler is capable of doing and what he's doing. To make a parallel here as though these are two of the same, uh, uh, two of the same cases is insane. You are directly taking away responsibility from the much more responsible party, America and, and the UK, and shifting it over to the responsibility of the Palestinians, which had an entirely different motivation. Um, the other point I wanted to make is we've, we've spent the past several hours talking about the uh, uh, Zionism transfer and so on, but I think there's a more fundamental aspect to this, which is that um, Zionism, I think, would have emerged and there was a chatter in here earlier that made a really interesting point, actually, that I never really thought about. 
the Palestinian Jewish population um, before uh, before mass settlements was around four percent to seven percent, depending on what time frame we're looking at. No, it was the chatter's name is Layum. Okay, the American Jewish population percentage was not even two percent, and the American Jewish population was not even two percent. They had full knowledge of what's going on. Uh, with respect to, you know, Hitler's Germany, and yet they refused, like, thousands of Jews from entering the country as refugees. 7% of Palestinians before 1920 were Jewish. The U.S. today, which is considered a haven for Jews, is 2%. That tells you all you need to know about the arguments around the Palestinians deserving ethnic cleansing. Yeah. Husseini was an insignificant character appointed by the Brits. No one followed him in Palestine. Yeah. It is really, it is objectionable and, and ahistorical to give any fucking breathing room to the conversation surrounding Husseini. Colonial enterprise always demands one local person who is often the most corrupt to be put in positions of power so you can fucking dominate the, the subjects of your colonial occupation. That was a British op. It's, it's literally the same as... Um, it's the same as, like, looking at Latin American countries, right? that we played a role in uh, Latin American countries that we played a role in like destabilizing. Like it's like saying Pinochet and everything he did is a product of the nation state itself and the, and the population demanded it and not we put him into a power in a, into a position of power disappeared as yeah. It's it also look no further than the current Palestinian authority. If you want to understand how colonial entities operate, Look at the Palestinian Authority, the most, the second most unpopular organization in the eyes of the Palestinians after Israel. Okay, why? Because they are not actually interested in Palestinian emancipation and are simply there to behave like the Israeli security apparatus, but with a Palestinian face. That's it. Yet one more utopian political project. Had it not been for the British, um, what the preeminent Palestinian historian, Walid Khalidi, um, has termed the British shield. Because I think without the British sponsorship, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. Um, the British um, uh, sponsored Zionism for a very simple reason, which is that during... But it's on the Havara agreement does a really good job, in my opinion, to show, is showing to the layman immediately how Zionism can be very much friends with Nazism. It's not extreme in contrast and a very good thing to bring up. How is it irrelevant? It is irrelevant in the grand scheme of things because of what the fucking Nazis did to the Jews. It's ridiculous to fucking point to this as though it's like, uh, it, it is like an existing agreement that like two ethno-nationalist projects, one which directly forcibly uh, cleansed one ethnicity. I feel like the Holocaust is a little bit more significant than the fucking Havara agreement. That's why I don't bring it up. A better analog for the, the average person, the everyman, is someone like Viktor Orban, who is anti-Semitic, who Benjamin Netanyahu loves, okay? Fascists nowadays who are anti-Semitic in their domestic affairs and who will regularly utilize anti-Semitic arguments like literally the entirety of the Christian evangelical movement, uh, evangelical Zionists, are also uh, completely in favor of Israel being a Jewish ethnostate. Use a more modern example, in my opinion, if you want to make that argument, because it does. During World War I, uh, the Ottoman armies attempted to march on the Suez uh, Canal. Suez Canal was the jugular vein of uh, the British Empire, um, you know, between uh, Europe and India. And the British came to the conclusion that they needed to secure the Suez Canal from any threat. And as the British have done so often in so many places, how do you deal with this? Well, you know, you, you bring in a uh, foreign minority, implant them yep. amongst a hostile uh, yep. population and establish a protectorate over them. I don't think um, a Jewish state in Palestine had been part of British intentions. And the Balfour Declaration very specifically speaks about a Jewish national home in Palestine. In other words, a British protectorate. Um, things ended up taking a different course. Um, and I think the, the, the most important development was uh, World War II. And I think this had maybe less to do with the Holocaust and more to do with the effective bankruptcy of the United Kingdom uh, during that war and its inability to sustain um, its global uh, empire. It ended up giving up India, ended up giving up uh, Palestine. And it's in that context, I think, that we need to see um, uh, the emergence of a, uh, of a Jewish state in Palestine. And again, a Jewish state means a state in which the Jewish community enjoys um, not only a demographic majority, an uncontestable 
demographic majority, an uncontestable territorial uh, hegemony, and an uncontestable political supremacy. And that is also why after yep. 1948, the nascent Israeli state confiscated, I believe, up to 90% of uh, lands that had been previously owned um, by Palestinians who became citizens of Israel. It is why the new Israeli state imposed a military government on its population of Palestinian citizens between 1948 and 1966. Um, it is why the Israeli state effectively um, reduced uh, the Palestinians living within the Israeli state as citizens of the Israeli state to second class citizens, on the one hand, promoting Jewish nationalism and Jewish nationalist parties, on the other hand, doing everything within its power to suppress and eliminate Palestinian or Arab um, uh, nationalist movements. And that's why today there's a consensus among all major human rights organizations that Israel is an apartheid state with the Israeli human rights organization that Selim describes a regime of Jewish supremacy but, uh, between the river yes, and the sea. You're, you're really tempting a response yes. from the other side on, on the last few sentences. Again, we'll, talk, yeah, okay. we'll talk about the claims of, of apartheid and so on. It's a fascinating discussion. We need to have it. Uh -oh. uh, Norm. And the fuck you mean claims of apartheid, big dog? Come on, Lex. You literally interviewed Palestinians. You know it's, you know it's apartheid. Get out of here. It's like thinking that there is no apartheid between the unsubscribed and the subscribed at the top of the hour. There is one, okay? I had to get one off. I'm sorry. It's been a while since I got one today. You can elevate your status in the stream by subscribing. I'm just going to say, I'm not sorry. I lied. Question of the responsibility of the Palestinian Arabs for the Nazi Holocaust, direct or indirect. I consider that an absurd claim. Um, <laughs> it is. As Romico said, and I quoted him, the entire Western world turned its back on the Jews. To somehow focus on the Palestinians strikes me as completely ridiculous. Number two, as Moeen said, there's a perfectly understandable reason why Palestinian Arabs wouldn't want Jews, because in their minds, and not irrationally, these Jews intended to create a Jewish state, which would quite likely have resulted in their expulsion. I'm a very generous person. I've actually taken in a homeless person for two and a half years. But if I knew in advance that that homeless person was going to try to turn me out of my apartment, I would think 10,000 times before I took him in, okay? As far as the actual uh, complicity of the Palestinian Arabs, if you look at uh, Raoul Hilberg's three-volume classic work, The Destruction of the European Jury, he has in those thousand-plus pages one sentence, one sentence on the role of the Mufti of Jerusalem. And that, I think, is probably an overstatement, but we'll leave it aside. The only two points I would make, aside from the Holocaust point, is number one, I do think the transfer discussion is useful because it indicates that there was a rational reason behind the Arab resistance to Jewish or Zionist immigration to Palestine, the fear of territorial displacement and dispossession. And number two, there are two issues. One is the history, and the second is being responsible for your words. Now, some people accuse me of speaking very slowly. Dude, he's so fucking good, man. This debate is also another one of those demonstrations of that thing you say where it takes mountains of words to disprove a falsehood and only one sentence to completely demolish it. Accurately representing history, being an uphill battle is so sad. I fucking love Norm so much. Uh, like, on this issue, he is the GOAT. And they're advised on YouTube to turn up the speed twice to three times whenever I'm on. One of the reasons I speak slowly is because I attach value to every word I say. And it is discomforting, disorienting, where you have a person who's produced a voluminous corpus, rich in insights and rich in archival sources, who seems to disown each and every word that you pluck from that corpus by claiming that it's either out of context or it's cherry picking, words count. And I agree with Lex. Everybody has the right to rescind what they've said in the past. But what you cannot claim is that you didn't say what you said. I'll stick to the history, not the current propaganda. 1917, the British, the Zionist movement began way before the British supported the Zionist movement for decades. In 1917, the British jumped in and issued the Balfour Declaration supporting the emergence of a Jewish national home in Palestine, which most people understood to mean eventual Jewish statehood in Palestine. Most people understood that in Britain and in Israel, among the Zionists and among the Arabs. Um, but the British declared the Balfour Declaration or issued the Balfour Declaration not only because of imperial self-interest. And this is uh, what you're basically saying. They had the imperial interests, a buffer state which would protect the Suez Canal from the east. Uh, the British also were motivated. No, the British were also motivated by anti-Semitism. And he knows that too. Please, come on. Like Balfour was an anti-Semite. Bro, they literally were like, oh yeah, dude, fucking let's, let's send him to the desert. That's awesome. I don't want to live with no Jews in my country. Send them to the fucking desert. That's great. Straight up. It was such a perfect win-win.
I don't understand. He literally just the population knew it would mean an eventual Jewish state. So why would the Arabs not resist against that? Yeah. Well, he, he's trying to say, and doing a pretty bad job at this, to be fair. Um, he, he's trying to say that, like, they were only against it because of anti-Semitism. He, he won't say that because that would be ridiculous. But he's, like, leaning. He's implying. That's the difference between a guy like him and a charlatan like Destiny. Destiny will literally openly state, uh, state such a historical claims. But ultimately, Benny Morris is still a historian, so he has to, like, weasel around the argument. ...created by idealism. And this, incidentally, is how Balfour described the reasoning behind issuing the declaration. And he said the Western world, Western Christendom, owes the Jews a great debt, both for giving uh, the, the world and the West, if you like, uh, values, social values as... as hmm. Not a big enough debt to allow them to escape Nazi Germany, though. Hmm. Like, they, they, they basically... They basically were saying like, oh yeah, no, no, no. We owe them a big debt, which is why we want to ship their asses off into the fucking desert, okay? Into uh, one of our colonies at the time. Hmm. Dude is saying that the British people wanted to help the Jewish population and that's why he did it. What a joke. He wouldn't openly say that. He would basically just imply it. That's the difference. Because openly stating that would be stupid. Balfour wrote in 1919 his introduction to Nahum Sokolow's history of Zionism. The Zionist movement would mitigate the age-long miseries created for Western civilization by the presence in its midst of a body which it too long regarded as alien and even hostile, but which it was equally unable to expel or absorb. It's time to admit that Arthur Balfour was a white supremacist and an anti-Semite too. <laughs> yeah. Listen, guys. Let me tell you something. Okay. For a lot of these people, it was a win-win, okay? You give people that you don't want in your midst, in your, in your uh, vicinity, a colony that you settle them into. They suppress the local population with your help. No more Jews inside of England. They're all in Israel. It's win-win. Now you get to control the area with your settlers that are still connected to England in some shape. He just loved Jews so much they would distract him if they were close to him. Yeah. Yeah, he may be most known for aiding the Zionist cause in 1917. It's crucial to remember that Arthur Balfour was a white supremacist. He made that much clear in his own words. In 1906, the British House of Commons was engaged in a debate about the native blacks in South Africa. Nearly all the members of the parliament agreed that the disenfranchisement of the blacks was evil. Not so Balfour, who almost alone argued against it. We have to face the facts, Lord Balfour said. Men are not born equal. The white and black races are not born with equal capacities. They are born with different capacities, which education cannot and will not change. But Balfour's troubling views were not limited to Africa. In fact, despite his now iconic support for Zionism, iconic. <laughs> he was not exactly a friend of the Jews. In the late 19th century, pogroms targeting the Jews in the Pale of Settlement had led the waves of Jewish flight westward to England and the United States. This influx of refugees led to an increase in British anti-immigrant racism and outright anti-Semitism. Themes not unfamiliar to us today. Support for political action against immigrants grew as the English public demanded immigration control to keep certain immigrants, particularly Jews, out of the country. Just so you understand, okay? When Jews fled westward, they faced anti-Semitism. Historically, at least, that's why I was yelling at that chatter earlier, at least in the Ottoman Empire, when they fled to the Ottoman Empire, they were welcomed. It is so ridiculous, ahistorical, and gross to ascribe the vitriolic anti-Semitism of Western powers to, by and large, Muslim populations. That's part of the reason why everybody loves the Israel cause, especially Germans. One, because of the collective guilt of the Holocaust, which they should feel, by the way, the collective guilt of. And two, it's a perfect way to deflect away the responsibility because like, oh, dude, you know what's really bad, actually? Don't worry about the Holocaust. We that was really bad. Yeah, we're right. That that's you know that was really bad. But you know what's even worse? Arab Holocaust that is happening to the Jews right now. Yup, it is a way for the Western world to abdicate the responsibility of the pogroms that they engaged in. That's it. The public found a sympathetic ear in Balfour in 1905. Oh wait, hold on. Influx of refugees, particularly Jews. The public found a sympathetic ear in Balfour in 1905 while serving as Prime Minister Balfour presided over the passage of the Aliens Act. This legislation put the first restrictions on immigration in the Great Britain, and it was primarily aimed at restricting Jewish immigration. According to historians, Balfour had personally delivered passionate speeches about the imperative to restrict the wave of Jews fleeing the Russian Empire entering Britain. For the record, very different than 
Balfour and the British Empire sending Jews in on mass to a colony with the express purpose of settling and creating a settler colonial outpost. Refugees in the way that Jews were refugees under the Ottoman Empire were welcomed. They were not in England. Making this comparison is false. It is a historical falsehood. I remember a while ago you said the goal of anti-racism was not to make people feel guilty. That's useless. But to make them understand systems of oppression. Now you say Germans should feel guilty. Why? Oh, because it's the same as like white people uh, that should feel guilty about slavery because they deny it. Germans will talk about the Holocaust and act like they are uh, very sorry for it while simultaneously shifting the attention away in the way that I just described to you to the Arabs. Germans basically go, it's perfect. Israel is perfect for us. You know, united enemy and all. Ah, <sighs> so dumb. Y'all are dumb as fuck. Okay. Embodied in uh, the, the Bible, um, social justice and all sorts of other things. And the Christian world owes the Jews because it persecuted them for 2,000 years. This debt we're now beginning to repay with the 1917 declaration favoring Zionism. But it's also worth remembering that the Jews um, weren't proxies or attached to the British um, a, a imperial endeavor. They were happy to receive British support in 1917. And then subsequently, when the British ruled Palestine for uh, 20, 30 years, um, a, but they weren't part of the British imperial design or mission. They wanted a state for themselves, the Jews, happy to have the British support them, happy today to have the Americans support Israel. But it's not because we're stooges or extensions of American imperial interests. Um, the British, incidentally, are always described in Arab uh, narratives or propaganda as consistent supporters of Zionism. They weren't. The first British rulers in Palestine, 1917, 1920. Herbert Samuel. Were, no, oh. before Herbert Samuel. Samuel came in 1920. The British ruled there for three years previously. And most of the leaders, the British generals and so on, who were in Palestine were anti-Zionist. And subsequently, in the 20s and 30s, the British occasionally um, curbed Zionist immigration to Palestine. And in 1939, switched horses and supported the Arab national movement and not Zionism. They turned anti-Zionist and basically said, you Arabs will rule Palestine within the next 10 years. This is what we're giving you by limiting Jewish immigration to Palestine. Uh, uh, but the Arabs didn't actually understand what they were being given on a silver platter, Husseini again. And he said, no, no, we can't accept the British White Paper of May 1939, which had given the Arabs everything they wanted, basically, self-determination in an Arab majority state. So what I'm saying is the British uh, at some point uh, did support the Zionist uh, enterprise, but at other points were less consistent in the support. And in 1939, until 1948, when they didn't vote even for partition for Jewish statehood in Palestine uh, in the UN. Yeah, bro, the only time where they curbed immigration was literally because of fucking mass like mass upheaval the fuck that's crazy i can't believe the arabs didn't trust the british after the british empire originally told the arab population to basically fucking uh cut it with this like ottoman support and move on uh, move in their direction in the same way that british and french uh powers did during uh world war one against the ottoman empire and then basically the british for the palestinians were like yeah just kidding we're not going to do anything about that here are um, a uh, here are a bunch of people that were shipping over there, with the express purpose of of doing settler colonialism. Just saying. In resolution, they didn't support Zionism during the last decade of the mandate. It's worth remembering that. I'd like to respond to that. I mean, speaking of propaganda, um, I find it simply impossible to accept um, that Balfour, who, as British Prime Minister in 1905, was a chief sponsor of the Aliens Act, which was specifically uh -huh. his mind. which was specifically designed. To, to keep, keep persecuted Eastern European Jews out of the streets of, of the UK, mind. and who was denounced as an anti Semite by the entire British Jewish establishment. A decade later, all of a sudden, changed his mind. This, people change their minds, but when, the, when, when. <laughs> Bro said he did a growth. Yeah, he did a growth, man. He changed his mind. It's so crazy because he just very openly said, win win, boys. I mean, we get the Jews out of here and we ship them off to a colony. Hmm. Naruto convinces him to be a good guy. <laughs> yeah. When the changing of the mind just coincidentally happens to coincide um, with the British imperial interest, I think perhaps the transformation is, is, is a little more superficial than he's being given credit for. It, it was clearly a British imperial venture. And if there had been no threat to the Suez Canal during World War I, regardless of what Balfour would have thought about the Jews and their contribution to um, history and their, per and their persecution and so on, there would have been no Balfour there. Can I ask a real quick question on that? Why did the British ever cap immigration then from Jews to that area at all? Well, we're talking now about... 20, 19, 30, 30, 30, sure, I, but I'm saying that if it was, if no, the whole goal was just to be an imperialist project, like there were terrorist attacks from Jewish... Uh, from, yes, but you're, you're talking... You're ta I'll answer yeah, you. Yeah, in the 40s, yeah. And we're talking now about 1917, and, and as I mentioned earlier... By the way, you might think he's asking this question to like arrive at a larger point, 
But no, he just doesn't know anything. So <laughs> he's like, wait, so why did they do that? He just actually wants to know. Here, <laughs> I don't think the British had a Jewish state in mind. That's why they used the term Jewish national home. I think what they wanted was a British protectorate, loyal to and dependent upon uh, the British. I think an outstanding um, review of British policy towards these issues during the mandate has been done by Martin Bunton of the University of Victoria. And, and he basically makes the argument um, that once the British realized the mess they were in, certainly by the late 20s, early 30s, they, they recognized these the mess they were in, the irreconcilable differences, and basically pursued a policy of just muddling on. Um, and, and, um, and muddling on in the context of British rule in Palestine, um, whose overall purpose was to serve um, for the development of, of Zionist institutions, uh, Yeshua's economy, and so on, meant, even if the British uh, were not self-consciously doing this, um, preparing the groundwork for the eventual establishment of a Jewish state. I don't know if that answers your question. Except they did turn anti-Zionist in 1939. Yes, yes, of course. And because maintained course, they were that, that Zionist. Yeah. No, no, but... Wait, I was just kidding. I thought he did actually set it up as a gotcha. It turns out he just shut the fuck up. So I guess, <laughs> wait, was it not a gotcha? Okay, maybe he literally was like actually trying to learn? Uh, what? I thought he was going to have a follow-up, dude. What the fuck? Before yeah. they were being shut up, but maintained that anti-Zionist posture until 1948. Okay. Uh, and, and if I may, just also one point. Um, you mentioned Hajamin al Husseini during a world entirely legitimate. Um, but, what I, but what I would also point, point out is that you had a Zionist organization, um, the Lehi. 300 people. More. 300 people, one of whom happened to become an Israeli prime minister, an Israeli foreign minister, speaker of Israeli parliament. Um, Maybe you should give his name. Yitzhak Shamir, uh, proposing an alliance with Nazi Germany in 1941. Shamir proposed Shamir. Well, no, the Lehi proposed. Some people in the Lehi proposed. Of which Shamir yeah, was a prominent this is leader. A red herring, no, no, okay, well, if he's a red herring, uh, uh, the Lehi was a red whale. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's right. Yeah, you can't fucking bring up. You can't fuck. Oh, God. I feel so goddamn confident. I'm not gonna lie, it's crazy. These motherfuckers are the most knowledgeable people on the planet on this issue. It feels good to to be able to, to, to get vindicated by some of the most knowledgeable people on this issue. Yeah, I'm gonna do a little bit of self-glazing, okay? Suck my dick. You're, we're talking about, I'm a fucking idiot online who's a fucking Twitch streamer. I mean, if I can make these arguments before they make those arguments, I'm sorry. It's it's kind of valid in my opinion. Yeah, I'm self-sucking. Whatever. I don't give a shit. This is the one area where I feel like you know it, it's it's worthy. Don't die from the self-suck. Let me self-suck. It was an unimportant organization in the Yishuv. 300 people versus 30,000 belonged to the Haganah. So it was not a very important organization. It's true, before the Holocaust actually began, they wanted allies against the British where they could We're find them. We're talking 1941 here, not 1940. 41 from what I recall. 1940. They, were, they approached the, 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 the German Br emissary in, in Istanbul or something. Yes. Istanbul. And, and, they, and if I may, proposed an alliance with Nazi Germany on what the Leahy described as uh, on the basis of shared, ideologi shared were, ideological shared no, ideological principles. Share ideological. Well, they said they did. No, they, 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 they reviled. Why are you doing the, these things? Of course the they said reviled the but the you know the state, but you know what the statement said on the basis of a shared ideology. He's, <laughs> they're cooking them. I, look, 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 look. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, I don't use the Havara agreement as a counter because I think it's a fucking red herring. I told you, but if you use the Mufti, then you can fucking, then it's the same exact principle. Utilizing the Mufti as a, as an indication of like the broader Palestinian project as though like ideologically some fucking dumbass Mufti that the British empire put in position of power, in a position of power as they always do is somehow reflective of the vows of the Palestinians uh, and, and is like motivated by anti-Semitism is no different than saying that like Jews were motivated by Nazi principles. It's ridiculous. How come D isn't helping his boy out? Dude, he is so out of his goddamn element. It is not even fucking funny. He is learning new words, trying to fucking scroll on his iPad to like look at the corresponding Wikipedia page. He doesn't have his chat of little Hasbro trolls who are autistically fucking feeding him talking points about uh, about how, like, this is what you should say in this circumstance, okay? He doesn't have any of that shit. He is outclassed, outmatched. You can fucking scan Wikipedia pages for as long as you can. You got, like, eight fucking talking points. You're cooked. No factorio, no nothing. Bro, sitting there like a fucking iPad kid. Goddamn. Of course, what is he gonna do? What, 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 how is he gonna fucking chime in, dude? He's gonna get destroyed every time he does. This is very different than, like, trying to fucking bully... 
uh, a, a subject matter expert that you brought into the fray. This is very different than like bullying people that aren't orators, skillful orators. That's why it reads every time Destiny has had like debates of this sort, whether it be Richard Wolf, whether it be uh, Michael Brooks, whether it be like a knowledgeable person on the issue that he's talking about, it always turns into a, a like a one on one educational seminar. And basically, yeah, it turns into a one person lecture. And, and then his fans will basically use it. Like it happened with Mark Lamont Hill, apparently. I didn't even know that one. Where people will then turn around and be like, see, he's so open minded. He's like listening. He's sitting his white ass down and he's listening. And it's like, no, it's just because he couldn't fucking debate them in the same indecent ways that he can try and debate others. That's it. It is still wholly inconsistent with his, uh, with his overarching framework. It's just that, I mean, the Ben Shapiro conversation, I would say, the Ben Shapiro conversation, I would say, is the greatest example because, like, Ben Shapiro is not knowledgeable on the issues that he speaks on, just, like, in the same exact ways that Destiny isn't, Okay. The difference, however, is that Ben Shapiro has more experience in being a skilled orator than Destiny does. So he fucking whooped his ass in that conversation, and he turned, uh, turned docile like he always does whenever he's outclassed by his opponent. And then his fucking entire fan base turns into cope mode and goes, well, it's because he was being nice because he's not supposed to be fucking aggro every time he talks to people. No, he's only got that smoke for some, like, random trans person on Twitter, okay? That he's, like, ripping to fucking shreds. He doesn't have that smoke for Ben Shapiro because Ben Shapiro's better than him at the same fucking thing he's trying to do. Not knowledgeable, neither is Destiny, but at least he's fucking better at him uh, in rhetoric because he has a lot more runtime in this space that's it and before all you little boys cope okay before all you little boys cope Hassan debates against videos where no one can reply to him well i've debated a shit ton of people i've debated people on television i debate people all the fucking time okay you have made this up in your hug box that i do not debate i debate people all the time i just think that there are people who are valuable to debate people with big audiences, people who have actual genuine societal harm. I don't debate for the purpose of debating because debating is not my primary content, okay? Your content is just reacting, lol. I know. I'm very smart, XD. Dude, I can tell I'm not a debate lord. I'm not. Um, I can tell when someone comes in here from a very particular community because like, they immediately demonstrate that they don't watch and they're just repeating talking points. Even if the said talking points that they're repeating objectively are, are inconsistent with the reality on the street. It's so funny. Let's continue. Why do you say no? Do you think you the lefties like the people saying, were Nazis? Is that what you're saying? saying, saying, saying that. Said. No, you're saying that. Forget okay. statements. You okay. like to quote things. But were, like they, quote were they things Nazis? Quote where, are the, where are the lefty Nazis? That's what I'm asking. What did he Some just say? Did he say that the basis of the pact was their agreement on ideology? There wasn't any pact. They suggested. I they said, proposed wasn't an agreement. It, right. And what did the agreement say? They wanted arms against the British. That's what, what they wanted. The yeah, well, that's what Hajime Rafasidi wanted also. That's what no, no, but others they, they in India. The Lehi people didn't work in Berlin uh, helping the Nazi regime. I mean, what, what the IRA wanted also. No, but this is what Hajime I mean, Hussaini did. You know that he was an anti-Semite. You, you've probably read some of his works. Yeah. It wasn't just anti-British, yes. and, and, he was also anti-Semitic. And, and the, so they had a common ground with Hitler. I, I, think, I think we can agree. Not every anti-Semite is a Hitlerite. I think we can, that part, he literally he worked with the Nazis to recruit say. people. He wasn't just yes. a guy posting... And he was an absolutely revolting, <laughs> disgusting human being. This I'm happy I have no... But the if problem you is, think, you're saying, you're saying, was Hitler, you're saying the Mufti but the, was... I, I don't even understand, of all the crimes you want to ascribe to the Palestinian people, trying to blame them directly... In also, to be honest, there's not much for Destiny to respond to. It'll only be the just exact same thing he said on the video, plus some accusation that you participated in sex trafficking or something. Yeah, yeah, he'll, he'll be like, remember when he did bro tips 10 years ago when I was screaming the N-word all the time? And still say the N-word now, but uh, that's besides the point. He'll say, remember bro tips? That really triggers him. It doesn't. Something that I talk about personally. Uh, then he'll fucking... Then he'll be like, uh, then he'll be like, oh yeah, dude, Hassan does like sex trafficking or whatever the fuck, like something insane. You're making up imaginary arguments. Every single argument that I just brought up is not imaginary, but an argument that he has made, which is not even a fucking argument. And you do fair criticism, Keck W. Um, there are moments where I'm being pretty charitable and pretty fair to Destiny, but I think like that that ship has has 
you know, that boat has sailed. We're long past that point. But right now, <clears throat> even now, when you think about it, I have said that he is a skillful orator, okay? He's devoid of, like, actual historical knowledge, but he's a skillful orator. That's why he's there. He's there to, you know, add to the fun of it all. Also, I guess, you know, I'd never flew to like Australia or New Zealand to fuck a fan's girlfriend only to marry him, only to divorce him after leaving my family behind. So there is that too. You know, there is a lot. It's a target rich environment. Anything that he can say about me usually made up more often than not made up by his community repeated until it's like seen as the truth, even though it isn't like, Oh, his dad is an oligarch or some shit. Not true. <sighs> Indirectly, indirectly, or indirectly, three times removed for the Nazi Holocaust is completely lunatic. Hold on. Wait, there's not a. He's not blaming them for the Holocaust. <laughs> yes, he's saying that from the perspective. No, no, no. Wait, 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 no. He's saying that from the perspective of Jews in the region, Palestinians That's would have been part of the region. That is exactly you have not read him. what he said. I've read him. You, you can't read, even understand you've him. Read, he's read, he's right here. Believe me, I'm a lot more literate than you, Mr. Barelli. I don't believe the guy that wrote this stuff. You read the Wikipedia. Said, That's great. I read Hebrew. You call yourself a. Wait, what? What is happening right now? He found something that he can like aesthetically glam on, grab he, onto. What, what the IRA wanted also. No, but this is what Hajjamin Husseini did. You know that he was an anti-Semite. You, you've probably read some of his works. Yeah, it wasn't just anti-British. Yes. And, and he was also anti-Semitic. And and the, so they had a common ground with Hitler. I, I think I that. think we can agree. Not every anti-Semite is a Hitlerite. I think I we could... that part. He literally he worked with the to Nazis say. to recruit people. He wasn't just yes. a guy posting. And he was an absolutely revolting, <laughs> disgusting human being. This I'm happy I to have hear. no. But the if problem you is, you're, think, wait, you're saying that Hussein was his influence. That. You're saying the Mufti but the, was. I, I don't even understand of all the crimes he wanted to ascribe to the Palestinian people, trying to blame them directly, indirectly, indirectly, or indirectly, three times removed for the Nazi Holocaust is completely lunatic. Hold on, the way there's not a, he's not blaming them for the Holocaust. <laughs> yes, he's saying course, that from the perspective, no, no, no. Wait, 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 no, he's saying that from no. the perspective of Jews in the region, Palestinians That's would have been part of the region. That is exactly you have not what, read him. what he said. I've read him. You, you read him. Read, don't understand him. Read, he's sitting right here. Believe me, <laughs> I'm a lot more literate than you, Mr. Borelli. I'm going to believe the guy that wrote <laughs> the stuff. You read Wikipedia said. That's great. I read and you don't even speak Hebrew and you call yourself a, an Israeli historian. We're all here on different grounds. I just want, if I can just respond to you. No, 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 I'm just saying that the there, there were two, there were two tricks. There were, that's fine. There were two tricks that are being played here that I think. Wait, I don't get it. He's saying that like Norm is not reading in Hebrew and he calls himself an Israeli historian. Bitch, what are you? You literally don't know anything. <laughs> what the fuck? That's so funny. Like how? That's such a funny fucking argument to make against a literal scholar on the subject matter. God, Benny, you're fucking so slimy. Look at him loving this moment. He's like, finally. <laughs> uh, Destiny practice that Hebrew line on stream. Yeah. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. What is this? How come D isn't helping his boy out? Dude, he is so out of his goddamn element. It is not even fucking funny. He is learning new words, trying to fucking scroll on his iPad to like look at the corresponding Wikipedia page. He doesn't have his chat of little Hasbro trolls who are autistically fucking feeding him talking point. Yeah, it's pretty funny. It's pretty funny to be like, oh, you don't speak Hebrew, so you can't actually fucking uh, be a historian of a specific subject matter. Like, you don't read Hebrew, so you can't do this. It's pretty funny from the Wikipedia scholar, okay? Um, but not only that, but then, like, there are a shit ton of historians that are literally not allowed to be historians now by the same metric. Yeah, Chomsky reads Hebrew. Would D accept his analysis? Probably not. He's a tanky. <laughs> anyway. I think it's interesting. One is, you guys claim that the Leahy was trying to forge an alliance with Nazi Germany That's because of a shared it. ideology. That's what they said. Yeah, but hold That's on. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Said. No, no. It's about what you said. You brought that up to imply that Zionism I'm must be inexorably linked no. No, to... I'm, no, I'm you're sorry. Not, wait, no, you're putting... no, they brought it up to say... It's a red herring in the same way that the fucking Palestinian Mufti is a red herring. That's it. And they openly said that as well. But because Destiny cannot actually fucking argue against the actual argument presented, he has to argue against things that they're not saying. This is like 90% of debate lord, debate lordism in general. This is how the debate lords operate. It's like, well, sorry, I can't contend with what you just told me. You made a logical argument. 
So now I'm going to act like you didn't say, uh, act like you said something you didn't actually say at all so that I can win the argument. Putting words in my mouth. No, no, no. Okay, wait. Well, then what was the purpose of, sh of saying that the Lehi claimed that they, the Lehi who were the uh, a small group of people that were reviled by many in Israel. In or not many, by everybody but, yeah. practically. Well, they were called terrorists. Well, so yeah. reviled. The Zionist movement called them terrorists. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So and, the and hunted Shemir, them. The, and and Shemir, hunted them. And Shamir called himself a terrorist. They were so irrelevant that their leader ended up being kicked upstairs to the leader of the Israeli parliament. That's Israeli parliament. To the Israeli, years to Israeli foreign minister. And Begin was and also... He's literally saying that the Leahy movement is more relevant ideologically and more successful ideologically than a fucking British-backed Palestinian mufti. Okay? That's why if one is a red herring, which it is, the other one is a red whale. That was the argument that he presented. That was the argument that Rabani presented. He said, if you consider, if you consider the Havara agreement and the Leahy movement, the, the terror cell Stern gang, to be a red herring, which I think it is, by the way. I do think it is. Okay? If you consider them to be a red herring, then the Palestinian mufti that the fucking British put into a position of power is a red whale. The point there is that Stern gang has more historic significance in the inception of the Israeli state, which they do, right, than some random fucking dumbfuck Palestinian mufti when tens of thousands of Palestinians actually fucking died fighting against Nazis. Okay? Ridiculous. So, uh, yes. In you want to you would... characterize him as irrelevant as well? Go no, ahead. No, no. characterize him as relevant or irrelevant based on what happens decades later. The timeline matters. Well, the question is, what is the point of saying that the Leahy tried to forge an alliance? Why? Why is Wait, what? The timeline matters. Okay, what happened to the timeline of the fucking Mufti? Nothing. Because he was irrelevant. What happened to the timeline to members of the fucking Leahy Stern gang, a group of terrorists? Oh, they got elevated into positions of power. So I guess it's not that irrelevant. This is why not only is this not a good argument to make, the Mufti is not a good argument to make, but it's actually a very bad argument to make because the Havara agreement is significantly more, the Havara agreement is more significant than the Mufti meeting with fucking Adolf Hitler, okay? Because the Mufti is not a political entity that represented the interests of the Palestinians at all, especially not in the same way that, like, you can make an argument that Stern Gang did. It's pretty funny because, like, those guys also then were, like, pro-USSR, but that's a different point. Is, why is why is relevant is bringing up the mufti of jerusalem and trying to blame the holocaust no, 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 the, no, no, no. The, mufti, the mufti was the leader of the palestine yeah. arab national and movement he the much, was 300 and he people. had as much to do with the nazi holocaust as i did no he bro 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 oh he's the leader of the fucking movement okay yeah the lehi were just 300 people okay well <laughs> some of those guys did become leaders in israel so recruited people for okay. the ss how can you get away from that no he recruited people soldiers. for the ss he recruited soldiers in the balkans mostly kosovars which was disgusting i have no doubt about that but he had he one wrote letters he, to got, foreign ministers he got one saying senator. don't let the jews out i knew the, can, can i say can i say the, can the, I say the, I knew, oh my god oh my god oh my god the palestinian mufti was the british appointed mufti okay he was not adopted by the broader Palestinians. He is literally irrelevant. The le he is infinitely more irrelevant than Stern Gang is. That's it. When losing, talk over. It is so frustrating. It is so frustrating to like keep relitigating this. Yeah. What? Why do you have to constantly dismiss Dee's knowledge by saying it's all Wikipedia when he spent thousands of hours learning about historical events and reading UN resolutions? Why not just engage if instead the content? Constant poisoning of the well. <laughs> Dude, I love you guys, man. Hey, you're fucking, you're goaded, okay? You are, some of you guys are really sick. Like, actually. <laughs> He's read thousands of hours. Oh, that's awesome. It's not showing in this conversation if he did. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he needs to retain information better then. Goddamn. Raul, Raul, Foreign no, Minister okay. received letters from Husseini during one during sentence, the Holocaust. One sentence, during the Holocaust, the don't the let the Jews, Jews out. This one was similar horror memes. Why are you making it up in your mind that he doesn't know anything? He spent months and months researching the topic while you spent your time reading tweets, you disingenuous fuck. 
Yeah. The notion that I get all my information from Twitter is such a funny bar from Destiny that his community repeats all the fucking time. Because when I'm reading shit on Twitter, it is literally from journalists that I then have on stream that are in the process of breaking their story. Okay? Like, I'm sourcing information on Twitter from the very same journalist that I then also interview on stream. I'm going to the actual source. It is infinitely, infinitely more productive than reading fucking Wikipedia pages after you made up your mind about how Israel is not doing a genocide, nor is it an apartheid state. He came to that conclusion on a whim. And then he fucking stood by that position and has been looking for post hoc rationalizations ever since. Don't let the Jews if out. I, I'm not saying he was a major... Yeah, like the time you accused Israel of bombing the hospital based on Twitter threads? You, you're joking, right? Because when I accuse Israel of bombing the hospital, which it has bombed like every hospital since then, and had bombed that exact hospital two days prior, that was not from Twitter threads, you fucking idiot. That was from the BBC. Not only that, but I also went on the BBC broadcast, BBC World, and openly told the host that they should have never apologized for making the assertion that Israel had bombed the hospital. You would know that if you actually were a fan or if you actually watched my coverage and didn't just watch one fucking dumbass who doesn't know where Israel is on a goddamn map who just made a drama video about it because he thought he could, you know, get some clicks out of it, which he did. Because some of you are very easy to dupe. It sucks. I want you to be smarter, but... Unfortunately, you're too stupid. You got duped, chatter. It's okay. Can you stop making every fucking thing about yourself and just focus on the video? I'm gonna fucking lose my goddamn mind. Hey, dumb fuck. I'm not making this about myself. There are people in here that are desperately trying to do that. Hey, dumb fuck. They bombed every hospital. Hasn't happened. What kind of point is that D forgot where Al Shifa was the week after it got bombed? Yeah. Oh. It wasn't even minor. minor. But if One we're agreed, sentence. if we're agreed yeah. that Hajj Amin al husseini the Mufti of Jerusalem, collaborated with the Nazis yeah. during World War II and actively sought their sponsorship, why is it irrelevant? And probably wanted the destruction of European Jewry. He probably wanted a lot of things. Okay. Okay. If that's relevant, why is it irrelevant? that a prime minister of Israel... Not prime minister. In 1941, he wasn't prime minister of Israel. He I'm was a leader to... of a very small terrorist group. So do you consider... It, as terrorists do, you by consider the of do you consider it irrelevant that many years ago... My... Loki, you negatively polarized Dean to being a Zionist, so I'm blaming you for this one. I don't give a fuck. He has a shit ton of awful positions that align with Zionism before Zionism anyway. Mahmoud Abbas wrote a doctoral thesis, which is basically it tantamount. about Mahmoud Abbas, okay, but, but I don't, but didn't bring it up. You're the one who's bringing yes, it up. But, but you, you consider that belittling relevant. the Holocaust. That's what you're saying. The president, pre president of the Palestinian National Authority, belittled the Holocaust. I think, said it didn't I think happen, or only a few Jews. I died. think that's a fair characterization of. But I didn't Mahmoud bring it up. I, I brought it up. Yeah. Okay. Because my question is, then why is Shamir's antecedents irrelevant? He, he was a terrorist leader of a very small marginal group. Who became? Hussaini Israel... Hussaini was the head of the movement at the time. Also, the, the point so of bringing up no no the point of bringing up stuff wasn't to say that he was a great further of the Holocaust. It's that he might have been a great further in the prevention of Jews fleeing to go to Palestine to escape the yes, Holocaust. But the point that, was the, that was the point. That, and I explained why I think um, that's that's not an entirely um, accurate characterization. But and then I wanted to make another point. If it's legitimate to bring up, oh my God, this argument is so stupid. Oh, please, yes, he's finally wrapping it up. His role during World War II. Why is it illegitimate to bring up? a man who would become Israel's Speaker of Parliament, Foreign years, Minister. Yes, and yes why is it? And, and also, he was, young and was also responsible for the murder of- <laughs> He's a small being young terrorist. Come on, man. Come on, man. He's a young, he's just a small bean terrorist when he fucking wanted to like align with the Nazi government. It doesn't matter. Stop trying to defend him. I do feel like these guys are spending too much time on the Mufti too. Just fucking be like, I only brought it up because you brought up the Mufti. And, and obviously, like, it is idiotic and irrelevant to the argument. If you bring up the Mufti, then the Havara agreement is fair play, considering that the people who played a role in that ended up getting higher positions in the Israeli government later down the line, despite the fact that they... I feel like, actually, I just realized many people probably don't know some of these facts, so they're just probably thinking, like, they're going back and forth on some irrelevant shit. And I do think, ultimately, it is irrelevant in the grand scheme of things because it is a red herring upon a red herring. Um, however, however, uh, Benny Morris talking about the Mufti is a historical, which is why I got so butthurt about it personally because I thought he was above that. I was wrong. Um, 
It's like uh, the the classic. Uh, he didn't go as far as Benjamin Netanyahu did, but as far as the Havara Agreement goes, um, the the one of the earlier Zionist brigades comprised of three hundred people that participated in the King David Hotel bombing, which killed a bunch of civilians. But it was also half military, utilized by the British government at the time. Um, they were they participated in atrocities during the Nakba, like really gruesome shit. You know, throwing babies in ovens. Remember, they did that. They actually did that, unlike what uh, the Israeli authorities claimed happened on October 7. They actually did do that in Deir Yassin. Um, and, uh, uh, and there is firsthand, like, there's testimony of people who survived the attacks. Is that that asshole that came on your stream was supposed to be like a leftist political? What the fuck are you talking about? I've never had an asshole from Israel on my stream. I've only had phenomenal people from Israel on my stream. What? Guys, please remember what we learned from Starbilly Sneetches. Just because Finkelstein has diplomas does not mean he knows more. Wikipedia is the people's encyclopedia, if you think about it. Don't fall for Finkel's elitism, which is classes because he only takes people with diplomas seriously. And some people don't grow up rich. Demonizing Wikipedia is classes, so please don't fall for Finkelstein's elitism. People with diplomas act like they are Sneetches with stars. Okay, Lake, you can't ban someone that just came up with an incredible fucking new copy pasta. Bro is really acting like books are not available at the library, and the only way that you can get uh, information is from like Wikipedia summarizations. After you made a a you made your position known and are engaging in post hoc rationalizations exclusively for spirited debate that your audience will eat up. Guys, you can't. It's too long for a copy pasta. You're all gonna get fucking banned by Fossabot. Stop posting it. The copy pasta is too long. Fossabot is clapping you like it did him. For the record, like, I don't think Wikipedia is bad either. Make no mistake, okay? Wikipedia, however, can sometimes lead you astray. I don't know what Sneetches, star-bellied Sneetches is, because I didn't read the Wikipedia for it. Wikipedia is the people's encyclopedia, don't be classist. I'm not even anti-Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the most communist fucking institution out there, okay? <sighs> Dr. Snooze? Seuss? Dr. Seuss? Dr. Snooze? Of, of the United Nations' first international envoy, Bernadotte, Foki Bernadotte. Why is all that irrelevant? I don't, I, I don't understand. Was, I think that the, the, the reason why he was brought up was because Jewish people at the, in this time period would have viewed it as um, there was a prevention of Jews leaving Europe because of the Palestinians pressuring the British to put a curb at 75,000. Uh, yeah. Okay, this argument is so fucking stupid because Americans are infinitely more responsible for the death and destruction of Jews in that regard, which they are, by the way. So what the fuck are we talking about? Like, this is so stupid. It was a stupid argument that any boy made okay it was a dumb argument Prevention limit, yes but it's not about like it's not about them furthering the holocaust or being an architect major minor play in the holocaust well, actually, it was a major play in that region so actually, actually, up, like, morris was specific made the specific claim that the palestinians played an indirect role in the holocaust the indirect role would have been the prevention of people escaping from yes Europe and, and my response to that is um uh, first of all i i disagree with that characterization but second of all How can you disagree with that they prevented, they forced the British to prevent emigration of Jews well, from Europe and reaching safe shores in Palestine. Well, again, That's what they did. Again, was and they knew that the was Jews Palestine, were being persecuted in Europe. Was Palestine the, the only spot of land basically, on earth? Yes, basically that was what, the problem. The Jews couldn't emigrate What about, what about the, your great friends in Britain, the architects of, of the Balfour Declaration? By the late 1930s, they weren't, the United weren't States. happy to take in Jews and Americans. And, 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 why, Jews. and why are Palestinians, who are not Europeans, who had zero role in the rise of Nazism, who had no relation to any of this, why are they somehow uniquely responsible for what were, happened in they, Europe, they and you didn't close the only safe haven for Jews. Oh, really? All. The United States wasn't a, safe, a potential state, safe haven. The only one was Palestine. The, the United States had no room. No, from it did the have room. It did have room. Jews. It did have room, but it didn't so want that Jews. wasn't the but only safe Jews. haven. This is but something you be focusing your America your should be blamed for not letting Jews in during the thirties. They are and 40s. blamed, but nobody blames them for the Holocaust. Well, indirectly. Okay, indirectly. No, I've never heard it said that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was indirectly responsible for the Holocaust. I never heard that. Now, maybe it's in Israeli literature because the Israelis have gone mad. Your, yes, your prime minister said the whole idea of the gas chambers came from the Mufti of Jerusalem. That's so, nonsense. Yeah, that, we all know that's it, nonsense. But we also know that yeah, Netanyahu, Netanyahu said it. Netanyahu says, Netanyahu says so many things which are And he happens to be the prime minister's longest serving prime minister of Israel. No, I can't be responsible for them. You're not responsible for them, but it is relevant that he's the longest serving prime minister of Israel. Unfortunately, and, it's and that, about the Israeli public. Yes, and he gets, and he gets elected, not despite saying such things, I, but because he says such things. His voters don't care about Hajim al Husseini or Hitler. They know nothing about his voters. His base know nothing about nothing about anything and he can say what he likes and they'll say yes so they don't care if he says these things you may well be right but, but, but anyway not to beat a dead horse but i don't i, I still don't Let's understand not beat a dead horse. Yeah. You're right. I, i'll just conclude by saying i don't understand why the mufti of jerusalem is relevant he is relevant he is relevant but the head of the national the palestinian is not, no. <laughs> wasn't... he said he's relevant because i said so but 
but uh, other people that you're bringing up are irrelevant because I also said so. The head of the national movement, he represented 100 or 200 or 300 gunmen who were considered terrorists by the Zionist movement at the time. The fact that 30 years later he becomes prime minister, that's the crux of, of and, history. And his, but, and his but, history. But Khatamino uh, Hussein, he was the head of the Palestine Arab national movement at the time. Anyway, what I, can you do? I think we're speaking past each other. We're not. So I'm, I'm talking facts. Let's move to the modern day and we'll return to history, maybe 67 and other important moments. But let's look to today in the recent months, uh, October 7th. Let me ask sort of a pointed question. Was October 7th attacks by Hamas on Israel genocidal? Was it, was it an act of ethnic cleansing? Just so we lay out the moral calculus that we are engaged in. I don't, maybe it was... The, the, problem, sure. the problem with October 7th is this. The Hamas fighters who, who um, invaded southern Israel um, were sent, ordered to murder, rape, and do all the nasty things that they did. And they killed some 1,200 Israelis that day and uh, abducted them. As we know, something like 250 um, uh, civilians, mostly civilians, also some soldiers, um, took them back to Gaza, dungeons in Gaza. Um, but they were motivated, <laughs> not just by the words of their current leader. The dungeons in Gaza, bro, Jesus Christ. Yeah, back to their layers. <laughs> in the Gaza Strip, but by their ideology, which is embedded in their charter from 8, 1988, if I remember correctly. And that charter is genocidal. It says that the Jews Bro. must be eradicated, basically, from... Um, the oh, Latin God, he's so... Oh, he's so bad. It's it just like every every Zionist talking point basically devolves into, like, like the absolute dumbest person you've ever heard. It's just like, oh, yeah, the 1988 charter. They were operating on pure anti-Semitic vitriol. They're doing a genocide. Like, they were trying to do genocide. Holy moly. Dude, you're a historian. The fuck? Yeah, the charter did change in 2017. Not that it fucking matters, okay? You're just basically... You're, you're, you're basically picking and choosing. ...land of Israel from Palestine. Uh, the Jews are described there as sons of apes and pigs. Uh, the Jews are a base people, uh, killers of prophets, and they should not exist in Palestine. It doesn't say that they necessarily should be murdered all around the world, the Hamas Charter, but certainly the Jews should be eliminated from Palestine. And this is the driving... Yeah, the killing of 30,000 Gazans is not genocide, but October 7 is. Yeah. ...ideology um, behind uh, the massacre of the Jews on October 7th, which brought down on the Gaza Strip, and I think with the intention by the Hamas uh, of the Israeli counteroffensive, because they knew that that counteroffensive would result in many Palestinian dead, because uh, the, the Hamas uh, fighters and their weaponry and so on were embedded in the population in Gaza, and they hoped to benefit from this in the eyes of world public opinion as Israel chased these Hamas people and their ammunition dumps and so on, and killed lots of Palestinian civilians in the process. All of this was understood by uh, Sinwar, by the head of the Hamas, and he strived for that. But initially, he wanted to kill as many Jews as he could, uh, in the border areas uh, around the Gaza Strip. All I don't think there's a single fucking person remaining that is alive now that even played a role in the development of the 1988 charter. When the 1988 charter was written, Hamas had zero relevance and zero popularity. Uh, in 2017, they were a significantly more relevant force when they actually updated their charter. But... Hassan is irrelevant. Hassan has AIDS. Are you gay? D man is the best. Bro, they are not sending their best, okay? Let me tell you. What happened? I thought Destiny's audience was mostly like 35, 40 year old former 4chan guys. No, don't 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 ban that guy. I mean, I I I I welcome. I fucking hate rad libs. How long you be in Japan for? Ugh, anarchists are cringe. How the fuck did this guy go from that to this? Jesus Christ. <sighs> I don't I thought they were like older. That's like a like a legit 12 year old, I think. That guy. How did this happen? Respond directly to the points you made, and then um, I'll leave it to Norm to bring in the historical context. That um, Hamas charter is from the 90s, I think. 1988. 1988. So it's from the 80s. Um, I think your characterization of that charter as um, anti Semitic is indisputable. I think your. Um, characterization of that charter as genocidal is off the mark. Simplicity. Um, and more importantly, that charter has been superseded by a new charter. It in no, fact, has been, well, there is, there is a... There is no new charter. There is, there a, is charter. a explanation, a statement 2018, in, a, in a political 2000 statement. and something, 18. 2018, it, supposedly clarifying things which are in the charter, and, but it doesn't actually step back from what the charter and, says. Eliminate Israel, eliminate the Jews from the land of Israel. In, in 2018, the Hamas charter, if we look at the current version of the charter... It's not a call to whether, charter. Whether, whether You're you, calling it a charter. It wasn't. It, it makes, the only thing called the charter is what was issued in 1988 by Yassinim. Oh, shit. Damn, only the 1988 charter is relevant because it suits my argument. That's cool, man. Yeah, he's like, actually, it doesn't matter. When, when Hamas was like only a couple years into not being like an Islamic charity and a Muslim Brotherhood cutout, 
um, their charter when they couldn't even get like fucking 1% support from the Palestinian population. That's when the charter was relevant. Not when they actually became a like a legitimate political entity. Also, Balfour can change his mind, but Hamas cannot change their minds. A lot of uh, a lot of a lot of biases coming out to play here. I think in uh, with respect to like white dudes capable of change and growth, Arabs not capable of change, and also almost always responsible. Mufti very responsible for the Holocaust, but. Uh, you know, by that very same principle, the dudes who, you know, specifically went to higher positions in the Israeli government later on uh, in their in the original uh, a, a couple decades prior or a decade prior, they actually uh, committed atrocities personally. And then on top of that, tried to align with Nazi Germany. Well, those guys are irrelevant. It's just like this is reactionary thinking. OK, this is reactionary thinking. This is the problem with reactionary thinking is that like. You end up arriving at all of these conclusions where you say the people that I decided are bad are bad and cannot have rational motivations that are grounded within like, a, a, you know, morality that I would agree with. And the people that I do agree with are always good, even when they're doing bad things. You're a fucking freak for thinking that, bro. What? Thinking what? That at the top of the hour, there isn't a three minute ad break. Is that what you're going to say? Come on, dude. Even if you're a fucking scholar or a historian, you can still find yourselves in the find yourself in the throes of reactionary thinking that actually betray any kind of principled argument that you could make. I did expect more from Benny Morris. I did. Like obviously I disagree with him, but I, I thought at least he would like try to frame the conversation in a way that like is a little bit more nuanced. Like I thought he wouldn't be giving like he's not doing the the Rabbi Shmuley. Uh, argument, but he's coming close to it. So anyway, it, make, it makes a clear distinction um, between um, Jews and Zionists in 2018. Now, you can choose to dismiss it, believe it, it's sincere, it's insincere, uh, whatever. Insincere I, is probably the right word. Secondly, I'm really unfamiliar um, with fighters who consult these kinds of documents uh, no, before, before they go on. Uh, system. In the kindergarten, they're told, kill the Jews. They, they practice with uh, make-believe guns and uniforms when they're five years old in the kindergartens of the Hamas. At the in the oh, God. Every Hasbara line is coming out. Palestinians do not need to educate their children in a hatred of Israel. They do not have to learn it by CRT, okay? They do not learn it at school. They learn it when the school blows up. Who blows up the school is the question every Palestinian child is forced to reckon with. And the answer to that question is the Israeli occupying force. So that's when they radicalize, not because they're playing make-believe with guns, okay? Israel, on the other hand, does have to teach their children to hate Arabs. This is pure projection. Why does Israel have to teach their children to hate Arabs? Well, because they are the colonial entity here. They are the occupying force. They are the state. They have all of the rights and responsibilities and the monopoly on violence that the state has. A Palestinian child will ask, who killed my mom and who killed my dad? Exactly. This is how they radicalize against Israel. Okay? Israel doesn't teach much. Uh, Israel doesn't as much teach hate. They teach fear. Yes. That's how it works, though. That's how hatred festers. It's pure projection. It's pure projection when you hear someone, a defender of Israel, make this false claim that Palestinians are learning to hate Israel. Well, they won't even say hate Israel. They'll say hate Jews as a quick substitute for Israel, okay? When they don't learn that hatred, they, ex they live it. They, they, they actually experience the results of the Israeli hatred, and then they radicalize. Of the Commissioner Gaza. General of UNRWA, right? I didn't say that. I said the Hamas has kindergartens and summer camps in which they train okay. to kill Jews, children, secondly, five and six. Secondly, you keep you keep saying Jews, um, to which I would respond. They use the word Jews. To which I would respond that Hamas does not have a record of deliberately targeting Jews who are not Israelis. And in fact, it also doesn't have a record of deliberately targeting either Jews or Israelis outside Israel and Palestine. So, you know, all this talk of... Um, Unlike the Hezbollah, which has targeted, well, we're talking targeted about, Jews outside, we're talking outside about, of Palestine. We're talking about October 7th and Hamas.
Damn, bro. Oh, why are you moving away? Why are you talking about Hezbollah now? Hezbollah doesn't operate inside of uh, inside of Palestine as a whole different can of worms. Hezbollah, also a creation in many ways of the Israeli state's violent actions in Lebanon. It's so strange that Israel keeps striking all over the place and then the victims of said strikes and attacks turn around and fight back and then they're called terrorists. If you'd also like to speak about Hezbollah, let's let's get to that separately, if you, if you don't mind. Um, so again, um, genocidal, well, if, if that term is going to be discussed, my first response would be, let's talk about potentially genocidal actions against Israelis rather than against Jews for the reasons that I just mentioned. And again, I find this constant conflation of, 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 of Jews, Israel, Zionism to be a bit disturbing. Secondly, I think um, there are uh, quite a few indications in the factual record that raise serious questions about um, the accusations of the genocidal intent and, and genocidal practice of what happened on October 7th. And my final point would be, I don't, I don't think I should take your, your word for it. I don't think you should take my word for it. I think what we need here is a proper, independent, international investigation. And the reason we need that of genocide during this conflict, whether by uh, Palestinians on October 7th or Israel thereafter, the reason that we need such an investigation is because Hamas is, there won't be any hearings on what Hamas did on October 7th at the International Court of Justice um, because the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide deals only with, with states and not with movements. I think the International Criminal Court and specifically its current prosecutor, Karim Khan, lacks any and all credibility. He's been an absolute failure at his job. He's just been sitting on his backside for years on this file. And I think um, uh, I would point out that Hamas has called for independent investigations of all these allegations. Israel has categorically rejected any international investigation, of course, fully supported by the United States. Um, and, I, and I think what is required is to have credible investigations of these things, because I don't think you're going to convince me. I don't think I'm going to convince you. And this is two people sitting across the table well, from each other. No, there's certain things you don't even have to investigate. You know how many citizens, civilians died in the yes. October 7th assault. Yes, but that's not... You know that there are lots of allegations of rape. I don't know how persuaded you are of those. They did find bodies without heads, uh, which is... There were no beheadings Islamic. of there were, there were some beheadings, apparently. The Israelis didn't even claim that in the document they submitted before the ICJ. Go read <laughs> what your government submitted. It never mentioned beheadings. <laughs> so as far as I know, there I read people who were beheaded. Yeah. But they, you could bring it up right you now. You also deny that there were rapes there. I didn't deny. I said I've not seen convincing evidence that confirms it. I've said that from day one, and I'll say it today, four and a half months later. Do you know that they killed eight or nine hundred civilians in their Absolutely. Yes. That seems to me indisputable. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've, said that, I've said that from day one. <laughs> That's so... Dear God, I love Norm so much. He's just like... He's just, he's just fucking bitch slapping him. Dude, I wish this was just like... I would love to see a, a Norm versus Benny uninterrupted, you know? Day one. Well, to be clear, you haven't. You did a debate. Um, I remember the talk show, but you seem to imply that there was a lot of crossfire and that it might have been the IDF that I killed said, a lot of... I said that there is no question... Be... Wait, why Why did Destiny bring that point up? Because that literally does actually correspond to the reality. Uh, what? You're, you're just saying that he was prescient and correct because that is what happened. The fuck? Like, according to the survivors of October 7, there certainly was a shit ton of crossfire and also on top of that what the the israeli the 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 israeli newspapers investigated october 7 and found credibility in the claims that like the israeli government actually may have even implemented the the uh the hannibal uh, uh doctrine the fuck in kibbutz in the kibbutzim he's just what is he doing this of course does not mean that like the the overwhelming amount of civilian casualties came at the hands of israel i've never said that for the record i still very much maintain the position that yes hamas militants and other palestinian resistance forces that entered through the gaza envelope absolutely targeted civilians and killed them both in the nova festival it wasn't just crossfire it was a deliberate attempt to kill civilians Okay, it was definitionally an act of terror. This is true. It is definitionally an act of terror in a similar uh, in a, in a similar vein to the Haitian Revolution or even the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which is a you know comparison that Norm uses quite frequently and did use on October eighth, I think, when he wrote or October seven when he wrote his article that is like very controversial now.
because the names were published in Haaretz. There is no question that roughly of the 1,200 people killed, 800 of them were civilians. I 850. see 850, fine. So I never said that, but then I said, no, we don't know exactly how they were killed, but 800 civilians killed, no, 850, no question there. And I also said, on repeated occasions, there cannot be any doubt. In my opinion, Festival as of now, the target is not true. It doesn't matter. Once they fucking paraglided in and they saw what was going on, they, dude, I watched body camera footage of Hamas militants or other Palestinian resistance forces and their militants opening fire on fucking porta potties like mass shooters. You do not do that if you are simply trying to kill Israeli security forces. You do that because you're there to kill as many people as possible. Please. Okay? None of those events justify Israel's occupation. None of those events justify Israel's apartheid state. None of those events justify the ethnic cleansing campaign that ensued on October 8th. Okay? It's ridiculous. The actual targets that they were trying to hit and successfully did hit were military bases. Having said that, however, they did definitely, they did definitely seek out outposts like the kibbutzim that they consider a military target that I do not. And I've seen it. Like I, I watched it. I watched Palestinian resistance forces kill civilians. I saw it. I saw it with my own two eyes. I watched the footage. They filmed the footage. There is no reason to try to portray the broader Palestinian population or even the Palestinian resistance as perfect victims because I'm not in the business of trying to paint a black and white picture unless we're talking about the morality of an apartheid regime because the apartheid regime is a black and white picture. The morality is clear. Apartheid is wrong. There is no justification for it. Okay. The correct approach to October 7 is to lay the blame squarely on the Israeli apartheid state. And if survivors from the kibbutzim could come to that conclusion, you should at least honor their perspective and honor their experiences. I think a lot of people get lost in, uh, in their, in their uh, endless uh, ways of trying to fit a perfect narrative. You mean actual settler outposts or just sites where they gather? No, like the 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 justification for uh, the justification for targeting the kibbutzim is that like they are deliberately designed to be the first line of defense against Palestinians, and therefore they're technically perceived as a military outpost, even if it is comprised entirely of uh, unarmed uh, non-militants. I do not agree. I'm saying that I do not agree with that assessment. I think that they are still civilian outposts and most of the people that died in those civilian outposts were civilians they were women children some of them actually died due to artillery fire from the israeli occupying force for sure but it's not like the west bank that's not true they are not unarmed and many reservists and retired idf it doesn't matter bro come on in under international global con under international conflict there are rules of engagement what the fuck are you talking about once a Hamas uh, militant is rendered out of combat because of injuries or because they no longer are holding up a weapon, they are, you're not allowed to kill them, okay? It would be considered a war crime. In the same vein, if you go into a kibbutzim and there are veterans there of the IDF, right, and you kill them, you're still, and they're unarmed, which many were, they are non-combatants. This is still a war crime. Hamas militants are not occupying. It's not fair to conflate the two at all. What the fuck? It doesn't matter. What? What are you talking about? It's not about an occupation. It's about what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. I hope that people don't think that I am, like, ever engaging in, like, apologia for the state of Israel. I'm just simply stating what my assessment is that Hamas was responsible for significant atrocities, and I made sure to include the plural. There's a lot of tricky language being employed here. Do you think There's of the 850? It's called attaching value to words and not talking like a motor mouth. Okay. I am very careful about qualifying because that's okay, what language is about. For, that's great. Then let me just ask a clarifying question. Do you firmly believe that the majority of the 850 civilians were killed by Hamas? My view is even if it were half, 
400 is a huge number by any reckoning. What? It's okay, wait, you didn't I said wait, even wait, if, wait, 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 because, wait, because wait, Benny, wait, 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 because Professor Morris, I don't know. I agree with Moeen Rabani. I'm not sure if he concedes the 400. I'll say, Why 400? Wait, because I have, thought up the because, 400. right, as I said, 850 yeah. well, slaughtered well, because, by Hamas. So I don't know. A couple I, of individuals were killed I, in this I don't, I don't know. You're saying Professor day one, Morris, you believe Professor, this particular Professor thing. Morris, you clearly don't. You clearly I don't believe this from thing. You day don't. One, I you said no. people died. That's not no. controversial. Oh, wait, okay. hold on, hold on. Uh, that's not controversial. Mr. Bunnell, Mr. Bunnell, I attach a value to words. You said that. When you I, value when I, when I, I was, so yes, Mr. Bunnell, please slow down. Dude, one of the one of the greatest uh, uh, brain rots that I think like Mr. Bunnell has created is his like community also engages in his same like line of bad argumentation. Where instead of like addressing the actual subject, instead of addressing any of the statements that you've made, everyone immediately goes for the low hanging fruit of just making up something I didn't say. And it's weird because like you try to virtue signal and act like you actually are simply uh, trying to understand my position. Well, then ask me a question. So many people just turn around and, and make accusations that they frame as though they're simply curious or just asking questions. It's so weird. I, I can't argue with your delusions, man. Why are you so permanently stuck in like trying to find a, a, a moment of hypocrisy or a gotcha? This is not valuable discourse. You can't do it. From the speech and attempt to listen. When I was explicitly asked by Pierce Morgan, I said there can be no question that Hamas committed, committed atrocities, atrocities this, on yes. October 7th. Seven. If you want me to pin down a number, I can't do that. And ask you to pin down may... a number. You can listen to you what I'm saying. No, my question is, okay. I'll ask, I'll ask a very precise question. Sorry, you because you're not, it's, a very, it's a very easy question. If I understood question. your question correctly. My question is, do you think the majority of the people that were killed yes. on October 7th, civilians were killed by Hamas, yes. or are we subscribing to the idea that the IDF killed hundreds, no, four or five hundred? No, but let me explain why that's a difficult question to answer. The total number of civilians killed was 800, 850. We know that Hamas is responsible um, probably for the majority of those killings. We also know that there were killings by Islamic Jihad. We also know- well, We're bunching together the Islamic Jihad and the Hamas. So that's well, splitting hairs now. No, but he means, he means no, I, the Raiders. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in opposition to the conspiracy theory that um, people like, do you prefer Norm or Professor Sprinkelstein, or what do you, I don't know what you're, how you prefer? Well, it's not a conspiracy theory. Well, the, the conspiracy theory is the idea that the IDF killed the majority of them. It's not a conspiracy theory. And, oh, there's, also, and there's also a theory that, um, as Norm pointed out on the show that he was on, that he thought- The IDF killed the majority of the, the civilians is not something that uh, Norm Finkelstein, as far as I know, has said. And it's weird because I don't understand why, instead of examining what Norm Finkelstein is saying, he chooses to speak over it and just, again, quickly just develop a straw man of an argument that he's not presenting. This dude is in front of you. I think, like, people get so caught up in internet debates and then they just get lazy, like intellectually lazy and argumentatively, they get lazy in the way that they craft an argument. Yeah, it's going to be much easier for you to argue against the position that the the opposing side did not make, but you shouldn't do that. No, Kaya's not licking her hot fuck. She's eating a... Oh, it doesn't make any sense to, to continue with this uh, line of, of questioning because... It's built on top of a faulty premise that could very easily be, if one was genuinely interested in finding the truth, it, it could be, it could be very easily uh, uh, disposed of. Just ask the question to him. When he reacts to you, it's full of ad hominems, of course. But I do it too because it's it's like fun. You know what I mean? That's what it is. It's it's uh it's it's lazy, but I'm not trying to craft an argument here or when I like make fun of him for, you know, being stupid or whatever. It's basically asking the opposition to answer for the most fringe, insane takes that people on their side can espouse. Exactly. I thought that it was very strange that given how reputable uh, Israeli services are when it comes to sending ambulances, retrieving bodies. Like, how can you say so much and still say so little at the same time? Again, not addressing anything that I did, just uh, hyper-focusing on, like, what you perceive as the optics are here. It's just, you're not doing anything. You didn't do anything. You're just trying to derail the stream. You know what I mean? Is very strange that given how reputable uh, Israeli services are when it comes to sending ambulances, retrieving bodies, he thought it was very strange that that number was continually being adjusted. And do you know so why you say that in combination I, 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 with, well, I'm not sure how many were killed. Well, do you know why the number, do you know why the number went down? The number went down because the Israeli authorities were in, were in possession of 200 corpses that were burned to a crisp that they assumed were 
Israeli um, Israelis who had been killed on October 7th. They later determined that these were in fact Palestinian fighters. Now, how does a Palestinian fighter get burnt to a crisp? No, you're mixing two things. That's, yeah, Some of the bodies, they didn't, weren't true. able to identify. No, he, what he's saying is not mixing two things. He's right about that. That is the reason why, that is the reason why, according to Haaretz, um, that they that they lowered the number. Actually, they just ruled that some of them were actually Arab uh, marauders rather than Israeli victims. Some, a few of them also, of the Jews, were burnt to a crisp. And it took them time to work yes. this out. And, and they came out initially with a slightly higher figure, 1,400 dead, and eventually reduced it to 1,200 yes. and, and dead is, Israelis. And the reason is that a proportion of Israeli civilians killed on October 7th, I don't believe it was a majority. We the don't know how many. Um, some were killed in crossfire. Some were killed by um, uh, Israeli shell fire, helicopter fire, and so on. And um, uh, the majority were killed by Palestinians. And of that majority, um, we don't know. I mean, again, I, I understood your question is referring specifically to Hamas, which is why I tried to answer it that way. But if you meant generically Palestinians, yes. If you mean specifically Hamas, we don't have a clear breakdown of how no, many I don't mean specifically Hamas, okay. but I just think when you use the word some, that's doing a lot of heavy lifting. We'll use some. That's fine, but some can mean anywhere from 1% to 49%. But we don't know. So the numbers here and the details are uh, interesting and important almost from a legal perspective. But if we zoom out the moral perspective, are Palestinians from Gaza justified in violent resistance? Well, Palestinians have the right to resistance. Palestinian, that right includes the right to armed resistance. At the same time, armed resistance um, is subject to the laws of war. And there are very clear regulations um, that separate right. legitimate acts of armed resistance. Yes, he's right. And the moment that you are expressly targeting civilian occupied areas with the express purpose of killing civilians, which the kibbutzim uh, targeting would, in my opinion, uh, fit that bill, you are now violating international rules of law. I mean, international rules of war. Now, it's laughable to have this conversation now, as I have said time and time again, that Hamas is the lesser evil. When we're talking about Israel and Hamas, Hamas objectively is the lesser evil. It is objectively the lesser evil because it does not maintain an apartheid state. It is also objectively the lesser evil due to the very real fact that they killed mathematically less civilians per capita in comparison to enemy combatants, armed enemy combatants versus Israel's actions post-October 7. Israel has also obviously raised Gaza entirely, including uh, deliberately targeting, deliberately targeting uh, civilian dense areas and deliberately targeting civilian infrastructure. An infinitely, infinitely larger uh, uh, act of terror from acts of armed resistance um, that are not legitimate. And the attacks of October 7th, where did they land for you? There's been um, almost exclusive focus on the attacks on civilian population centers and, and the killings of um, civilians on October 7th. Um, what is much, much less discussed to the point of um, amnesia is that there were very extensive attacks on Israeli military and intelligence facilities on October 7th. I would make a very clear distinction between those two. And um, secondly, um, I'm not sure that I would characterize the efforts by um, Palestinians on October 7th to seize Israeli territory and Israeli population centers as in and of themselves illegitimate. You mean attacking Israeli civilians? No, 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 that's so not what I, I said. What you said. I think what you had on October 7th was an effort by Hamas to seize Israeli territory and population and centers. And kill civilians. That's not what I said. What I said is I think I, I'm, I'm, I would not describe the effort to seize Israeli territory as in and of itself illegitimate, as a separate issue from the killing of Israeli civilians, where um, in those cases where they had been deliberately targeted, that's very clearly illegitimate. Whole families were slaughtered in Kibbutzim. But I'm making... Think, but many, wait, 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 many of them left-wingers, incidentally, think... who helped Palestinians go to hospitals in Israel and so on. Again. Even drove Palestinian uh, cancer patients to hospitals Again, in Israel. Again, I'm making a distinction they don't seem here. to be very condemnatory of what the Hamas did. Well, I, I don't do select... That's so funny to say, because, like, dude, what the fuck? Given the opportunity, I'm sure there are plenty of Palestinian children and the women and the civilian men that Israel has killed in its endless fucking ethnic cleansing campaign, seemingly endless ethnic cleansing campaign, as they brought about hellfire upon this entire uh, civilian population that is already, like, condensed into a fucking tiny area because of ethnic displacement prior. Like, who knows the potentials of, of how humane and how wonderful and kind they would be. This game of, like, condemn Hamas made a lot more sense on October 8th, especially by those who knew what Israel would inevitably do and would obviously defend it, but, like, at the time, I guess the broader audience did not have that same comprehension. Maybe because, one, they weren't paying attention before, or two, never really thought it could get this bad. 
the correct counter to this is, of course, okay, do you condemn Israel? Not gonna lie, I don't think the goal of October 7th was anything other than getting the highest KD ratio possible. No, the goals of October 7th were laid clear by the very same people. People always love picking and choosing like certain Hamas leadership and what they've said and not others when it doesn't suit their interests. I do not fault you for not knowing what they've said because it's not usually heavily publicized. This was a military operation to do as much damage as possible, certainly. Part of that is killing civilians. But the military operation in and of itself was to secure as many hostages as possible. And, and they thought that they would have severe limitations, severe hurdles in the Israeli security apparatus that didn't actually, uh, uh, that fell through pretty easily. They were shocked by their own success in that regard. They, they made it very clear that they said that their goal was to kill IDF soldiers, take over uh, military checkpoints, like take over uh, the, the, uh, secure, the, the surveillance base and other military bases beyond that of course once the uh once the 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 barrier was penetrated uh there were certainly criminal elements that also went in there were plenty of civilians that went in that with no like criminal intent or weren't like trying to do something uh, awful but just to simply go in and fucking go into someone's house or watch netflix even this is all recorded heavily uh if you read haaretz right but there ultimate aim was to secure hostages so that they could engage in negotiations and try to do a mutual hostage release and also build a port in Gaza. Those were the demands. The demands were build a port in Gaza and engage in hostage negotiations, including high profile hostages. Active condemnation. I'm not talking about selective. I don't do selective specific outrage. condemnation of this specific well, you know assault what, you on know civilians. What it is. You know, I, I would, I would, for example, uh, condemn Israeli assaults on civilians, deliberate assaults on civilians. Yes, I would, would condemn them, but you're not doing that. You know, the Hamas. You know what the issue is? Um, well, I've been speaking in public now. I would say since the late 1980s and interviewed and so on. I have never, on one occasion, ever been asked to condemn any Israeli act. When I've been in group discussions those supporting the Israeli action or perspective. I have never encountered an example where these individuals are asked to condemn what Israel is doing. The, um, the, the demand and obligation of condemnation is exclusively applied in my personal experience over decades, is exclusively applied to Palestinians. No, and those who, well, Israel is condemned day and night on every television channel, no, 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 on every, and, and, and has been I, for the I'm last telling... oh, Okay, bro. Oh yeah, he, they're so condemned. Bro, Dude, I wish I could condemn the Palestinians in the way that we're condemning Israel then. Yeah, dude, I'm condemning the Palestinians, the Palestinian state, the Palestinian government, by offering them $3 billion in weapons every year, okay? Let's let's condemn the Palestinians a little bit in the same way that we're condemning Israel then. God damn, dude. Get the fuck out of here. This permanent victimhood narrative. God damn, it's so fucking stupid. Holy shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm condemning. I'm condemning Palestinians uh, by by uh, having you know how you would condemn Palestinians in the same way that or condemn Hamas in the same way that we condemn supposedly quote unquote Israel. Imagine if during October seven, I would go and have like Yahya Sinwar on fucking on my broadcast to contextualize all of the civilians that were being murdered on camera. That would be my condemnation if if uh, you know. If that was condemnation, according to Benny Morris, if that's real condemnation, can you imagine a world where I'm like, please, Yaya Sinwar, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, a, a fucking footage of some of these militants here uh, executing uh, people inside the kibbutzim. Could you please contextualize why this violence is occurring uh, by telling us how Israel deserved it? Like, that is so unimaginable. It is literally, I think, illegal, okay? I would probably go to prison <laughs> if I did something like that. I had a random teenager from Yemen on this fucking broadcast, and these dipshits literally kept saying he's an anti-Semitic, homophobic, gay people executing terrorist Houthi who killed probably a bunch of fucking sailors. Random fucking Yemeni teenager who in the interview said he's not anti-Semitic, that he's all totally on board with... Uh, anti-Zionist Jews, which was shocking for him to even learn about, not a militant, and literally said he wasn't, he, he was not Houthi. Tim Houthi interview was condemned for being cringe. It was. It fucking was not at all. Didn't you brand it as him being a Houthi interview, though? Brother, I didn't know anything about him, okay? 
And that is the reason why I asked them questions in that process. But many people did not actually watch the interview and they simply made assertions. Stop saying he wasn't anti-Semitic. Of course he won't say it. Why? Why wouldn't he say he's anti-Semitic, dumb fuck? It's literally in the Houthi fucking charter. It says death to all Jews. Why is it that all of a sudden this guy is going to magically fucking hold back? You can't pick and choose. On the one hand, you're like, all Yemen, uh, all, all people on the, because uh, uh, he's on the broadcast. Dog, the literal fucking Houthi banner says death to all Jews. Why do you think he would hold back? I thought he wasn't a Houthi. Because he's not. <laughs> yeah. Does he not, does he not want to get fired from the Houthis? Yeah, he's a, he's a part of the Houthis. It doesn't make sense. What you're saying doesn't make sense in the own. You're in a moral quandary in your own fucking, in the own neat little mora, uh, moral confines that you're trying to cultivate. You're still inconsistent. Dude's been getting fucking blown up his whole goddamn life, okay? He withstood a genocide. I don't think he gives a shit about, like, American sensibilities. Oh, I love the argument that it's like he's actually still anti-Semitic, but he's like... He's also cognizant. He's, an he's anti-Semitic, but he's cognizant, and he's, like, secretly uh, hiding his anti-Semitism. But also, simultaneously, the Houthis, which he said he's not a part of, I believe he is a part of, uh, who literally have in their fucking banner, death to all Jews. How'd that work? How'd that happen? So on the one hand, they're very open about it, that they fucking put it on a goddamn banner, but also simultaneously super secretive about it. It doesn't say that. It says curse the Jews or some shit, not death to all Jews. It says curse the Jews. Sorry. Like you about a personal yeah, experience lasting Paris. decades. You said quote. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh no. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, quote what you just said. I shouldn't have said, said anything at any time. You should say, uh -oh. Professor Morris. Yes. You just said, Assam I babe, would I'm an Arab. I grew with these anti Semitic indoctrinations. Okay. Well, I don't know why. If Netanyahu says I don't hate Palestinians, would you believe him? Are you comparing Benjamin Netanyahu to a 19 year old TikToker? Are you this fucking dumb? Are you actually this fucking stupid? Hello? Is there something wrong with your brain? Benjamin Netanyahu is personally responsible for the death and destruction of thousands of Palestinians. It is not the same, you fucking idiot. You have no reason to believe that that person has killed a single person, Jewish or not, like not a single person. I do not, like, here is a better analogy that you should make if you understood the argument. If I brought a random Jewish person from Israel on this broadcast and then immediately were like, well, you're secretly a hater of Palestinians, okay? You must be because you're a Jew in Israel, right? You're so fucking stupid. If I brought a random Israeli Jewish teenager on this broadcast and then started fucking making these assertions about them, it would be the same as, I, as, I, as what you're trying to do to the fucking, to the Yemeni teen, Okay, except I have had Israeli Jewish teenagers on this broadcast. I don't know if you recall, you probably weren't here for that. They were conscientious objectors, as a matter of fact, because I'm not some fucking freak lord who automatically assumes that if someone is Israeli or Jewish, that they fucking want to do genocide to the entire uh, Palestinian population. That's the difference. Israel deliberately attacks civilians, yes. okay? The problem, Professor Morris, is... Over and over again, you claim, in the face of overwhelming evidence, that they didn't attack civilians. That's not true. I've said really? Israel has attacked Professor, civilians. Professor in Kibia, Mar Israel attacks right, right, civilians. Right, right, I've extensively okay, about it. I know that. In Kafir Qasim, they uh, kill uh, civilians. Yes. And, I've and now let's, let's... So you're, you're just eliminating, okay, okay. selecting. Okay. As, as, as Stephen yeah, says, yeah. cherry pick. Uh, if I were you, you, you cherry okay. pick. Let's fast forward when you were an adult. What did you say about the 1982 Lebanon war? What did I say? You don't remember? Okay. Allow me. Wow. Okay. So... It happens so that funny. I was not at all by any, I had no interest in the Israel-Palestine conflict as a young man until the, 19, true. Until the 1982 Lebanon war. Yeah, uh, I lost the passage. I'll find it. Okay, real quick. Well, he but it is safe to assume this is 94% agree with the war in Gaza is not a good point. No, that's idiotic as fuck. Your horniness to say like all Israeli Jews fucking hate Palestinians and want to do genocide is causing you to literally betray the principles that I bring to the table. I will never, ever assume automatically that like an israeli jew is going to be in support of the genocide in gaza you know why i'm not going to do that because that's fucking idiotic and also bigoted it doesn't matter don't say just 94 percent. doesn't matter i apply the same exact principles that's my point 
Hey, Sergeant, for that. Yeah, uh, you that's bring good. up something that's really important that a lot of people don't draw a distinction between, in that there is just pauses for war, and there's just ways to act within a sure. war. It's always better to ask instead of assume. And these two things principally do have a distinction from one another. Correct. However, um, while I appreciate the recognition of the distinction, the idea that the, the cause for war that Hamas was engaged in, I don't believe if we look at their actions in war or the statements they've made, it doesn't seem like it had to do with territorial acquisition. No, 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 no. I, the, the, like point, taking land no back. the point I was making was, um, what was Hamas trying to achieve militarily? on October 7th. And I was pointing out that the focus has been very much on um, Hamas attacks on civilians and atrocities and so on. And I'm not saying those things should be ignored. What I'm saying is that what's getting lost in the shuffle is that there were extensive attacks on military and intelligence facilities. Mm -hmm. And as far as the, let's say, the other aspects are concerned, um, because I think either you or Lex asked me about the legitimacy of these attacks. I said, I'm, I'm unclear whether efforts by Hamas to seize Israeli population centers in and of themselves are illegitimate, as opposed to actions that either deliberately targeted. Do you think these guys actually care and are maybe confused or are they just simply saying that it wasn't a random Yemeni guy though? Oh, never mind. Tour on Titan. No, dude, I'm moving the face cam because like I'm trying to do my very reasonable best to not fucking violate TOS for ban evasion. Okay, that's it. I will repeat it over and over again, regardless. It's funny, other than that. Oh, damn, dude. Why are you? Why are so many of you in here today? What the fuck's going on? It wasn't a random Yemeni guy, though. It was a random Yemeni guy. Israeli civilians, um, or actions that um, should reasonably have been expected to result in the killings of Israeli civilians. Those strike me as, by definition, illegitimate. Um, and I want to be very clear about that. I have where illegitimate I, means you condemn them. Illegitimate means they are not legitimate. I, I have a problem condemning with, your side. Yes. No, not condemning my side. I have a problem with selective outrage and I have a problem with selective condemnation. And as I, I explained to you a few minutes ago, in, in my decades of, of appearing in public and being interviewed, I have never seen um, uh, I've never been asked to condemn an Israeli action. I've never been asked for a moral judgment on an Israeli action. I'm, um, exclusive request for condemnation has to do with what Palestinians do. More, and just as importantly, um, I'm sure if you watch BBC or CNN, when is the last time an Israeli spokesperson has been asked to condemn an Israeli act? I've, I've never seen it. I don't think we condemn the Arab side either, though, right? I don't think there's so, any so, condemnation. No, but much. now that we're talking about Israeli victims, all of a sudden morality is... is well, I think the reason why it comes up is because there's no shortage of international condemnation for Israel. As Norm will point out a million times that there are 50 billion UN resolutions. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm condemning. I, I like I said, I'm going to condemn the Palestinians by giving them three billion dollars worth of weapons, an Iron Dome, and also total legal permission by vetoing any Security Council provision. Like that's that's my goal. You know, man, what a what what broad uh, what broad condemnation falls upon Israel? Oh, what a terrible fate! Oh. You've got Amnesty International, you've got multiple bodies of the UN, you've got now this case for the ICJ, so there's no question of if there's condemnation. But, but, but sorry, if I can interrupt you, in 1948, the entire world stood behind the establishment of a Jewish state. In the entire no, no, world. No, no, except the Arab states and the Muslim states. Well, not the entire world. Okay, but I think you know what I mean by that. The Western dem democracies, that's what you're saying. Well, then also, Western democracies question, supported the establishment of Israel. My quick question was, you said that you believe that, this is a very short one, you know, it's just, you think that, um, you think that, um, you think that there's an argument to be made that the people in Gaza, that Hamas and Islamic Jihad, whoever participated, had a just cause for war. Maybe they didn't do it in the correct way, but they maybe had a just cause for war. I don't is, think there's a maybe there. The Palestinians. Okay, you think they absolutely had a just cause for war. Yeah. Do you think that Israel has a just cause for operations sorts of iron? No, of course not. Okay. All right. You can say your point. Okay. Uh, first of all, on this issue of double standards, which is the one that uh, irks or irritates Muin. You said that you are not a person of double standards, unlike people like Muin. You hold high a single standard, and you condemn deliberate Israeli attacks on um, civilians. When on they civilians. Occurred, yeah. And I would say that's true for the period. They just sneakily ignore the actual question. Yes, of course, criticism of Israel condemn, but the question was, why do we never hear questions from the media to Israel defenders about condemning Israel? Because there's a double standard. Because Israel is our ally. Period up till 1967, and I think it's accurate, you, uh, your account of the first intifada. There, it seems to me, you were in conformity with most mainstream accounts. And the case of the first intifada, you also used, surprisingly, you used Arab human rights sources like al Haq, which I think Muin worked for yeah. during the first intifada. That's true. But then something very strange happens. So let's illustrate it. Wait, there's something strange which happened. Is Arabs rejecting Peace Okay, wait. Peace offers. Let, let, uh, well, by accepting the Oslo Agreement. Yeah. Not the, okay. By rejecting the Oslo Agreement. Okay. Okay. Oh, if we have time, I know the record very well. I'd be very happy to go through it with you. But let's get to those double standards. So this is what you have to say about Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982. You said Israel was reluctant to harm civilians, sought to avoid okay. casualties oh, on both it. sides, and took care not to harm Lebanese and Palestinian civilians. You then went on to acknowledge 
the massive use of IDF firepower against civilians during the siege of Beirut, which traumatized Israeli society, Marx, Mars quickly enters the caveat that Israel, quote, tried to pinpoint military targets, but inevitably many civilians were hit. That's your description of the Lebanon war. As I say, that's when I first got involved in the conflict. I am a voracious reader. I read everything on the Lebanon war. I would say there's not a single account of the Lebanon war in which the estimates are between 15 and 20,000 Palestinian Lebanese were killed, overwhelmingly civilians, the biggest bloodletting until the Karim Gaza uh, genocide. Uh and by the way, Israel did not have a right to invade Lebanon. Important. Palestinians do have a right to resist the apartheid. They do. Their methods of resistance went above and beyond and are understandably considered acts of terror on October 7. Everything past that is, is uh, so far defensive against Israel's, once again, illegal offensive war against the civilian population. Israel does not have a right to defend itself as the belligerent occupier on top of Gaza by pummeling Gaza. They do not. They do not have a legal right to do this. It is an illegal occupation. It is an apartheid state. And Israel's actions post-October 7 in Gaza are illegal. As the belligerent occupier, Israel does not have a right to blow up Gaza. Okay? They don't. It is not a defensive measure. This is the same Israel attack on Lebanon. Sam was telling you he witnessed the attack helicopters flying to, isn't it? I think so. A biggest bloodletting. I would say I can't think of a single mainstream account that remotely approximates what you just said. So, leaving aside, I can name the books, voluminous, huge volumes. I'll just take one example. Now, you will remember, because I think you served in Lebanon in 82, am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you will remember that Dov Yarmia kept a war diary. So, with your permission, allow me to describe what he wrote during his diary. So, he writes, The war machine of the IDF is galloping and trampling over the conquered, conquered territory, demonstrating a total insensitivity, insensitivity to the fate of the Arabs who are found in its path. A PLO-run hospital suffered a direct hit. Thousands of refugees are returning to the city. When they arrive at their homes, many of which have been destroyed or damaged, you hear their cries of pain and their howls over the deaths of their loved ones. The air is permeated with the smell well, of corpses. We... Destruction and yeah, yeah, death no, are what, 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 what you're making, Does that sound like what, your description the of the Lebanon war? The, uh, forget my description. The forget point, it? The, the point you're Words making... Words are in print. The, we can't no, just no, let me, forget Let me them. just finish my sentence. The point you're making, which you somehow forget, is that there are Israelis who strongly... Dude, he, it's so funny that he keeps cooking him with his own words. That's awesome. God damn, dude. Oh, bro. He's reading him to fucking filth. He said, listen up. You're fraudulent. He got him to say, forget my own words. That is so ridiculous, dude. Oh, my God. He criticized their own side and described how Israelis are doing things which they regard as immoral. You don't find that on the Arab side. I'm talking about don't you, that. Mr. Morris. Don't I'm not talking me. about Dev Dormio. I'm talking me. about you, the historian. How did you depict the Lebanon Because I believe, I believe yeah. that the Israeli military tried to avoid committing a civilian casualty. So, Dev, as I think they all the accounts by... Yeah, Israel's always trying to fucking uh, avoid civilian casualties is just failing, you know? Just failing to do so, man. Biggest failure, biggest fraudulent military of all time, you know? It's crazy. How do I add, like, just a fucking black box or something? A chatter actually brought up a good idea. Do I just... Do I need, like, a like an image or something? Let's see if I can find, like, a funny image real quick that I'm going to use here. I should have done this from the jump, dude. If this is a web P, I'm gonna lose it. Nope, it's not. Okay, good. Hold on. Robert Fisk and pity the Robert nation. Fisk is yeah, anti, I know. All, all the I know. I know. Journalist, I know. As always, been. right. So th that's always. why. That's why you can say with such confidence that you don't commit. You don't condemn deliberate Israeli attacks on civilians there because there weren't any. No, I didn't say there weren't. Yeah, you and didn't. You, you agreed that I have condemned Israeli attacks yes, there are, on there civilians. Are, I never quarrel with facts. Your, your description of the 1982 war is so shocking, it makes my innards writhe. And then your description of the second intifada, your description of defensive shield, when they, they, when are, Arab they are bombing, worse, is, when they Arab are worse bombers, than apologetics. When Arab suicide That's bombers like were destroying Jew, Jews in masses no, and buses no, and in no, restaurants. No, That's you, the second intifada. You remember that? You can try suicide everything. bombers in Jerusalem's buses and I, restaurants. I am completely aware Aviv. of that. But, you, well, but if you forgot the numbers, no, I don't forget it was three to one. The they, number, they killed yeah. mostly armed no, Palestinian I know, gunmen. That's, that's what you say. In what okay, I can't do this. This is so dumb. No, it's too hard. It's too hard. It's, it's too much. It's too much. I can't do it. 
It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. The problem is like having to constantly switch screens. Also, it's like a serious subject and I want to pay attention. I just want to, I want to pay attention. I want to pay attention. Now you know how that guy felt. You had to censor that Japanese guy's dick with an eggplant. That's what book, that's what but I that's think. not what Amnesty International said. That's not what Human Rights Watch said. I don't said. remember what that's they not, said. I do. No, no, that's not what I don't Zellum know what said. Right. I, listen, I'm actually right. Listen, listen. In the Second Intifada, some 4,000 Palestinians were killed. Morris. Most of them You're, armed people. You, you, and the Israelis, no, a, a thousand complete, Israelis were killed. No, Almost all of them. No, Professor, Professor Morris, fantasy, but I'm not going to argue with here. Here's a simple challenge. You said not to look at the camera. Sometimes. Scares the people. I'll make the open challenge. You are going to scare them. No, Professor Morris. Open challenge. Words are in print. I wrote 50 pages analyzing all of your work. I quote, some will say cherry pick, but I think accurately uh, quote you. Here's a simple challenge. Answer me in print. Answer what I wrote and show where I'm making things up. Answer I, me I'm in print. Familiar. I'm, I'm sorry, okay. I'm not familiar no, with that's no me. problem. You're a busy man. You're an important historian. You don't have to know everything that's in print, especially by modest publishers. But now you know. And so here's the public challenge. You answer and show where I cherry picked where I misrepresented. Send me the article. And, and, we, and then we can have a civil scholarly discussion. I'm not sure we will agree. Even if we I, don't have to yeah, agree. Bro, bro's got the iPad and the phone. He's like, oh man. <laughs> He's asking chat. Okay. It's for the reader to decide, looking at both sides, okay. where this truth stands. No, man, and if I may ask, yeah. uh, it's good to discuss ideas that are in the air now as opposed to citing <laughs> literature that was written in the past as much as possible mm -hmm. because listeners were not familiar with the literature. So like whatever was written, just express it. Uh, condense the, the key idea and then we can debate the ideas. No, there are ideas. two aspects. There's a public debate, but there's also written words. Yes, I'm just telling you that you as a, as an academic historian put a lot of value in the written word Correct. and I think it is valuable, but in this... He's incidentally not the only historian who puts value to words. Yes. I also do actually. Yes. Yeah, but just, so we, in the, one, just one or two sentences at a time. Yeah. But this, this, in this context, uh, just for the education purpose, well, the teaching people... The educational purpose is why would people commit what I have to acknowledge because I am faithful to the facts, massive atrocities on October 7th. Why did that happen? And I think that's the problem. The past is erased, and we suddenly went from 1948 to October 7th, 2023. And there is a problem there. So first of all, you have complete freedom to backtrack, and we'll go there with you. Uh, obviously, we can't cover every single year, every single event, but there's probably critical moments in time. Can I respond to something relating to that, the Lebanon War? I look at the book that he got this from, what the quote was from. Um, it sounds cold to say it, but war is tragic and civilians die. There is no war that this has not happened in, in the history of all of humankind. The statement that Israel might take care not to target civilians is not incompatible with a diary entry from someone who said they saw civilians getting killed. I think that sometimes we do a lot of weird games when we talk about international humanitarian law or laws that govern conflict, but we say things like civilians dying is a war crime or civilian homes or hospitals getting destroyed is necessarily a war crime or is necessarily somebody intentionally targeting civilians without making distinctions between military targets or civilian ones. I think that when we analyze different attacks, when we talk about the conduct of the military, I think it's important to understand, uh, it, like prospectively from the unit uh, of analysis of the actual military committing the acts what's happening and what are the decisions yeah. being made rather bro you cannot say that in defense of israel dude that's crazy like the the wildest part about this claim and i know where he's going with this because i remember him saying some dumb shit like this on fucking twitter is literally it, it is literally that like yes uh hamas literally did do war crimes and israel is not doing war crimes like if you put israel and hamas hamas which is a fucking militant resistance group against the israeli apartheid state if you were to put them and their fucking bathtub rockets and their bathtub fucking sniper rifles and all this other shit and and some uh arms that they get from iran right if you put them on the same playing field as a nuclear state with one of the strongest military forces in the fucking in the in the region at the same moral playing field Okay, Hamas still wins the morale on the morality front. It's crazy. It's crazy to be like, yeah, well, when Israel does it, it's actually not war crimes, but when Hamas does it, it actually is. It's crazy. Than just saying retrospectively, oh, well, a lot of civilians died, not very many, you know, military people died, comparatively speaking, so uh, it must have been war crimes, especially when you've got another side, um, I'll fast forward to Hamas, that intentionally attempts to induce those same civilian numbers because Hamas is guilty. Dude, come on. Uh, dude, dude, this is a ridiculous fucking argument. Like, the notion that Israel is not intentionally killing civilians is so psychotic. It's just literally a, a doctrinal principle that they have not only to kill civilians but intentionally killing their own fucking civilians when they are taken hostage they have the dahia doctrine which is ironic because uh big dog actually served in the idf uh, at the time i didn't even know that you have the dahia doctrine which dictates that you hit civilian targets okay no holds barred 
and you even have the fucking Hannibal Doctrine, which implies that you can even kill your own fucking ho uh, you can kill your own civilians, your own citizens, in an effort to make sure that they are not taken hostage by the enemy. There is no world in which like Israel's actions do not fit the bill of like genuine serialized mechanized murder it does no matter how hard you try to uh justify it and claim that it, that is not the case and the world can see it too of any war crime that you would potentially accuse and this is according to amnesty international people that norm loves to cite hamas is guilty of all of these same war crimes of them failing to take care of the civilian population of them essentially utilizing human shields to try to fire rockets free from attacks essentially um, Essentially, yes. If, uh, as in, I'm just saying that, essentially, yeah. as in terms of how international law defines it, not how Amnesty International defines it, but Amnesty International describes Handle times of human shielding, but they don't actually apply the correct international legal standard. I don't know what's the correct I know, absolutely. international law. You no, have but, the correct. No, I absolutely You have the correct. I absolutely I, I think but, um, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, believe it or not, normal, the entire Geneva Convention is all on Wikipedia. It's a wonderful okay, website. You know but I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that on the Hamas side, there's an attempt to induce this type of military activity, attempt to induce civilian harm, that it's not just enough to say, like, well, here's a diary entry where a guy talks about how traffic is problem. I think the problem with your statement is that if you go back and listen to it, the first part of it is war is hell civilians die. It's, it's a fact of life. And, and, and you state that in a very factual matter. Then when you start talking about Hamas, all of a sudden you've discovered morality and you've discovered condemnation and you've discovered yeah. intent. And, and, and you are unfortunately far from alone in this. I'll give you, I'll give you, you know who for me is a perfect example. Well, wait, hold on. Just in a second, we don't need examples. So no, I, I, wait, the, the, the false equivalency of the two sides is astounding. When Hamas kills civilians in a surprise attack on October 7th, this isn't because they are attempting to target military targets and they happen to stumble into a giant festival of people that- Well, they did they happen got, to stumble into it. They did, but they, but, but, yeah, but, they did, but when they guess, stumbled yeah, into it, it wasn't an issue of trying to figure out a military target or not. They weren't failing in distinction. There wasn't a proportionality assessment done. It was just- Anyone that fucking claims that Israel is not deliberately targeting civilian infrastructure and civilians is either the dumbest person I've ever seen in my entire life, like straight up schizophrenic, delusional, okay? Or they are a bloodless propagandist. In the case of Destiny, it's a little bit of both, okay? Fucking, I love the, the optics lovers, dude. Schizophrenic in the sense that they are fucking hallucinating, not schizophrenia equals stupid. God, I hate being a fucking leftist. You know what? I'm going to fucking permaban you. That's it. I just, I hate it. This is why I hate it. I hate it so much. I hate it so fucking much. It is just like the worst group of individuals that you can ever fucking put together in so many circumstances where people just selfishly go, uh -huh, what about me? My own personal grievances. What about me? You're disingenuous. You're not an activist. You're not actually fucking, you know, portraying your cause of, of anti-ableism in an adequate way you're just fucking delusionally and selfishly bringing this up because you care about the optics above all that's it oh i hate it to kill civilians even the amnesty international in 2008 and in 2014 and even today will Look, i don't think there's, there's like i don't think you'll find anyone who will deny that hamas has targeted civilians sure. you gave the example but there's of, a difference because of suicide bombings uh during the second intifada i mean facts are facts sure but and, i'm and, saying that the hamas targeting of civilians is different than the incidental loss of life that occurs oh, when israel does how you know genocide is the intentional mass murder well, genocide is an entirely separate claim yeah right? but the idea that israel is not in the business of intentionally targeting civilians um i know that's what we're supposed to believe um but, but the historical record stands no, no, that very doesn't. clearly. I don't believe it does. You've written about well, When yourself. you say historical, do you mean like in the 40s to the 60s? Or do you mean like I, I over would the say past, the, like, from like... the 30s of the last century to the 20s of this century? I, I just like to make, you know, you the way the way you um, characterized it, I think the best example of that I've come across during this specific conflict is, is John Kirby, the White House spokesman. I've, I've named him Tears Tossed Around for a very good reason. Um, when he's talking about Palestinian civilian deaths, war is hell, you know, it's a fact of life, get used to it. When he was confronted, with Israeli civilian deaths on October 7th, he literally broke down but he in understood tears. That one is deliberate and one isn't. He understood that. No, that's what he tried to make us. No. Under oh, he understood that. Oh, Israel is just small being genociding. They're not deliberately killing fucking uh, just uh, 25,000 plus women and children. That's just a oopsie. Dude, I'm going to be honest with you. What? You try to defend Palestinians, yet you do nothing for them? You're so disingenuous to your values? Come on, bro. I know it's the top of the hour and you're trying to fucking do a ad break but come on come on come on i just clapped someone for way less than that don't do that <sighs> like i know it's coming please i, I have a headache dude I've been, I've been covering this shit for like six hours i can't believe it you've never had a whoops moment where you bombed the hospital no and i've certainly not had a whoops moment where i bombed every hospital like engaged in a siege in every hospital I've never really had a whoops moment where I just had UAV uh, drone sniper rifles that shoot at fucking old ladies leaving a church. Uh, I haven't done that either. 
I don't. I've never had a whoopsie moment where I have uh, artificial intelligence setting targets according to Israeli uh, investigators. I've just. I've never done those oopsies in the daisies. It's just so. It's like oops, tripped and fell. Thirty thousand dead. How did that happen? Yeah, I've never oopsie daisy disguised myself as a fucking doctor to enter a hospital in the West Bank and occupied. Uh, Palestinian territory to go and execute a dude that is literally in the hospital bed. Never had that one either. Yeah. yeah there's no... Oh God, I liked it so much more when they were discussing, like, history. But the moment that they moved over to, like, post-October 7, and he's engaging in, like, clear-cut genocide denial is just so gross, so disgusting, so monstrous, so fucking awful. You have no leg to stand on, man. It's, it's just sick. It's sickening. Oh. Oh, no, he, he's, he was speaking facts. The Hamas guys who attacked the kibbutzim, they, apart from the attacks on the military sites, when they attacked the kibbutzim, were out. This is like, an in, this is also a genuinely insane argument to present at face value. That like, October 7 is bad, okay? For the amount of civilians that were deliberately targeted and killed. But also, everything past that for the past five months is like, every living person in Gaza's life is fucking hell. And that's actually just a oopsie daisy. It's psychotic, dude. It's fucking psychotic. It is akin to Nazi Germany justifying the Holocaust because of the fucking Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the final solution specifically. And being like, oopsie, it just fucking happened like that. I don't know. They just kind of did that on their own. It blows my goddamn mind. Like, it is pure fascism. Both of these arguments are pure fascist arguments. Out to kill civilians, and they kill family after okay. family, house let's after house. Say, the Israeli say. attacks on Hamas installations you know better. and fight. Okay, you know don't better. know better. No, you don't know Israeli violence. Take. I did it already. I ran the fucking ad break. I ran it. Stop. Stop trying to fucking bait me already. I already ran the three minute ad break. Okay. I already. Well, I didn't actually run it, but I said I. I already did the debate. Uh, thank God. You know, um, you, no, you don't know. Israeli I know, pilots. Thank God. They uh, believe that they are killing Hamasniks. They're given certain I'm sure they objectives, and that's sure what they, they attack. It. And if the Hamas sure is hiding it. behind sure civilians, believe, civilians every die. Time they target, every that. time they target a kid, I'm sure they believe it's Hamas. They when they kid, yeah, when they, yeah, when they kill the four kids in the, on the, uh, they believe. Yeah, they I know they believe Hamas it, even though they were you know the that, side. You know, even though they were the side. You don't see the side. No, they saw it. Don't see the side. Let's leave it. Oh, I know what he's quoting. You've lied about this. You've lied about this. Those kids weren't just on the beaches as opposite articles. Those kids were literally coming out of a previously identified Hamas compound they had operated from. They literally said you can Mr. Google Borelli, it. with Mr. all due respect, Finkelsberg. with all due respect, yeah. you're such a fantastic moron. It's uh -huh. terrifying. That that wharf was filled with journalists. There were tens scores of journalists. That was an old fisherman's shack. What are you talking about? It's so painful. It's so painful to listen to this idiocy. And but to be clear, on the other side, you're <laughs> bro, bro, hit the. It's Hamas. Those journalists are Hamas. Why doesn't he hit the ha? He's just doing every uh, every other part of the Hasbara. Why doesn't he hit the Hamas? You're implying okay. that a strike was okayed okay. on the Israeli okay. side where they said we're just going to kill four Palestinians hey, hey, today for no hey, reason. Hey, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Right, right. Okay. Do you believe that? Tell the journalists. Do you think that they were out to kill more children? Here we go. We'll never answer that. I will answer the question. Pilots will out to kill more children. And it was a strike. That was a strike. That was a drone strike. That was a proof. All the other we're going to kill children. We're going to kill Palestinians. Yes, by the way, I do. Yes, I do. I do believe that Israel will deliberately kill four children. Why is that such a crazy, like, dude, when you have no argument and destiny certainly does not have a leg to stand on here, you literally resort to, oh my God, oh my God. Do you literally think Israel would kill four children? Deliberately target four children? Yes, dumbass. Of course they would. They've killed 15,000 children so far. Why the fuck wouldn't they target four more? How fucking clueless are you? What do you mean? Oh my God, I can't believe it. You would say that Israel would kill four children. Oh, the horror, the horror. The fuck do you mean? There is 0% chance anyone with fucking more than three synapses firing at the same goddamn time could believe this. Like there is no fucking way. It just blows my mind. Oh, I have a headache. Oh, big hat. Thank you for the 10 give the subs. Look at Benny Morris' face while talking about the four killed Palestinian children. He thinks this is all a joke. I mean, no, he's laughing because uh, Norm is cooking his boy here, <laughs> calling him a fucking fantastic idiot. I genuinely don't understand how you could say that. Like, do you? I want to see the comments. Do people think that this is like, you're such a fantastic moron, is terrifying?
Two historians, a journalist, and a video game streamer walk into a bar. You like to quote things? I do like to quote things. They're called facts. <laughs> He's literally so unable to believe that liberal democracy would go against liberal civility, not realizing that Israel's full-on fascist. Yeah, there is no... No, I don't think he fucking genuinely believes that Israel is, like, even remotely was liberal. Inbuilt. I think he just doesn't give a shit. Oh, fuck. Where was I? 246 or something? I'm like, I lost my spot here. Okay. The strike was okay on the Israeli okay. side. 246 13. Okay. I'm trying to see the. Finkelstein is such an asshole to Destiny. Oh. Oh. Destiny is like the kid in class who hates his teachers. <laughs> Never mentioned the Warsaw Uprising in relation to Palestine. You're a fucking idiot. Am I? It's, it's really crazy because you know who actually first mentioned the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and made a comparison to October 7? It was actually Norm Finkelstein who did that. He's on this. He's in the conversation right now. Um, I don't know if you know this, but his parents literally participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I don't care that you don't care. Okay? I think it's a very valid comparison to make because Gaza is a ghetto. It makes you feel bad because you don't want to feel like Palestinians are humans, but they are. And you can't really, you can't keep pushing. Yeah, see, mods are fucking you guys up for adding the one guy that I pulled up. He is a R word that can only quote other people and has no opinions. What? Is this the new line from Destiny's Dick Riders? That that's his new line to defend himself? And is is uh ritualistic humiliation that happened here, sitting in the fucking cuck chair like he's Sneeko? My man got Sneekoed in this fucking debate. That's the new bar you guys got? Oh man, he only knows how to quote people. Oh shit, dude. Imagine getting fucking owned by a dude who only knows how to quote people, I guess. You know. The Warsaw Uprising was made by Zionist movement Hasamar Hitzair. Nice to see you are support Zionism. I don't know if you know this, okay? But there were plenty of people who became, like, Zionists after uh, World War II. Plenty of Jews that were Zionists after World War II. That doesn't mean that, like, their actions during World War II were wrong, you know? This is the fuck? What a take. Very odd. This is also Bund Erasure. Yeah, it was Jewish socialist too. But like, but, but listen, but listen, listen, listen. Do you think I think that automatically if like a dude who uh, died in the Holocaust was like, if they were Zionist, then they were, they deserved it. Is that what you think I would say in this situation? Because that would be insane. Like you ascribed a value that I, uh, that is so far beyond uh, the, the point of comprehension that I, I don't even know how to address it. Side where they said we're just going to support said, Palestinians hey, for today for no hey, reason. Hey, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Right, right. Okay. Do you believe that? Do you think that they will tell children? Here we go. We'll never answer. I will answer the question. Pilots will out. I will even answer. Morons. That was a strike. That was a drone strike. That was a proof. All the other chains are going to kill children. Okay. Do you want me to answer or do you want your motor mouth to go? Okay. Answer. Motor mouth. In 2018, there was the Great March of Return in Gaza. By all reckonings of human rights organizations and journalists who were there, it was overwhelmingly nonviolent. It was by the Hamas. Wait, whoever organized it's organized it, by it was, Satan. Let's start. Satan. Okay, okay, Hamas. Okay, no, it's Satan. Yeah. I agree. Let's oh, no. You know it was bad when he couldn't react to you anymore because it's too irritating? Oh, no. He closed the stream by saying he can't continue to watch because it's too irritating? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that boy got so cooked. Oh, Jesus. Why did he think he could go up against fucking Norm Finkelstein? God damn. Damn, son. That's where all that confidence gets you at the end of the goddamn day. Oh, oh, just sitting in the fucking Sneeko chair and eating it. Yeah, he needs to go. He needs to go yell at like uh, furry accounts, uh, furry leftist accounts on Twitter to, to fucking rebalance him. You know, it's like a tune up fight. You know, when a fighter loses, there's a tune up fight. We've talked about this before with Sneeko. He, he's got to do a tune up fight to get his. <laughs> he just got knocked down. <laughs> Uh, no, I know he, he meant watching my stream. He's like very frustrated watching my stream, watching uh, Norm Finkelstein just absolutely fucking destroying him. He gets Twitter on a second monitor and is crying at the thousands of likes every tweet laughing at him is getting. Yeah. Oof. Your last cuck chair comment got to him. I just want to know why D is in this conversation. He's in this conversation because he would bring eyeballs. He was supposed to do this debate with Norm originally, and he's friends with Lex. And also... I think he's the perfect person to to have on to defend. Mr. Bennell, 
don't change the subject. If you don't know what you're talking it's not about, about at least you say, have the view, curious, at least have the humility. Two, you talk how, about how close chapter has two, four, two gotten, You don't know how, chapter how close six. has two four two gotten know to the Palestinians six peace. From tweet five, you have no idea what you're talking about. It's just so embarrassing. Mm -hmm. At least have some humility. Between us, we've read maybe ten thousand books on the topic, and you've read two. Wikipedia entries, and you start talking about chapter six. Do you know what chapter seven is? Answer me. Answer you know, Mr. <laughs> oh! Oh! Dude, dude, wait, wait, no, wait. Is Benny Morris laughing at him? He's laughing at him. Bro, yo, I didn't even get to that Mr. part. Even fucking Benny Morris is laughing. Oh, no. Oh, that's so bad. No, how, how close six. has 242 two gotten to the Palestinians for peace? From tweet. Oh, ain't no way. Ain't no way. He had his teammate going. He's like, damn, dog, he's cooking you. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he, got ben, he got Benny to turn around and be like, actually, honestly, I'm an anti-Zionist. I take out. <laughs> oh, that's so bad. Oh, how much did he cope to fucking massage the narrative before this interview came out to be like, hey, guys, don't watch the interview. <laughs> oh, that's so bad. Oh, he said it was entirely just Norm reading quotes. Yeah, Benny Morris's quotes. Benny Morris is the historian in question who's sitting across from him. That's so funny that there that, that, that was his copium. That, oh, he's just read quotes. Given his... StarCraft 2 career, he should be pretty accustomed to trying to play in the big leagues and getting humbled. I don't even know what this reference is. I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure it's hurtful. If I only understood what that was, I would, I would laugh, but I don't know. Imagine thinking using references as an academic historian is a diss. Yeah, I don't understand. Why is he not, why is he not just like opening up pages on Wikipedia? Why is he quoting stuff? Five. You have no idea what you're talking about. It's just so embarrassing. Uh -huh. At least have some humility. Between us, we've read maybe 10,000 books on the topic, and you've read two Wikipedia entries, and you start talking about chapter six. Do you know what chapter seven is? Answer me. Answer you know, Mr. Bunnell. Mr. Bunnell. <laughs> you also kept calling him like Bunnery or whatever throughout the process, too. Oh, this must be what his audience feels like when they clip you out of context. I understand their happiness now. I mean, but this isn't even out of context, really. Is he going to write another manifesto crying about this? Mr. Bunnell. Uh, what is this? Okay, what the fuck I think is happening? He's a binary fallacy and what? Mr. Bunnelli, I forget your name. I don't think you can read. Oh, Jesus. That's good. Oh, man, that's bad. Oof. Or two. Bro, he took the jacket off. He took the fucking. Did you read the case? Yeah. Uh, it is Mr. a highly Pirelli, special intent. I'm going to ask you again. Genocide. Yes. Please stop displaying your imbecility. Okay. I'm do sorry not, if you think do, the declaration do, of the judge is imbecility. Every new clip, bro. Every new clip. Every new clip. Norm is calling him a different last name. Every clip. Mr. Borelli, <laughs> you are an imbecile of the highest order. He's Mr. Bonatello. It's like that doesn't, that's not even a name, Norm. Norm, where did you come up with Bonatello? <laughs> Mr. Bocelli, I'll have you know. Oh. Uh. Uh, why won't you call out Norm for being a debate pervert? It's so funny that you said that because I have said it before. I have mentioned that he is like a debate pervert of the highest magnitude. If anyone did this to you, you'd be on fire. Yeah, I would be very upset. But it's actually awesome when it's being done to someone that I dislike intensely, especially because they're defending genocide. Thank you for recognizing that, I guess. Like, is this a brilliant observation? Yeah. Yeah, no, you, yeah. Are you, are you, do you think there's inconsistency here? No, I'm very honest about this. Chatter, he started off the debate by saying, Norm is a principled practice debate pervert. Yeah, he is. The cope, his reply is even worse. Norm Twinklestein is easily one of the most unserious people I've ever had the misfortune of speaking with. I hope his reading comprehension improves in the future. It's sad that he brags about reading so much when he's apparently only capable of thinking in single quotes. Oh, that's so sad. Oh. His reply, he, we must have spent two hours 
of this convo wasted with Norm trying to cite Benny's own quotes from his own books at him, constantly misunderstanding the context of what he was even saying and acting smugly about it the entire time. Unreal. <sighs> Bro, someone needs to do a, a, a wellness check on the boy. He is fucking cooked on that copium. This is like pure, unadulterated Chinese fentanyl coming over the fucking border by an American citizen that chopped up his car and put the fucking fentanyl directly in the body of the car to evade the Customs and Border Patrol in order to directly traffic this copium into his house. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> the Omni Borelli, Mr. Bonarello. <laughs> Oof. Oof. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget that like uh, the ultimate debate pervert is like, I mean, okay, this is not funny. The other day I participated in a debate with Israeli professor Benny Morris and that thing called destiny. They mocked the notion that Gaza was a virgin on a famine. This is not as funny because then, then we get back to like the real world and the genocide that he's defending. And I'm all of a sudden angry again. Oh, I just don't understand. Like when you have like, this is, this is like a, like a, what, what happened here is basically like a Wikipedia autist going up against like the raid boss of of having rain man level of knowledge on everything that has happened in gaza like a stone turns in gaza in like 1984 and it's in a book that motherfucking norm finkelstein wrote about how that stone turned and the impact of it and it's like why would you like what did you think was going to happen there is no amount of wikipedia pages you can read this dude cooked Alan Dershowitz, like tenured Harvard professor, debate pervert, Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> Mr. Botticelli. <laughs> Ridiculous argument. Because, oh, really? That it's impossible at the command level. It's impossible at the command so. level. But you said that they couldn't have done it at the bottom if it weren't also you at the top. You don't understand so, the strength oh, of the I claim that you're please. making. You're with saying that from respect, a top-down level that lawyers, multiple commanders, and all these people signed off on killing not tell me what I don't understand. for Palestinians. It's true. Children. It's true. I don't spend my nights on Wikipedia. I read books. I admit that as a, a signal. Yeah, as, 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 as a, I mean, he says you read Wikipedia. Come on, dude. He goes, Mr. Botticelli is reading Wikipedia and he's fucking laughing. Oh no, oh, 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 what the fuck? Dude, dude, <laughs> look at his face defeated. <laughs> oh, Benny Moore is cracking. Isn't he laughing at Norm? Don't they hate each other? Listen, in my head canon, he's laughing with Norm, okay? Destiny said it was a waste of time reading books in that clip. Oh. Oh, uh, dude, no one can ever shit on Lex Friedman ever again on this broadcast for as long as I, as long as I remain a live streamer. Do you understand me? He gave us a gift. He gave all of us a gift, a brief moment of solace to laugh and, and enjoy in a sea of, of death, desolation, destruction. Like at first I was like, why the fuck did he have this dude on with like actual academics, right? And now I'm realizing that was a, that was excellent. That was an excellent decision. They just fucking use him as like the applause break. You know what I mean? As an, as a pressure valve every now and then he just like chimes in and he's like, ah, actually, <laughs> actually, you don't understand what Israel is doing. Ethnic cleansing. It's good. But when Palestine is actually resisting against an apartheid state, it's bad. And then, and then he's just like, he rips into him. He slaps him around a little bit. Even Benny's laughing. You know what I mean? Everyone's having like, he is the Jar Jar Binks of the conversation. Oh, the Bonatello memes going hard as fuck. Oh, you know when your childhood friend meets your current friends and they embarrass you? This is how Lex is feeling right now. No, Lex is fucking eating this because he's like, oh my God, I'm going to get like 10 million views on this fucking debate. Yeah, absolute cinema peak. He should have turned around and been like, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bonaldo, go back to your iPad to find a new wikipedia page to read maybe perhaps you will find a new talking point in there <laughs> i know books are a waste of time with all due regard well, there I, 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 yeah. I completely respect the fact and i'll say it on the air as much as i find totally disgusting what's come of your politics a lot of the books are excellent 
and I'll even tell you because I'm not afraid of saying it. Whenever I have to check on a basic fact, the equivalent of going to the Britannica, I go to your books. I know you got a lot of the facts right. Benny Moore's books I would never, listener. I would never say. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's 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 repping he's repping fucking Benny Morris's like academic work. He doesn't agree with his. That's what I was trying to explain as well in the beginning of this conversation, which is why it's like so gross when you see a dude like that who has actually the the academic bona fides fucking sitting there and being like, yeah, a genocide occurred on October seven, and also everything post October seven is like, you know. It's just, it's just crazy. It does shock me to see someone who has like reckoned with the facts, arrive at the worst conclusions, and then get swept up in like insane amounts of propaganda. Whenever Face Finkel, aka Face Footnote, starts off with the all due respect, you know he's gonna invent the new Italian surname. Yeah, nationalism is one hell of a drug, dude. It's crazy. There are plenty of racist academics. Yeah, but like. You know what this would be like? It would be like if uh, if someone who has done, like, tremendous anthropological work on, like, African civilization turning around and then being like, and that's why skull science is real, and that's why Africans are made to be servile. You know what I mean? That's the problem. It's like there is a mismatch of, like, there's a, there's a, there's a mismatch of, like, genuine good work followed up by, like, really bad... Um, really bad uh, assessments. So literally every early anthropologist, yeah, I guess, but it's not, we're not living in the early anthropologist era. So it's weird. It's like Darwin arriving at creationism. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get back to it. Let's, let's go for the big one. The big medulla. It's Satan. Okay. Overwhelmingly organized, overwhelmingly nonviolent. Resemble at the beginning the first bombs here and the there. first they they represent the first yeah. Okay, not bombs. But they let's try to make okay. holes in the space. Okay, okay, obviously. Let's continue. Bro, he's just like so, fucking but I'm playing not with his phone in the corner. Okay, okay. okay. No, 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 I, I, okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm willing to grant please, you that. Please, please. I'm willing allow to me, allow me to. You don't have to pursue this. Okay. Okay. Allow me, allow me to finish. I don't know anything about this. I'd like to. Okay. I gotta pee. I'll be back. As you know, along the Gaza perimeter, there was Israel's best trained snipers. Correct? I don't know best trained. There were snipers. Fine. Snipers. Okay. All right. Yeah, because, like, hey, laugh. It's hilarious. The story's so funny. You're lying about it. There's so much funny. aspects okay. of violence to it. Okay. Okay. What even the UN okay. says it themselves. Okay. 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 <laughs> but you only select what the UN you're, says that you like. See, the problem, Mr. Morelli, is you don't know the ling English language. You don't I can read from the UN Mr. website Did itself. I say, in the Great March of Please stop what you're saying. While the vast majority of protesters have acted in a peaceful manner, during most protests, dozens have approached the fence attempting to damage it, burning fires, throwing stones, and Molotov cocktails towards Israeli forces, applying incendiary kites and balloons into Israeli territory. The latter result in extensive damage to agricultural land and nature reserves inside Israel and risk the lives of Israeli civilians. Some instances of shooting and explosives are also Talk fast, talk fast. I'm just trying to think that you're coherent. I'm just reading from the UN. Yeah, but you think you like the guidelines. I agree with you. You got the months wrong. You got the months wrong. We're talking about the beginning in March 30th, 2018. You just described that March okay, is mostly peaceful. Okay, allow me to finish. So there were the snipers, okay? Now you'll find it so far-fetched. Israelis purposely, deliberately targeting civilians? That's such a far-fetched idea. An overwhelmingly non-violent march. What did the international what investigation- the was a campaign. Yeah, which whatever you want to call it. For months. Whatever you want to call for it. months. Yeah. What did the UN investigation find? Well, he just read it. it. I read the report. I don't read things off of those machines. I read the report. What did it find? Brace yourself. You thought it was so funny, the idea of IDF uh, targeting civilians. It found, go look this up on your machine. I already know what you're going to say. You're going to say it found only children, one or two of them were targeted, children, killings. targeted journalists, targeted medics. And here's the funniest one of all. It's so hilarious. They targeted disabled people who were 300 meters away from the fence and just standing by trees. This is true. If, if it's true. true. Mm -hmm. Wait, uh, just quick pause. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everything was fascinating to listen to except the mention of hilarious. Nobody finds any of this mm -hmm. hilarious. And if any of us are laughing, it's not at the suffering of civilians or suffering of anyone. It's at the uh, the obvious joyful camaraderie in the room. So I'm I'm enjoying it and also the joy of learning. So thank you. Can we talk about the targeting civilian thing a little bit? I think there's... If you didn't hear that, you should rewind it for you. It was all timer. No, I, I heard it, but um, he... he Lex is like trying to protect him a little bit. He called him Mr. Morelli. Yeah. Lex is like, oh, no, he doesn't think it's hilarious. Like, I mean, he does. He's not a good guy. Okay. He is a piece of shit. He is like, Lex follows, I assume, Destiny on fucking Twitter. I don't even fucking follow. I block Destiny on Twitter. And even I know what kind of humor he is drawn out of Israel's genocide. So the notion, the notion that, uh, Lex follows him on a subreddit. Oh, dude, it's it, he knows. He knows exactly how humorous Destiny finds this entire thing. Come on. 
there's like an important uh, underlying, yeah. not necessarily that I just, I think it's important to understand. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important to understand there's like three different things here that we need to think about. So one is a policy of killing civilians. Do we, so I would ask the other side, I'll, I'm going to ask all three because I know there won't be a short answer. Do you think there's a policy top down from the IDF to target civilians? That's one thing. Yeah. A second thing is, he is says yes, when I, yeah, sure, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Answer. But then, then the second thing is, or there's, there's two distinctions I want to draw between. I think Benny would say this, I would say this. Um, I'm sure undoubtedly there have been cases where IDF soldiers for no good reason have targeted and killed Palestinians that they should not have done. That would be prosecutable as war crimes as defined by drone statute. Some have been prosecuted. Yeah, and, and I'm absolutely sure. Oh, well, well, practically yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Practically I'm sure that we would all agree for soldiers that that happens. But I think that it's bros doing the a few bad apples argument here, which is crazy. Finkelstein said it was hilarious. He's talking about Finkelstein Lamau. Wait, did I? You want me to go back on the on the point? I thought Finkelstein was being sarcastic, like he was saying that it's like implying that Destiny finds it hilarious. Because Destiny was laughing. I wasn't even in the room and I understood that. Are you, am I to understand that me being outside of the room, I have better, wait, I have a better understanding of the situation than this chatter who was watching the fucking video in here? Yeah, that's not what happened, bro. Destiny has been glib and mocking and sarcastic this entire time as he's talking about fucking atrocities. To which he responded with, oh, you think this is like, oh, this is hilarious. It's civilians every died. Time they target, every that. time they target a kid, I'm sure they believe it's Hamas. They when they kid, yeah, when they, yeah, when they kill the four kids in the, on the, oh, uh, they believe yeah, they I know they believe it. Even though they were you a diminutive that, side, you know, even though they were yeah, a diminutive side, you don't yeah, see the yeah, 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 no, they saw it. Let's, let's leave it aside. Oh, I know what he's going to say. You've lied about this particular instance in the past. Those kids weren't just on the beach. Wait, hold on. This is, I went too far back. Things of human rights organizations and journalists who were there. It was overwhelmingly oh, okay. organized, overwhelmingly nonviolent. Resembled at the beginning the, the first, bombs here and the there. first Intifada. This clip is the exact moment a snipers. chatter linked to before. Correct. I don't know best trade. Oh, snipers. Fine. Snipers. Okay. All right. <laughs> because yeah, you can literally hear him laugh, bro. Hey, laugh. It's hilarious. The story's so funny. You're lying about it. So much yeah. You can hear him laugh. He's being sarcastic in his addressing. Literally just rewind. That's not what happened, bro. Brother. Okay. I'm going to be honest. We have tone indicators for chatter such as yourself, but as someone who wasn't even in the room who could pick up on the context, I suspect that maybe you should listen to someone who does have the physical capacity of understanding context. If you just are that permanently unable to read it, okay? You were in the room, you were watching, I was out of the room and I was listening and I, even I could tell what the actual context was. You, on the other hand, are physically unable to do so. So if that's the case, I'm giving you the tone indicator. Okay, I'm giving you the tone indicator. That's crazy. What is happening here? No disrespect, chatter. If you legitimately can't comprehend it, like you, if you have like a physical inability to understand sarcasm, satire, nuance in general, then like I'm trying to help you out here. I don't understand why this is so difficult for you to comprehend. Half the time, it's like me trying to educate chatters on fucking nuance. And by the way, there's plenty of people with autism in this community, and they are getting it. So, you know, there's a, that's a you thing, it seems. They the first, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, not bombs. Okay. Funny. Yeah, it's snipers. Fine. Snipers. Okay, all right? <laughs> because, <laughs> hey. Yeah, he's la he, There you go. There, he, if you wanted to see the actual moment with his face. Laugh. It's hilarious. The story is so funny. You're lying about it. It's so much funny. It's aspects okay. of violence to it. Okay. Okay. even the UN okay. says it okay. themselves. Okay. 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 Yeah. You get it? You understand? Ban that chatter? No, I'm I'm not gonna ban that chatter. Maybe he is genuinely uh, incapable of of seeing it. He laughed after reading about a starving refugee being shot and run over. Recently divorced Wait, genocide apologist can barely contain his laughter at a starving refugee being shot then run over. But Israeli troops opened fire on a crowd of hungry Palestinians pulling boxes of flour and canned food off aid trucks, scattering the crowd. When the shooting stopped, one witness said the Palestinians returned to the trucks and the soldiers opened fire again, wounding him in his leg, which was subsequently run over by a vehicle. I'm sorry. Dude, this is literally just like for people who think being a sociopath is cool, like just cultivating an entire audience of just fucking Patrick Bateman uh, lovers, I think. Everything he does is a performance for his audience of shitty people. Yeah. Like, if you find this to be content, then, you know, if you find this to be content, then, you know, there there might be something wrong with you. He literally has a child. You literally cannot mathematically calculate a worse person. Oh, yeah, 100%. According to the local... I don't know how he evades the kick streamer scrutiny that, like, most other kick streamers get on a regular basis for behaving like this all the fucking time. Dude got stuck in his 2012 edgelord phase. Yeah. 
So I legitimately don't know the context here, who that person is or why they're bad. Bro, what are you talking about? He just laughed at a fucking Palestinian person. Uh, I think it was a, a reading an article about, because when anybody calls him out, his fans dox them. Yeah, well, they can't dox everybody. But you only select what the UN says you like. See, the problem, Mr. Morelli, is you don't know the English language. You don't I can read from the UN website itself. In regards to the Great March, they said the vast majority of protesters have acted in a peaceful manner. Listen to most protests, doesn't have a... Yeah, he was laughing at the flower massacre. Okay. I don't know. Quick pause. Mm -hmm. really on good. Palestine, okay. there's, there's two distinctions I want to draw between. I think Benny would say this. I would say this. Um, I'm sure, undoubtedly, there have been cases where IDF soldiers, for no good reason, have targeted and killed Palestinians that they should not have done. That would be prosecutable as war crimes, as defined by the Russian Some have been prosecuted. Yeah, and, and I'm absolutely you, sure. Oh, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. You I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure that we would all agree for soldiers that that happens. But I think that it's important. I think that it's important that when we talk about military strikes, or we talk about things especially involving bombings or drone attacks, these are things that are signed off by multiple different layers of command, by multiple people involved in an operation, including intelligence gathering, including weaponeering, and there also have typically lawyers involved. When you make the claim that an IDF soldier shot uh, a Palestinian, those three people, the three hostages that came up with white flags, because something horrible happened, I think that's a fair statement to make, and I think a lot of criticism is deserved. But when you make the statement that four children were killed by a strike, Notice that he's only fucking ascribing blame to Israel when Israel itself says, yeah, we fucked up. In every other circumstance, Israel says, no, we actually thought that they were Palestinian militants. He's like, well, you know, uh, in that situation, then, then, uh, yeah, Israel is right. Israel is right all the time. Israel is never wrong. When Israel admits fault, then he agrees. If Israel doesn't admit fault, then I'm going to take everything they said at face value. And I don't know. I don't know if he's doing this genuinely because he like, I don't know, uh, radicalized himself or negatively polarized himself into like legitimately thinking that Israel is not a fascist apartheid ethno state and actually a liberal democracy, whatever the fuck that means. Or if he's just like pure contrarian. Right. The claim Deliberate. that you're making, yeah. The, cl yes. the claim that you're making, the claim that you're making is that multiple levels of the IDF. Son yeah, his argument isn't even that it didn't happen. It's just that, no, I know them. They're a good guy. They wouldn't do that regardless of how many times it has happened. Off I never, on just I, killing. I have no idea what. That's the way that you don't understand the process. Then let me educate oh, you. you. I, can tell you. I do understand process. the process. I'm telling you. You're, I'm trying to explain you right now. Idea. Yes. I'm, no, I'm you're basically like not anybody talking about. Aside from Wikipedia, you can, can you tell me what your knowledge of the idea is? You can talk to people who work in the military. What's your knowledge of the idea? The audience can look this up. No, I, you're basic military. Really, you can ask anybody to talk about. Aside from Wikipedia, you can, can yes, you tell you can me what your knowledge people, of the idea is? You can talk to people who work Wikipedia, in the military. What's your knowledge of the you know idea? The audience can look this up. Do you this conversation was infinitely more productive and actually better when it was like Benny Moore is talking. Now that it like it has turned into it, it, it turned into a fuck fest. It turned into a fuck fest when uh when when like at least Benny is wrong and says a lot of immoral shit. But he has like a level of respect for for academic integrity. You know what I mean? He has a level of respect for for people's like scholarly work and isn't isn't just like regurgitating talking points that he uh picked from reading a fucking Wikipedia page. Um so it just, it sucks. By the way, this conversation between Norm and Destiny is literally part of the reason, other than his psychotic, sycophantic fan base constantly fucking stalking my uh, every existence for years and years, is part of the reason why I never debate him any longer, because it always resorts into this back and forth shouting match, because when Destiny doesn't have a good argument, he just immediately resorts to trying to trigger his opponent into an emotional response and if he fucking knows deep down inside that there's a lot of baggage there or there's a lot of like back and forth with our uh, back and forth in the past or with Norm where he knows he's like he can't go up against Norm. Norm is just simply more knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable on this issue. OK, he is going to he's going to start nuking the debate. To be fair, Norm isn't helping either. He's resorting to ad-homs. Yeah, no, he is. He's a stubborn dude in the same way uh, that I am as well. So he's just like yelling back and forth now. Do you I, think that? Do you think that? Do you think that bombing and strikes are decided by one person in the field? Do you think one person? Can is I respond to every strike? Strike? Tell you, as a pilot doesn't do it. On yes, his strike own. cells have entire apparatuses fire. that are designed to figure out how to strike and who to strike. So when you say that four fire. children are targeted, fire. you're saying that a hey, whole apparatus is trying to murder four Palestinians. He's trying to. Okay, if I'm going to make serious analysis here, he is Mr. Bonarello is basically trying to reduce all of the academic work, all of the NGOs that have like consistently covered Israel's genocidal actions into one strike against four Palestinian children as though 15,000 Palestinian children have not been fucking murdered by Israel in the past four or five months. 
that would make anyone go insane. Okay. It's just ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thing to say in the face of like an overwhelming sea of information while they're having this conversation. I suspect around 50 Palestinians were killed in this fucking duration over the five hour period. You know what I mean? I don't know when they exactly had this conversation, but it's not statistically impossible to make that assertion. Like that's, that's why this is a ridiculous conversation to have. Like we're not just talking about one singular strike of, of four children being killed. While we were watching this, people were talking in the chat about how uh, there were another 50 Palestinians that were shot at waiting for aid in Gaza. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't like looked into it. But there were people in the chat saying that. Now, I don't know if this is what happened so far. I haven't seen it. And I will read it. And I will cover it tomorrow, most likely. I've never seen his community so mad. They're actively trying to get you banned for watching this, lol. I know. I know. It won't work. Because he's not the focal point of this conversation. And also on top of that, I'm like taking all of the necessary precautions beyond that too. He's building the argument upon the assertion that across the entire Israeli command, one guy might object to murdering children and therefore an, it's an oopsie and justified. You will read what? Some tweets. This is the maximum amount of copium that we will get to. Once again, where are they trying to ban you? Show it. Um, mass reporting for ban evasion. I'm sure the people that are pointing that out are probably in the fucking same uh, either Discord or, or chat rooms that they're trying to do. Anyway, we're going to continue with the video. You make my argument better than me. Ridiculous argument. Because, oh, Man. really? That it's impossible at the command level. It's impossible at the command impossible. level. But you said that they couldn't have done it at the bottom if it weren't also you at the top. To, you don't understand so, the strength oh, of the I claim that you're please. making. You're with saying that from respect, a top-down level that all lawyers, all multiple all commanders, respect, and all these people Bernal, signed off on not tell me what I don't understand. Or Palestinians. It's true. Children. It's true. I don't spend my nights on Wikipedia. I read books. I admit that as a, a signal. Waste of time. Yeah, <laughs> as, 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 as time. I know, books are. He one hundred percent is laughing at a him. waste of time. With all due regard, well, there. Well, you they are. The only I, thing you take from them are two or three quotes I that you use. Respect, people, yeah. I completely respect the fact, and I'll say it on the air. As much as I find totally disgusting what's come of your politics, a lot of the books are excellent, and I'll even tell you because I'm not afraid of saying it. Whenever I have to check on the base. Oh, they're uh, they're trying to get me banned here. When remember when someone asked where are they trying to get you banned? Turns out it's on LSF. Destiny calls out the hypocrisy of Twitch immediately. Thirty seven minutes ago, I haven't even watched the clip, but I suspected something along the lines of I can't believe Twitch hypothetically bans everyone for watching videos of me. But in this circumstance, they're not banning Hassan, who's watching a video of me. No, dog, you're in the video. You are not the focal point of the video. The terms of service on that are relatively clear. It is pretty funny to be like, I'm such a fucking toxic person that like this platform banned me. Why won't they ban the person for watching a video with three professionals discussing ongoing geopolitical conflict because I happen to be in the frame being a fucking dumbass, being the Jar Jar Binks of uh, the comedic relief of the, the, the three actual knowledgeable people discussing a matter of geopolitical interest man yeah i'm sure xqc uh is never brought up in this conversation when he watches destiny videos all the time <laughs> huh. oh, i'm not going to show you the meme okay you don't deserve it no enough basic fact the equivalent of going to the britannica i go to your books I know you got a lot of them. It's so funny because his fan base originally came in here to be like, why are you covering him? Why are you covering him? Is it because you're scared? Come on, show us him. And then fucking, and now are turning around and being like, look, see, he's watching him. Please ban him, Twitch. So fast. The fact's right. Benny Moore's books I would for never, the listener. I would never say books are a waste of time. And it's regrettable to you that you got strapped with a partner who thinks that all the wisdom, time. all, all the, the wisdom. No, he didn't say they're yeah. a waste of time. I, I'd like to respond yes, to what you were saying. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think the question that, that we're trying to answer, I, I think, think you don't understand Israel, you know, I, uh, Neither let me, let me finish. Really please. understands Israel. I think we're now all, it works. I think we're all agreed yeah. that Palestinians have deliberately targeted 
civilians, whether we're talking about Hamas and Islamic Jihad today or I previously. Word, I prefer the word murdered and raped rather than targeted. Target is too soft oh, for what the it. Hamas did. I'm okay. With I'm that. not. I'm not talking about. I'm um, talking about this now. Yeah, but I'm. I'm trying to answer his question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, historically, there is um, substantial evidence that Palestinians have targeted uh, civilians. Whether whether it's been incidental or systematic is a different discussion. I don't want to get into that now. For some reason, there seems to be a huge debate about whether. Any Israeli has ever sunk so low as, as to target a civilian. I don't no, we've How does it feel to be irrelevant outside of your little insignificant bubble? I'm happy. Why are you making my bubble larger? I, I want to be left alone by the likes of you, man. I, I swear to God, I'm being really, I'm being for real with you, angry badger. Why so angry? I want you to be a happy badger. Okay? That's what I want. Like, think about that. You took time out of your day to come in here to write that in this chat as a previous subscriber too. Do you think that this is good for your own mental health? Actually, take a deep breath. Let's do it together. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. In your eyes, I want to be irrelevant. I want you to never think about me. Because for two reasons. One, out of self-interest, of course. But more importantly... I want you to never think about me because it upsets you, okay? Just take a deep breath, visualize, and think of a world where you don't actually, where you don't actually have me occupying any space in your mind, okay? I promise, I promise you will be happier. <sighs> Go to your happy place. Breathe in, breathe out. Take breaths from your nose, breathe out. It will be better for you overall. But while you're here, if you will stay here for the duration, please be nice, especially at the top of the hour when there's a three-minute ad break coming. I don't want you to see the ad. So I want you to subscribe for $5 or for free to avoid seeing the ads at the top of the hour. <laughs> oh, that's right. I want you to have an ad-free broadcasting experience. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Big huh. Thank you for the 10 gifted subs. Lily the Chaos God. Thank you for the five gifted subs. Agree, both we just agreed. I've just said that, that this has happened happen. here. And okay, there. and I think we've agreed on okay. that. Okay, I think um, what we're saying is it's not policy, which is what you guys okay. are implying that they kill civilians deliberately. If I understand you correctly, okay, um, let's let's just uh, completely dispel this uh, rumor, this this notion, this false statement that Israel is is oblivious to the death and destruction it is causing. Okay. Israel knows what it's doing. Israel has a clear cut policy, a doctrine called the Dahia Doctrine, that dictates that civilian targets will be deliberately, like civilian buildings will be deliberately targeted. Okay. 972 Magazine, which is an Israeli magazine, went further and actually investigated this last siege, this last mowing of the lawn operation that they've engaged in where more than 30,000 people have been murdered by Israeli rockets and found that they had three specific, three different tiers of targets, including, but not limited to, civilian targets that they deliberately take down, okay? Their rules of engagement are death and destruction. The notion like I said, and I stand on this, the notion that Israel is not actually genuinely trying to wipe out the Palestinians and simply on accident killing more than 25,000 women and children. This is before we even get to the civilian men that are also being killed that are not Hamas, right? If you personally think that Israel has accidentally killed 25,000 plus women and children, you are either the dumbest person on the planet or you are just straight up evil they call those power targets which means their targeting of civilian buildings is intentional collective punishment which is a war crime yes absolutely <laughs> yes the intentional displacement of two million plus people and the catastrophic famine that the people of gaza are currently withstanding is a war crime it is collective punishment it is evil it is straight fascist okay I cannot understand how people try to defend this. It is not 
an accident, it is perfectly deliberate. And even if it wasn't perfectly deliberate, even if it was an accident, it would still be criminal negligence. You're basically making the claim that none of these attacks could have happened without going through an entire chain of command. For strike cells that are involved in like drone attacks yes. or plane attacks yes. or yes. My understanding yes. of the Israeli military, and you could perhaps, um, you've served in it, you would know better, it's actually a fairly chaotic organization. No, no, that's not true. Especially not the Air Force. Extremely, extremely organized. The Air Force well, works in a very organized fashion. Oh, as he says, with lawyers. I don't think, I don't think he understands. I don't think Benny understands because he's too hopped up on the Zionist Kool-Aid that like saying the Israeli Air Force is incredibly organized after on the eve of like, again, an ICJ investigation into Israel's genocidal intent in the eve of 25,000 plus murdered women and children makes you sound like a psycho. It just means they're well organized in bombing civilian infrastructure. Like this, I get why Zionists make this argument because they've always made this argument. They made this argument in every single siege. Okay. Every single siege, they've made this argument. But the death toll was, at least in the eyes of the broader public, somewhat more avoidable, okay? Especially when there wasn't, like, a lot of media coverage on it, okay? They literally just came up with a bullshit AI targeting program called The Gospel that Israeli journalists just expose, uh, exposed as blatantly indiscriminate. I don't think it's indiscriminate. I think it's discriminate. I think they are discriminately indiscriminate. Like, they are deliberately targeting anything and everything, including civilian targets. That's it. Like the AI doesn't make it, uh, the AI doesn't make it better. A chain of command and ultimately the pilot drops the bomb where he's told it, to drop it. In protective I, I, edge, was that 200, 200 strikes in like 60 seconds, I think? I think at the opening of protective edge, like the, yeah, the coordination between- You're talking about 2008. Uh, for, I think protective yeah. edge was 2014, but I'm just okay. saying that the coordination in the military is, is pretty well, tight. My, my understanding of the Israeli military- It's very organized. Especially, it's is, very is, organized. is that it's quite chaotic and it's no, no, also no, no, a lot of nonsense. testimonies from Israel, but be that as it may, okay, I'm, I'm prepared to accept um, both of your contentions that it's a, a highly organized Especially and disciplined the force. The Air Force, under any scenario, is going to be more organized than the other branches. And and you're saying such a strike would have been inconceivable. I'm, well, I'm not necessarily or, saying inconceivable. I'm just okay. saying that like that would have required okay, like, the, the, you're, you're basically, murderous intent for so many yes, people. I don't think good evidence has been presented to okay. say that that's the Your, your basic claim is that we, sh we, we it would be fair to assume that such a strike could have only been carried out with multiple um, uh, levels of authorization and, and, and signing off. Okay, let's accept that for the sake of argument. Um, we have now seen incident after incident after incident after incident where entire families are vaporized in, in single strikes. Who is We've in seen... the families? Who lives in the house family inside? Family members. No, family or members. next to the house family in which members. these uh, families are We killed. have seen incident after... Uh, do you know that Hamasniks weren't in that house? Do you, do you know that know their ammunition were? dumps yeah. weren't Why in those houses? Why do I have houses? to prove a negative? You're saying that they deliberately targeted yeah, well, families. You know, if Israel you... wanted to kill civilians in the I wish they would have brought the 972 magazine uh, piece. Like, I wish they talked about that. In, in Gaza, they could have killed 500,000 by now with the number of strikes and therefore, they've done. And, therefore, and the fact that they've actually, only killed... Yeah, this is not a good argument, man. That's crazy. Dude, dude, if they wanted to, they could do even harder genocide is not a good fucking argument. Yeah, they could. And it would have shut down their fucking genocidal operation in the eyes of the Western world probably faster. It would have also opened up Israel to more, not just scrutiny, but like direct targeting from regional actors. So they're constantly in a state of calculating how many civilians can we kill and ethnically displace. But it's not a target. It's not a math calculation of civilians per enemy combatants. It's a calculation of how many civilians can we kill without like America completely shutting off support. And that number is, you know, 30,000 plus, by the way. And we are coming to the end of it. A certain only, small number. 30,000 is a small number. Small yeah. number in proportion. You consider 30,000 a small, small number. in proportion number. over four months. 12, probably is, is an indication only. that it's targeted and that there are Hamas targets in these okay. places. 
So I've I've given 12, you know thousand children is only and if that's the case, why is it Yeah, word? you said only. Only. Though uh, Professor Morris, here's a question for you. If we take every combat zone in the world for the past three years, every combat zone in the world. In Vietnam, okay. the Americans killed I said, a million I'm not people. Talking about well, Vietnam. they could have killed 40 million. I wasn't, yeah, what? I wasn't. Against- That's crazy, bro. You're using Vietnam to defend Israel's actions in Gaza? That's wild. The Goldstone Report definitely dismissed the human shield theory. On the other hand, the only two Israeli soldiers condemned by Israeli courts in Gaza used a child as a shield while doing an assault. Yeah. In, in the anti-war movement. So don't... The str- Goldstone is the inception of the UN as Hamas, by the way. Uh, and then and then they'll always use like, well, Goldstone himself went back on his fucking uh, report later. A million people uh, f- fine, fine. And... and uh, 30 million Russians were killed so in during World War II, so everything else is irrelevant. Okay, Not here's irrelevant. a question. Stick to Professor, Morris, Professor Morris, here's a question. It's very perplexing. If you take every combat zone in the world for the past three years and you multiply the number of children killed by four, every combat zone in the world, you get Gaza, okay? So when you what say- What is that supposed to prove? Firstly, okay, I'm gonna, I'm wait, gonna wait, tell you, just you're lying, shut up. You're- what is that supposed to prove? That Israel is killing a shit ton of children and that is like not legally permissible and it completely, utterly immoral. You're relying I'm on not Hamas you, numbers. No, I'm not Hamas relying, numbers I'm not relying on- now, Yeah, when you're losing the argument, go into, quickly go into, oh, those are Hamas numbers. Nice. Yeah, those are Hamas numbers. Okay, dude, come on. Yeah, Hamas numbers that Israel itself uses, Hamas numbers that the U.S. State Department relies on, the Hamas-backed Palestinian Health Ministry, okay, no matter how hard you try to frame it, is the foremost authority. If you have an issue with their numbers, let fucking third-party international investigators in to the motherfucking Gaza Strip. But you can't do that because you're too horny to fucking kill them too. There are no other numbers. Another calculation from Israel is, well, it's better to just keep saying Hamas numbers and have everyone rely on it, uh, our government included, especially when they're matched against the, the, uh, the, the population numbers that Israel already has, because they have the fucking names and addresses of every single person that lives in the Gaza Strip to begin with. I've done the math on Hamas civilian to death ratio. IDF has killed about 1,000 times more civilians than were killed by the Allies bombing Dresden. Calling it a consequence of war is insane. The numbers that everybody that. else, I'm relying on the numbers. Forget Even if we take the numbers, else, though, what is that? Those okay. are Hamas numbers. Okay, okay. Which may not fine. be true. Fine. They could invent any, anything. You I know think. That. Okay, if they can invent any number, then bring in third party investigators once again. But you won't do that. You would never argue for that. That they are I a think mendacious we, I think organization. We all, I know mendacious. Also, if they're Hamas numbers, why did you earlier say that those numbers are actually low? Like, it's just. Once again, cognitive bias is in display. First, he said, well, those numbers are low. We could kill way more if we wanted to. And now he's turning around and be like, and those are Hamas numbers, actually, so you can't trust them. He's just hitting every fucking angle he can because deep down inside, every single human being, and I genuinely believe this, every single human being, no matter how fucking aggressively fascist they are, still understand that murdering children is wrong. Okay, murdering women and children is fucking wrong. And that's why he has to cope with it by moving the fucking goalposts. It's not just about, like, defending his position and doing a shitty job at it, okay? I think deep down inside, he wants to believe it. And and, and that's why he's, like, desperately, he's, like, falling off of a cliff and desperately trying to grab onto any kind of ledge he can in this argument. If they could make any number, why wouldn't it be higher? Why not make the alleged lie more tragic and painful? It's bullshit. Exactly. Believe me. You like words. Mendacious as in the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay, so here's the thing. You say they could have killed 500,000, but they only killed only. That's your word. I'm not only saying killed that if you, 30, if you believe that they deliberately so here, target here, civilians, they okay. could have, would have killed many, no, many more. See, the fact no, is Mar- that Professor they don't Morris, deliberately target for, civilians. For, for Professor Morris, for a, his, you don't understand for a historian, society. I don't, you don't want to understand Israeli society. You, don't you want to know the truth. I don't want to. I don't, under, I don't, I don't know if like a lot of uh, Israeli defenders that live in Israel understand 
the impact of this latest incursion. I think they think that they will go back to business as usual and, and the regular order of the apartheid will, will set back in and the routine violence and, and everyone will just like go back to the drawing board. It'll be like October 6th all over again. And I personally don't think that that is going to happen. As someone who has been covering this for years and years and years, okay, I've never seen this level of support for the Palestinians in my entire life. I've never seen that. And I don't think, I don't think people in Israel recognize it. I think there are some liberal Zionists who are like, you know, originally super gung-ho. Now they're starting to, to come back to reality, okay? But this level of atrocity cannot go unanswered, cannot go unnoticed. There will be consequences for it. I don't want to get inside their heads. That's the problem. Ninety percent of the a good, a good, a good, a good <laughs> historian, a good historian yeah. tries to get into the heads uh, of there's a the, limit. the various there's a limit. protagonists. There's a limit. When ninety percent, when ninety percent of Israelis think that Israel is using enough or too little force in Gaza, I don't want to get inside that head. Forty percent think that Israel is using insufficient force in Gaza. I don't want to get inside that head. I don't want to get inside the head of people who think they're using insufficient force. Is, is Zionism the same as nationalism? Yes. Historians against the population, no. against the population, half of which is children. I don't want to get inside that head. But here is the point, because your partner wants to know the point. You don't understand political constraints. One of your ministers said, let's drop an atomic bomb on <laughs> you Gaza. You think he really meant that? He well, said it three you, No, no, no. Hey, it was said in the sort of a... Professor very, Morris. No. Oh, my God. Yeah, he didn't mean it. Yeah. it's it's. He was just joking, bro. Yeah, guess what, dude? That one fucking Hamas guy who said a thousand October 7s are valid because of what Israel has done to us. Also just joking. But except you use that as just cause to do genocide. That's just one guy. That went against the narrative of almost every single other fucking uh, Hamas commander in general. But, you know, that gives us just cause to do genocide. Questionable he way. He didn't say they should Professor drop Morris, it the day I'm not supporting him. He's an idiot. Morris, this minister, other, this minister other, is a minister, other, minister, yeah, messianic none other idiot. Than but, 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 but he didn't not, say drop an atomic None, bomb under, none Seven, other no, than no, Israel's no. chief historian the famed, justifiably famed Benny Morris thinks we should be dropping nuclear weapons on Iran. Iran has for years, its leaders for years have said we should destroy Israel. You agree with that? They've said we should destroy Israel. Israel must be destroyed. Have you, is that correct? This is what the Iranian leaders have been saying since Khomeini. I would say Iranian leaders have sent mixed messages. Okay, okay. But <laughs> some of them have said, including Barelli, Khamenei If you don't know Khomeini. the evidence, if you don't wait, know wait, the wait, evidence, wait. why like are you laughing? It's very funny. <laughs> or, it's funny Iran because... Iran supports Hezbollah okay, and the Houthis okay. and Hamas. Oh, yeah. They want wait, 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 implemented a blockade on ships as it does all the fucking time then it's just i've never heard him ever in a million years talk about like intercepting venezuelan tankers venezuelan oil tankers and stealing the oil off of them i've never i've never heard any of these motherfuckers maybe they talk about it all the time like uh, uh taking money and freezing the assets the south korean assets to the tune of $6 billion that is supposed to go to Iran for the oil that they fucking sold South Korea. I've only heard about people talking about it when they unfroze those assets. Okay? It's just ridiculous. When America and American allies are engaging in blockades, then it's just, it's morally permissible. Like, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to fucking act like, it's ridiculous to act like, uh, you know, when America is is trying to shut out Russia from global trade, which they failed to do regardless, but if they were successful completely, that's fine. That's good. If, God forbid, another country with very limited means tries to implement something similar, the fuck? 
Yeah, U.S. stole an Iranian oil tanker, stole all the, uh, all the oil and returned the empty ship like a year later. They've done it to Venezuelan tankers too. Hold on, Norm, read, Norm. Let Norm, me read what you said. Norm, Norm, stop, please. Norm, just for me, please. Mm -hmm. Just give me a second. You said that there's no genocide going on in Gaza. Yeah. Let me ask that clear question. Yeah. Uh, the same question I asked on the Hamas attacks. Is there, from a legal, philosophical, moral perspective, is there genocide going on in Gaza today? Is there a genocide going on in Gaza? Well, in several years, we will have a definitive response to moment, that question. What has happened thus far is that on the 29th of December, the Republic of South Africa instituted um, proceedings against Israel pursuant to the 1948 convention. The people asking how could Destiny still have fans after this? Brother, how can Mr. Bartolelli have fans after this? They don't give a shit. There are a lot of people who just simply don't give a shit and love the chaos and love um, and, and, you know, enjoy the sport of the blood sport of debates and also like being edgy and triggering people. These people used to be relegated to 4chan. They were on poll and now they operate on Twitter and now they operate freely within Destiny's community. But like, it's just about triggering people, making them mad. And it's all pure entertainment. It's very nihilistic. It's very destructive. It doesn't really matter because they're so far removed. They're so fucking far removed from the impact or even thinking about the humanity, even thinking about um, the, the death toll, the human casualties. It's just, it doesn't matter. Like they're, they're literally fantasizing They've already moved on about the the uh, total, utter annihilation and humiliation of their debate Lord Daddy, and they've made the... Here, I just, I just went on their fucking subreddit. Every single thing is just about me and making fun of Norm Finkelstein or just making fun of me because they don't really want to talk about how bad Destiny's performance is because that's embarrassing because he is their intellectual champion. Look at this. Their takeaway from this five-hour conversation isn't that, like, perhaps, maybe, the guy that they uphold as this, like, supreme intellect is maybe morally bankrupt and maybe intellectually bankrupt, okay? But instead, let's move on to the next thing. And they'll always do this. They always deflect. They'll always bury uh, these sorts of instances. Yeah, it, it always goes back to, as you can see, I have portrayed you as the Sojak and myself as the Chad. Like, I'm not even there. Exactly. I wasn't even there. And, I, I, and, and, and they've already moved on from the debate performance. There's no honest assessment of it. It's just, oh, man, well, we're, we're triggering us on, right? It's like, all right, man. Yeah, I'm fucking triggered. It's just sad. Quick correction. They didn't return oil tanker empty. Iran sees the back. Lol, Dubai. Iran sees the tanker with Iraqi crew destined for Turkey on Thursday. But yeah, ultimately, I think a lot of people don't really care because there's a lot of underlying Islamophobia in the minds of a lot of people. They they repackage it. They repackage it as like, well, I'm just intellectually uh, an r slash atheist style uh, anti theist actually, and that's why I think Islam is bad. It's very Sam. Yeah, it's a it's a Sam Harris argument. Prevention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. Um, South Africa basically accused Israel of perpetrating um, genocide in the Gaza Strip. On the 26th of January, the, um, uh, the court issued its initial ruling. The court at this stage um, is not making a determination on whether Israel has or has not um, committed genocide. So just as it has not found Israel guilty, it certainly also hasn't found Israel innocent. What the court had to do at this stage was take one of two decisions. Either South Africa's case was um, the, the equivalent of a frivolous lawsuit and dismiss it and close the proceedings, or it had to deter- Bro, oh, come on, dude. Oh, you're just repeating propaganda. I have talked to academics, journalists, and literal fucking Israeli Knesset members since October 7. I've also went on television to debate people on this matter. I have put myself out there. It makes me really sad when I see former fans just like get lost, get swept up in the bullshit.
I've talked to conscientious objectors. I've raised, this community has raised $1.3 million for multiple Palestinian charities. Like, that's crazy that you're just reducing it to like, while he's talking to high profile figures publicly, you on the other hand, talking to some random Houthi pirate slash terrorist wannabes, re-examine everything. I don't know how, I, I genuinely don't know how you can arrive at this conclusion unless you're just simply watching clips. I don't know. I'm not even, I, I, like, it's not even the, the, like, what makes me, what makes me get sad about this is that, like, like how can someone be so ill-informed, actually? German, that um, South Africa presented a plausible case that, Israel was violating its obligations um, under the Genocide Convention and that it would on that basis hold um, a full hearing. Now, a lot of people have um, looked at the court's ruling of the 26th of January and focused on the fact that the court did not order a ceasefire. I actually wasn't expecting it to order a ceasefire. And I wasn't surprised that it didn't, because in the other cases that, that the court has considered, most prominently um, Bosnia and Myanmar, it also didn't order a ceasefire. Um, and South Africa, in requesting a ceasefire, also didn't ask the court to render an opinion on the legitimacy or lack thereof of Israel's, um, of Israel's military operation. From my perspective, um, the key issue on the 26th of January was whether the court would simply dismiss the case or decide to proceed with it. And it decided to proceed. We and it decided to, to proceed. And I think that's enormously... I thought that was I think that's enormously But you said they committed genocide. I, 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 you already I, I, said they committed genocide. I also it's like, I said, committing genocide. But if I could just... Allow, allow me... Allow use me, that word. That's correct. Now, I, I don't run away. So, Norman, you did say Israel Norm, committed genocide. Can you let Moyen yeah. finish? Yeah. Well, the end of the story is you specifically asked whether I think Israel is committing genocide. I explained formally there is no finding. And as you said, we won't know for a number of years. And I think there's legitimate questions to be raised. I mean, in the Bosnia case, which I think all four of us would agree was clearly a case of genocide, the court determined... You mean by the Serbs? Yes. Yeah. In, in the Bosnia case, the court determined that of all the evidence placed before them, only Srebrenica qualified as genocide, and all the other atrocities committed did not qualify as genocide. You know, international law is a developing uh, organism. I don't know how the court is going to respond um, in this case, so I wouldn't take it as a foregone conclusion um, how the court is going to respond. But, but my, Norman has determined already. I have too, because you're asking my personal yeah, personal opinion. opinion is also so as as a matter of law, I want to state very clearly, it has not been determined and won't be determined for several years, based on my um, uh, observations and and the evidence before me. I would say. It's indisputable that Israel is engaged in a genocidal assault against the Palestinian people which in the is, Gaza which Strip. Which is the PLO line? Genocidal. Yeah, with the program, the PLO is long past. What? what okay, the what Palestine. Palestine. For the record, I did show. I not only brought up the Dahia Doctrine, um, demon slot. I don't know if you're still in here. It seems to me like uh, you know something changed in your attitude after October seven, where you just left the community and never looked back. Um, it's another, this is another October seven chatter who was like, Oh no, like I am full blown, full tilt, like going to assume that you are, uh, trying to kill Jews or something. It's Zionism is, is legitimately a, the brain disease. It will rob you of your moral core. Your moral compass will be broken and you will become a different person as a consequence of these firmly held beliefs, but the intentionally killing unfounded by the ICJ, by the way, is not unfounded by the ICJ and the deliberate killing, um, the deliberate killing. I actually did show you not only with the Dahia doctrine, which is a long standing uh, Israeli military principle, but also I literally pointed you in the direction of something that I've already covered before time and time again, the 972 magazine, article that shows the the specific ways in which Israel deliberately targets civilian infrastructure. 
There are a lot of people like him that left this community post October 7, by the way. They came in here, they watched what I had to say, and they were done. This is what I was talking about with respect to uh, how many progressive except for Palestine people exist in progressive circles. It sucks. But why is that the exception okay? It's not. It is sad, though. It's sad to see so many people just fucking... It's sad to see so many people just straight up go, you know what, I disagree with this guy on this issue. Doesn't matter how many years I've listened to him, 100%. I'm just now going to look for, I'm now going to look for any kind of purpose to, to vilify him in my mind. All I can hope for is that one day they will arrive at the truth. You know, I think in the broader, grander scheme of things, there are probably a lot more people that um, are, are, you know, waking up to the realities, but ultimately, you know, Destiny and his fans, every time he says something that makes him look like a weird, unhinged creep, it's just a joke, bro. Yeah, always. It's just odd because I've had these positions for a very long time. Like, I, I've advocated for the same things for a very long time, for 10 years. Uh, there have been any war crimes coming out. Is Israel currently committing war crimes in Gaza? Not to my current knowledge. I don't think so, but I, I've never seen anything that currently differently has changed, but... Uh, right now, I don't believe anybody has levied the claim that uh, there have been any war crimes committed since October 7th. I don't think. I don't believe so. Do you think that is that in any way relevant to you when discussing the conflict? If, let's say if Israel were to be committing international and internationally recognized war crimes in Gaza and, and may I add, in the West Bank, and um, and I could prove that to you and you'll say, yes, I agree. Would that change anything in your overall perception of the conflict? Mm. Right now, I, I don't necessarily think so, but I mean, I probably think that the underlying things themselves are probably bad without them being a war crime. I think it's defined as a war crime, I think, or I think it's considered internationally illegal for Israel to be building settlements in the West Bank. Uh, I think that's a really bad thing for a variety of reasons. Simply for from 48 onwards into the future, has there at any point been an ethnic cleansing of Palestinians? 47 and 48. Um, uh, it was inarguably a mass explosion of a certain ethnic group of people from territories. So, I mean, I mean, that would qualify as ethnic cleansing. Um, okay. pri uh, post that, if I would consider like settler expansionism to be a form of a type of ethnic cleansing, I mean, you could arguably probably say that. I think I would say it's probably, it's probably roughly true. I don't really like the term ethnic cleansing because I think it's just a shitty term. It like, it's, it, like it brings with it like a whole bunch of like moral condemnation, but I don't think ethnic cleansing is necessarily always bad. And there are different ways to do it that might be good or bad. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, what? I don't think ethnic cleansing is always bad. And there are ways to do it that are not necessarily bad. What the fuck? Bro, I really, I don't watch this dude at all. So I just like, it, when I, when I find something new, like when you guys send me some new shit, I'm like, it, it is still, it's just wild. Um, I think I broadly agree with the idea that, um, I think you agree with that too, we can have a discussion on that if you want. But um, I think I broadly agree with the idea that uh, Arab Palestinians have been kind of moved around their land quite a bit, so. You agree that in terms of the conditions in the West Bank um, and Gaza, there is an, Israel is running an apartheid state. I mean, like, kind of. It's like, a, it's a military occupation. So, I mean, like, necessarily, there are going to be a different set of standards for different people living there. I, I'm not as interested in the apartheid comment because, the, it, it, let's say we agree that it's apartheid, it's never going to be fixed as long as... I mean, here, I'll translate it. I'm not necessarily interested in the things that you're saying because it makes me look bad. Like, there's no other way to be like, I'm kind of wishy-washy on genocide. As long as it's a military occupation, like, I think the way to fix it is to establish borders and to create a state. And I think the apartheid stuff gets fixed after that, like, automatically almost. But it definitely doesn't get fixed um, while it's still considered a military occupation. That, that would never happen. That's crazy. Fine, as, as, as you were saying, um, genocide is, is, is not a body count. Um, Thank you, Merrick Avery, for the... Can give this Genocide up. consists of two elements, um, the destruction of a people in whole or in part. So in other words, you can commit genocide by it's killing 30,000 people. It doesn't have, well, five probably is below there the is threshold. A yes, but I think 30,000 crosses the threshold and not reaching 500,000 is probably relevant. And the second element is there has to be an intent. In other words. And you believe there's an intent? Yes, I think if, if, there is a, any other plausible reason for why all these people are being murdered, it's not genocide. And as far as intent is What about concerned, hiding behind a human shield? You don't think that's a reason for them being killed? Well, let's get the intent part out of the way first. Um, South Africa's... Uh, Forget South Africa. They're not the party. Well, I'd, I'd like to finish. They're like, pro-Hamas like, uh, government. That's, that's got nothing to do with anything. I think they're pro-Satan as well last time. No, they're pro-Hamas. Um, you know, for some reason, you don't have a problem with people being pro-Israeli at the time of, 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 of this. But if they support Palestinians right to life or self-determination, they get demonized and delegitimized as pro They support an organization which murdered 1,200 people deliberately. That's my but, but supporting a state that has murdered 30,000. But they haven't because these are 30,000 okay. are basically human well, shields. Just... They haven't. Oh, shit. It, Hamas should have just said that Israeli civilians are, are human shields. That was the big problem. 
Hamas should have just said that, like, the Israelis were human shields that they killed, and then in that case, it would be fine. They get used by the Hamas, and, and which the Hamas wanted, wanted, wanted right. killed. Okay. They wanted could, them killed. Right. If I Hamas could, wanted these sure. people. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, blocking humanitarian aid is also because they're human shields. Which, by the way, Central Committee, they do literally say that. They say that the aid will get into the hands of Hamas terrorists, so we can't have them. So, that... In their in their worldview, like that does actually make sense to them, which is psychotic. Yeah, fifteen thousand human shield children. Sure. Killed. If I could just get, you don't yeah. think they wanted them killed? They no, didn't I don't. They provide them with shelters. They build tunnels for their fighters, okay. but if not one shelter for their own civilians. You asked me about intent. Of course, they want them killed. Okay. You asked me about intent, and the reason that I bought in um, the South African application is because it is actually exceptionally detailed on intent by quoting numerous also the idiotic ministers in Israel. Well, yeah, including the prime minister, the defense the minister, minister say the chief of staff. Didn't say genocide, no, the chief no, he said I'm out there. He said I'm out there. Use the word according I'm out there. Because the are a really according evil organization. According to Asa Kasher, if I may. According to Asa Kasher, the philosopher of Asa IDF, yeah. yeah, he said that <laughs> Netanyahu <laughs> was, uh, was uh, avowing genocide. So now, he's an idiot. So he didn't say he's an idiot, but he's a past it. So the reason I raised the South African application is twofold, Hamas or no Hamas. It's exceptionally detailed on the question of on the question of intent. And secondly, when, when the International Court of Justice issues a ruling, individual justices um, have, have the right, can give their own opinion. Yeah, yeah. And I found the German one to be the most interesting on, on this specific question, because he was basically saying that he didn't think South Africa presented a persuasive case. But he said their, um, their section on intent was so overpowering that he felt he was left with no okay. choice but to vote with, with the majority. So I think that answers um, the intent part of your question. So for the ICJ case that South Africa's brought, I think there's a couple things that need to be mentioned. One is, and I saw you two talk at length about this, the plausibility standard is incredibly low. The only thing we're looking for is a basic presentation of facts that make it conceivable, possible, that plausible, pl plausible yeah. which legally, this is obviously below criminal conviction, below, yes, um, yeah, below. Think of it as an indictment. Sure, possibly, mm -hmm. maybe even a, a lower level than even an indictment. So plausibility is an incredibly low standard, number one. Um, number two, uh, if you actually go through and you read the complaint that South Africa filed, um, I would say uh, that if you go through the quotes and you even follow through to the source of the quotes, the misrepresentation that South Africa does and their case about all of these horrendous quotes, in my opinion, borders on criminal. Well, um, 16 ICJ judges disagree. That's fine if 16 ICJ judges disagree, must but be I'm going to give... incompetent. <clears throat> you know, they could be, but... Must be, um, well, even the American judge, she must have been awful incompetent if she was un... The misrepresentation of like Israeli officials saying Israeli officials saying that they want they have genocidal intent really messed up, really messed up to show that to the world, actually able to see the misrepresentations that Mr. Bunnell, based on his Wikipedia entry, was able to find. So this is based on the official ICJ mm -hmm. report that was released. Yeah, I'm not sure I read, if you read the entire I read up. every. Okay, that's great. Oh, my God. You just reminded me of this. That's so funny. Where is it? Someone just said, I'm glad these are loyal amount. Yeah. Someone in the chat said, remember, um, he's over here trying to talk like a lawyer, but remember when he fucking failed uh, a, a practice LSAT test? I forgot about that arc. Many arcs in the long history of uh, bon Bonarelli, when he fucking went after a respectable lawyer, famously the, the one who successfully defended the Sandy Hook victims' families against Alex Jones and secured like an insane award to the tune of a billion dollars. Yeah, Bonarelli was duking it out with him over some other shit, I don't remember, a while back. And Mr. Facts and Logic thought, you know, how hard could this be? And took a practice test, a practice LSAT on stream, and his entire community was fucking destroying him. For someone who loves his community clip chimping you, who really doesn't like things being taken out of context, yeah, but... Things in context for Mr. Bonarelli is already pretty, pretty bad. Like, uh, someone sent me a link of him defending, uh, debating Aiden, uh, Aiden Rosen Sneeko, where he very literally says if a 29 year old fucks a 16 year old, that's not pedophilia, where he busts out the actually it's a febophilia argument. And children, that's what a pedophile is. Where he'll, he'll get cornered for saying some wild shit like molesting a kid is, is not, doesn't make you a pedophile and then make it about Tate. If you want to walk through the conversation, we could do it. What do you think a pedophile is? Somebody who's attracted to kids. Yes. Somebody who's attracted to prepubescent children. That's what a pedophile is, technically. What's that's, right? what, that's what Wait, said guys. you said to them your way. If, if a 29-year-old if a fucks a 16-year-old, that's not technically pedophilia. They're not a child. It's just somebody who's no. using a minor. Well, okay, this is, this is like a, a gross conversation that like infects a lot. 
He's like, it's a, it's a minor by a different name, please. Palestinian lives. And so if when we see, for example, a bomb drop in a refugee camp, or we see a residential home struck, well, we know there's eight people in there and maybe one is Hamas connected, maybe, right? Um, then we're taking a very high risk. And when we look at the fact that most of the people killed are women and children, two thirds well, at that, this point. Well, I don't, that and those numbers, well, children is a misnomer because it depends on what we mean by children. Are we talking about 17? 18. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that's a valid use of the word children for this particular region. Um, Why? Because 15, 16, 17 year olds can be part of the military and can fight. Right, which, which becomes- and when we say For this region, in this particular region, 17 year olds uh, should not be classified as children. Hey man, my man's consistent, you know? Consistently a fucking asshole, but. Astra. Did you go through and actually identify any of the sources? Actually, 15, 16, 17. Yeah. Actually, brace yourself for this, and Louine could confirm it. Mm -hmm. Yaniv Kogan, an Israeli, and Jamie Stern Weiner, half Israeli, they checked every single quote in the Hebrew original. And Yaniv Kogan, love the guy, he has terrifying powers of concentration. He checked every single quote. Is that correct, Louine? Mm -hmm. And Jamie checked every single quote in the English in the context, and where there were any contextual questions, they told us. I think they found one. Yeah, I think they found one. So I do not believe that those 16, 15 judges, it was 15 to 2. 16 to 2, I think. There are 15 in the court plus 2, so it's 17, so it's 15 Maybe. to 2. Uh, I don't think those 15 judges were incompetent, and I certainly don't believe the president of the court, an what American, would allow herself to be duped. Okay. Well, like, you might, well, be, you might recall, Mr. Let me read one. Let me read one. Sure. So this was uh, taken from the uh, from the South African complaint. There's tons of these. Mm -hmm. But so here's one. Uh, in the in the complaint for the ICJ, they said that on the 12th of October, 2023, President Isaac Herzog made clear that Israel was not distinguishing between militants and civilians in Gaza, Correct. stating in a press conference to foreign media in relation to Palestinians in Gaza, over one million of whom are children. Quote. Quote. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. Yeah. It is not true. This rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. I saw that. It's right. absolutely not true. And we will fight until we break their backbone. End quote. If you actually go to the news article, that they even state, they even link it in their complaint. The full context for the quote was, quote, it is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true. This rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime, which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. But we are at war. We are defending our homes. We are protecting our homes. That's the truth. And when a nation protects its home, it fights and we will fight until we break their backbone. He acknowledged that many Wait. Okay. The Gazans had nothing to do with Hamas, but was adamant that others did. Quote, I agree there are many innocent Palestinians who- Bro, what do you mean? He said, I agree that there are many innocent Palestinians, but they didn't rise up against fucking uh, uh, Hamas. But it's a war. Sorry. The added context says the exact same thing that you think uh, it, it somehow disparages. Dude, look at Benny's face. You don't agree with this, but you have a missile in your goddamn kitchen and you want to shoot it at me. Am I allowed to defend myself? We have to defend ourselves. We have the right to do so. This is not the same as saying there's no distinction between militants and civilians. By the way, this is literally what Osama bin Laden said. Like, Americans are all responsible for voting for the same reactionary politicians that fucking destroy the Middle East and therefore they will all die before doing 9-11. You know? A little bit different than my uh, quote on America deserve 9-11, but uh, that's what everyone said I was saying. Civilians in Gaza, his statement here is actually fully compliant with international law to the letter, because if you are storing mili uh, military supplies in civilian areas, these things become military targets and you're allowed to do proportionality assessments afterwards. So if this is supposed to be one of many quotes that they've shown that is supposed to demonstrate uh, genocidal intent, but it is very easily explained by military intent or I, by a conflict between two parties. I saw that press conference. Wait, let, let me just say something. All of this talk is a bit irrelevant because it sounds, it may sound to the listeners that the, the, the court in The Hague has ruled that Israel is committing genocide. No, I think it we, hasn't. It hasn't. No. It's just is it going in the next few years to look at the whole subject. Okay. There has been no, no, no determination we're, we're, at all. Fine. And as, uh, as Stephen says, uh, some of the quotes are not exactly accurate quotes okay. or taken out of context. Yes. Okay. It is correct, as Muin put it, that only seven, several years before the court makes a determination. And my guess and, is that it will determine there was no genocide. I, we can that's my guess. I, I yes, no, I'm just giving I, I you my guess. Uh, I can't predict. I got it all wrong, actually, as Malin will attest. I got it all wrong the first time. I never thought the American judge would vote in favor of plausibility. So you admit that you were wrong? I, I, yeah, of course. I think I tell Malin <laughs> twice a day I was wrong about this and I was wrong about that. I'm not wrong about the facts. I try not to be, but my speculations, they can be wrong. Okay, leaving that aside. First of all, as Malin pointed out, I think the moment that you find yourself defending a, a, a genocidal regime alongside a fucking kick streamer who has uh, argued about, you know, how uh, fucking a 16 year old is actually just a phoebophilia 
and not pedophilia is the moment where you have lost the plot, lost the sauce. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Reevaluate everything. You know what I mean? Reconsider your life choices. You're in, you're, you're, you're in the bad place. You're no longer in the good place. It out. There's a difference between the legal decision <laughs> by the ruling and an independent judgment. Now, South Africa was not filing a frivolous case. That was 84 pages. It was single, even 84 it was pages. Single it, was it was single space. It takes an hour and a half to single, read. It was not a massive case. It was single spaced and it had literally hundreds of it, footnotes. It can still be with, frivolous. With, it, it's of possible. Course, of course. It could be. One wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I read the report. To tell you the truth, I followed very closely everything that's been happening to October 7th. I was mesmerized. I couldn't believe the comprehensiveness of that particular report. Number two, there are two quite respected judges, excuse me, there were two quite respected uh, experts of international law sitting on the South African panel, John Dugard and Vaughan Lowe. Vaughan Lowe, as you might know, he argued the war case in 2004 before the International Court of Justice. Now, they were not, uh, they were alleging genocide, which in their view means the evidence in their minds, we're not yet at the court, the evidence in their minds compels the conclusion that genocide is being committed. I am willing, because I happen to know Mr. Dugard personally and have corresponded with Vaughn Lowe. I've heard their claim. I've read the report. Uh, I would say they make a very strong case. But let's agree plausible. Now, here's a question. If somebody qualifies for an Olympic team, let's say a regional person qualifies for an Olympic team, it doesn't mean they're going to be on the Olympic team. It doesn't mean they're no. going to win a gold medal, a, a, a silver medal, or a bronze, bronze medal. They can swim. That's what you're saying. No, I would say that's a very high bar. You're saying they can swim. To even qualify. They can swim well enough to have a realistic prospect yeah, 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 of yeah. winning a medal. So to even make it to plausible. That is not true. That is not it's what plausible means. High, it is absolutely right. not. You're Mr. dead Pirelli, wrong. Mr. Borelli, please don't teach me about the English language. So the declaration I said, of judge I said plausibility the is the same the concept. Borelli, Borello, Bonicello, Mr. Bonicello, Mr. Uh, you are out of your depth. Oh, is so good. Phase, As qualifying. The court is not asked at this present phase of the proceedings to determine whether South Africa's allegations of genocide are well-founded. They're not uh, well-founded. They're not even well-founded. The court I, is, you said that plausible is a high I, I, standard. It's absolutely I, not. It is a misrepresentation of the strength of the case against Israel, just like the majority not, of the quotes they have every, in this case are. And also, you said it was an extremely well-founded case. They spend like one-fourth of all of the quotations. Some even pulled from the Goldstone report. They try to, uh, to actually deal with the intent part, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, I think you guys, I don't know if you use the phrase, the dolo specialis, that the intentional part of genocide, Sorry, I don't know the, that the, term. The, the, I, think it's, I think it's called dolo specialis. It's the most important part of genocide, which is proving the special, it's a highly special intent to commit genocide. It's that's possible that Israel could- mens rea. No. The mens rea, they, yes, I understand the state of mind, but the, the, and for genocide, there is, it's called dolo specialis. It's a highly special intent. Did you read the case? Yeah, uh, it is a highly Pirelli. special intent. I'm going to ask you again. Genocide. Yes. Please stop displaying your imbecility. Okay, I'm do sorry. Not, you think the declaration don't, don't of the judge is Don't put on public display that you're a moron. At least have the self-possession to shut up. Did I I'm read the case? My display on Mr. 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 Okay. I read the case around four times. I read all of the the uh, ma the majority opinion, the declarations. I read Aaron Barak's declaration. Then why are you lying and saying plausible is high standard? Because I said, even reaching the benchmark of plausibility is a very high standard in the world. It's the equivalent of a regional player qualifying for an Olympics. It's still two steps removed. You may not be on the team. Dude, I this is why debates are so fucking stupid because it's obvious what he's saying. It's a very high bar to clear to even get this across the ICJ for it to say that there's plausibility here for them to continue the fucking court case. And like, He's just engaging in semantics over and over again. No, dude, actually, they're fucking letting every genocide case go through. They're actually using all of their unlimited resources, seemingly, on all of the genocides all the time. You just don't even hear about it. And it's so fucking stupid. <clears throat> but again, and again, I have to repeat myself that it doesn't matter how stupid he is because there are people even stupider than him who will listen to this and go, yeah, I think he's holding him, uh, himself well. Like, he's holding his own here against this guy who is an intellectual, supposedly. And you may not get a medal, but to get qualified, which in this context is the equivalent of plausible, you must be doing something pretty horrible. Court, and as it happens, court, and as it happens the court Professor rule, Morris... There was no as, 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 That's as what the court will rule. As, Remember what I just told you. The court I don't rule, expect to be even around when the court reaches its final decision. Why? Why? They'll take a long, long time. Two years. Three years. No, I don't think they'll take two or three years. I mean, Bosnia, okay. which was admittedly a special type of case because they were accusing Serbia of sponsoring the Bosnian Serbs. That took, I think, 17 years from 90. I assume they'll take two or three years. But you, the point you're making.
So I'm this is a legal something dis- yeah, yeah. horrible must be happening to even achieve. It's horrible. It's a war. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I think they weren't, they weren't rendering a ruling on a war. They were rendering a ruling on a genocide. And I think I think the suggestion. They said it was plausible. They also said it was plausible that Israel is committing a military operation as well. Yeah, but I think the problem with with your characterization is you're saying in so many words that South Africans basically only have to show up in court with a coherent statement. Right. That is correct. In today's atmosphere, that's probably correct. They needed to do a lot more. They need they needed to they needed to persuade today's atmosphere. The American judge. They needed to persuade judges go according to what the majority wants want to hear. Yeah, but they needed president. They needed to persuade the court that it was worth investing several years of their time. Right-wing argumentation always revolves around the same fucking dumb, nonsensical principles. The right-wing, the the fucking, the ICJ court is just woke, okay? Let me tell you something. It's just woke. It's woke nonsense with their fucking woke judges that are capitulating to the to the wokeness of the majority opinion. Let's not ask why people have arrived at this majority opinion which seemingly is very popular i don't get what these regarded on fascist circles as a metal gigant you mean a mental giant everything i see of him is either glazing another fascist or getting manhandled by somebody who knows more about him yes because fascists are dumb as fuck that's it they're they're super stupid so to them they regard destiny as like a mental giant because he's edgy and he is rhetorically decent He's like a skilled communicator, but that's it. So he appeals to the only thing that they value, which is like coming across intelligent in short bursts, mostly against people who are not that smart. Also, right-wingers don't have a lot of values beyond just like being able to say slurs, and you are completely correct. Uh, Hassan is a bi, I think, who said that. Uh, He is a slur sayer himself, and I think people really like that. They're like, he's really... Like a lot of people that spend most of their time online have basically positioned themselves in the thinking that like being able to say edgy shit or slurs is actually like the coolest you can be like, Ooh, it's so, it's so scary for everybody else. When I say the big bad word, you know, I've, I've destroyed everybody. I've triggered everybody. So I think like as a 40 year old man with an audience of other 40 year olds, by the way, which makes it even fucking sadder. Um, being able to advocate for things like that, I think, uh, is really, really appealing for people who never let go of the the halcyon days of 4chan. They see him as their superior. Yeah. In they're hearing well this case, it, to us, so they, they're, they're well paid whether they, they take this case or not. I mean, you know, they have a they have a full docket um, whether they accept or reject this case. And I think I don't think. Well, if you think he's actually a fascist, you have completely nullified the word. He's cr- currently deliberately and directly defending a fascist ethno state's genocide. What the fuck are you saying? Do you think fascism just means you're a Nazi or uh, a- an Italian fascist, like a Mussolini supporter? <laughs> what? <laughs> we just watched a clip of him defending ethnic displacement and saying, you know, not all ethnic displacement and ethnic cleansing is bad. It can be good. What are you talking about? Yeah, he also is an admitted bigot as well here. I'll very, very here. clear here. I want to be very, very, very clear here because people seem to misunderstand this. People don't get this. Destiny's joke borders pretty hard on Islamophobia. I am Islamophobic and I hate Islam. I'm an atheist. Yes, I will make Islamophobic jokes. I love when he says I'm an atheist and he's like defending a Jewish ethno state doing genocide against Muslims, like as though he has this principled stance against all religion. Do you? It's odd to say that. Well, you know, these are Paul Muad'Dib treatises, aka the Lisan Al Gaib for races and dumbasses. Yeah. Huh. Because I do hate Islam, and I am Islamophobic. Very, very clear. We should remember uh, what I just said. They won't rule there was genocide. Remember what I said. Also, I recommend people actually read the case and follow through a lot of the quotes that they just okay. don't show okay. genocide. Okay. Really, the, the Israeli Minister of Finance. Why is he? Why is he okay saying he's Islamophobic, but not? <laughs> I love someone saying 15 second clip, clip chimp. Wait. Are you telling me that Destiny follows that clip up with being like, just kidding, I actually love the light of Allah, or just kidding, I actually don't think that like Arab Muslims are servile dogs or something? Is that what you're going to say? I mean, he's been Islamophobic to me, so I have personal, uh, firsthand experience with his Islamophobia on top of everything he's ever said about Muslims in general. Yeah, he said the Shahada right after. Like, how could that be clipped out of context? I wonder. <laughs> you must eat the whole shit before you tell me it smells bad. 
<laughs> he literally has called me a Turkish terrorist <laughs> multiple occasions. But of course, he was making a good, you know, coherent argument there when he said that. <laughs> You're not even Muslim? I don't think you know what Islamophobia means. <laughs> yeah. Like, the first guy that killed a Sikh dude in Texas after 9-11, when he was uh, saying, like, you know, Allah Akbar, like, go back to your country, and he shot and killed that guy, he wasn't doing an Islamophobic hate crime, even though the woke courts declared that he was, um, because the guy was Sikh. Oh, it was not in Texas. It was in, uh, <laughs> it was in Arizona. Sorry. I'm very smart, by the way. Yeah, Islamophobia is simply a criticism of the religion, and it's certainly not racialized as a form of bigotry. He was just being a, he was just being an atheist, bro. What do you mean? So on the 8th of October, 2023, this is taken from the ICJ. This is from South Africa's submission. Uh, Bezalel Smotrich, I can't read this. Stated, uh, there you go. Okay, at a meeting of the Israeli cabinet that, quote, we need to deal a blow that hasn't been seen in 50 years and take down Gaza, end quote. But again, if you click through and you read the source, their own linked source, it says, as per this own source, quote, the powerful finance minister, settler leader, uh, Bezalel Smotrich, I can't read this, demanded at the cabinet meeting late Saturday that the army, quote, hit Hamas brutally and not take the matter of the captives into significant consideration, end quote. Quote, in war as in war, you have to be brutal, end quote. He was quoted as saying, quote, we need to deal a blow that hasn't been seen in 50 years and take down Gaza, end quote. You can't strip the quotation of Hamas, a oh, entity think, one with, and then when Ukraine says we need to defeat uh, Russia, that genocide will killing one. all Russian Professor, citizens. Professor Mars, here's another one. When, when the defense is yeah, ridiculous, yes, ridiculous. Uh, the American judge. He also doesn't the, determine policy. The, the American judge. The the American, this is what the Islamophobia joke clip was referring to. Oh, yeah. I remember that. When he was talking about, like, I'm not going to play that clip, obviously, for obvious reasons. American judge. Red. You are holding the American judge to, you know. Well, he was the president. Yes, he'll so appeal to authority president. when it okay. him and we won't right. deal with the actual yeah. facts of the matter, I, ever. Okay. The American judge read several of the quotes. Look at the American okay. Supreme Court today. They may support Trump. Okay. Look, shows you okay. how okay. worthy Professor American Mars, judges Professor Mars, without going too far afield, if you heard a statement by the defense minister, the defense minister said, we are going... That's the guy he was referencing? I didn't even, I missed that part. Israeli lawmaker, my wife wouldn't want to give birth next to an Arab woman. Oh. Dude, you guys don't understand. He's just Islam. He's uh, he's just the atheist. Habayit Hayehudi, uh, politician, Bezalel Smotrich, famous uh, psychopath. Okay, he's actually just uh, an atheist. <laughs> when he said he doesn't want his wife giving birth next to an Arab woman, he was just being an atheist. <laughs> to prevent any food, water, fuel, or electricity from entering Gaza. Did Israel do that? I, did Israel do that? Okay, no, I'm, I'm wondering. What he said I, isn't, I'm asking you, isn't Israeli government well, well, But we're talking about statements now, intent. How would you interpret that? After 1,200 of your citizens are murdered the way they were, I would expect Let's, extreme statements okay, by okay. lots of politicians. But, 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 you're, by lots of politicians. but you don't accept extreme but that's Palestinians. Not Wait, but you don't accept. What he said isn't Israeli politics. But you don't, they let please. in water, they let in gas. I'm sure. You don't accept. Sure. But you don't accept. I'm, oh, bro, extreme, extreme statements. Followed up by extreme actions, okay? That's the whole point. Genocidal intent and also how it translates to, like, genocidal actions on the ground. That's the whole point of the ICJ court uh, uh, court case. And, but beyond that, but beyond that, what he's going to say now, what Rabani is going to say here is, is, but you don't have that same principle stance for Palestinians, which he doesn't. Extreme Palestinian statements after they lost their entire country, not just 1,200 people. That's a good point. No, no, it's a good point. And on that, <laughs> wow. Uh, on, on that moment, damn. Okay. One brief moment of agreement. Let's just take a quick pause. We need a smoke break, we need a water break, we need a bathroom take break. Take down Gaza is not a genocide. Take down Gaza is a genocide. What does statement. take down Gaza? We went to war with Iraq and we wanted to destroy Iraq. That was take a genocidal statement. There's a reason why genocide is so is such an importantly guarded concept, and it's not oh, to, to I, condemn I, every nation that goes to war. Wait, you didn't know how to pronounce my name. Are you going to pronounce it intentionally? Yeah, major genocide. You know what I'm talking about. Damn, he's got he's got all the smoke when he's getting up to pee, dude. He's like, come on. By your solicitude for international law. You should try learning it sometime. It would help you sort out a lot of the civilian deaths. Unfortunately, 15 judges disagree. You can keep citing the judges. You should actually try reading the actual statements. This is tiring. Uh, you You've invited us to a tiring session. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Was D okay. always like this, or did a combination of taking L's make him into a reactionary, non sounding weasel? Um, I think he just developed a resentment towards the left and just kind of carried that on. I don't really know. Meth and mushrooms? I don't know what like the turning point is, really. I mean, he used to be very reactionary, libertarian, like, I think he got, like, kicked off of his team for fucking being racist to his teammates or some Korean dude playing StarCraft or whatever, but this was, like, way back in the fucking day, uh, way before I met him, and, um, and then when I met him, he was, like, duking it out with, like, racists and all of the very same people 
that he basically aligns with both in argumentation and also literally like opinion, um, like Sargon of Akkad and whatnot. Like he was duking it out with them and, and owning them. So I thought like, oh, this is perfect. He's just like I-dubs, you know what I mean? Like I-dubs now, like a person who is reformed. And I love that. I thought, I love that. I will ride for you. I'll defend you. I did my first ever fucking, my first ever Chapo appearance. I literally defended Destiny the entire time. He was just copying the old Alan Combs method of being the court cuck for conservatives. He gets attention going around being defeated by various big conservatives in debate. He gets invited to lose. Yeah, I don't think, um, I don't think he, he like, quote unquote, loses. I think he loses now more. I, I think back in the day, he didn't do that is my point. That's why I refuse to watch it for a long time, lol, and the TYT connection. But yeah, it's, uh, no, he thinks he's so incredibly highly of himself, like an actual intellectual juggernaut. I think he's probably hopped up on a lot of copium to, to genuinely feel that way. Like, he probably feels like, legitimately is like an intellectual giant. Otherwise, he should have felt a little bit of shame and been a little bit scared to go up against Norm Finkelstein, of all people. It's, a. Uh, it's it's part Dunning Kruger, part um, really being overconfident in your skills as a as an orator. But if we're talking about his like shift, I don't know. Like I said, originally he was um, originally he was a giant piece of shit, super racist, major asshole. Changed his ways seemingly, I thought, and he was like debating pretty successfully. A lot of these same like people who consider themselves to be liberal classical liberals the real progressives like the dave rubens of the world and then slowly but surely like uh after we parted ways he just became more and more reactionary there was a time frame when we like separated that i would still defend uh him thinking that i did the same shit that i did with aiden ross like i genuinely thought that there was a way to salvage like i i and and thought that he could possibly be like, I don't know, a little bit misguided or something. I did for months and I was fucking wrong. I was very, very wrong. And his community has never, ever let it go. And they've like basically built an entire library of lore that justifies their resentment and anger. And they use that as an introduction for anyone and everyone that wants to join the fuck Hassan train, basically. Um, there's, there are entire libraries of content dedicated to, like, documentaries that his fan base have made about our friendship and, and how one-sided and how awful I am to him. And it, it, it's, it's a cult of personality surrounding just not just loving Destiny, but I think uh, in parts also hating me, which is crazy. It's pretty sad. That side of the internet is very, very sad. You had to say the small orbiter who built resentment or admiration for him like all the others, but you went ahead and blew up and you did the most reprehensible thing exists outside him. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone who's like blown up out of like uh, uh, after collaborating with Destiny that he doesn't fucking resent, really. I can't really think of anyone. Maybe. I'm sure there is one, maybe. But he fucking hates it. He, he despises that. So I think personally, a, a lot of it is basically that. Hassan was never a de-orbiter. That's revisionism. Yeah, I wasn't. I did collaborate with him a lot uh, early on. And I do attribute some of my early success to him. And I, I said it uh, for much longer than, than even after we had parted ways. I openly stated that. But um, having said that, it is pretty funny uh, to think that, like, to all the people that are like, yo, he made you or whatever. His subreddit already is flooded with memes of reaction before the stream ends. Lol, I watched some of his vids. Oh, no, they're in here. They've been in here all day. Um, but his subreddit seems beyond unhinged to, like, a worrying level of obsession with the left and figures from it. Yeah. No, his entire community is, like, uh, very, very resentful of anything that is... any Anyone that Destiny hates, they hate way harder than he does. And, um, and that's all they do for the most part. There's no, like, real clear-cut definitional ideology there beyond you know, attacking whoever his enemies are. This sub will call you a tanky, a reactionary, a racist, a capitalist, all in one sentence. Let's do it. Okay, okay. This, there are major things to discuss here, not just what, what some court is doing the okay. judge in two years' time. Yes, okay. So what you just said is my... I think I'm going to end it here uh, for now. There's, a, there's another fucking hour to go. Hour and a half. It's been nine hours, I realized. Holy fuck, dude. I covered this the whole day.
Uh, tomorrow we are going. You either die a Hasanabi or live long enough to see yourself become the D man. That's not a good way to live. Um, I thought I thought there were some highs and and some lows, but a lot of highs regardless. I thought that that was like more fun than I thought it was going to be, for sure. Overall, so thank you, Lex Fridman, for giving us this content, this bountiful content. Um, Got to get Norm on the stream sometime. Oh yeah, absolutely. Still got to do that. Anyway, love you guys. I will see you tomorrow. I got Mike Maylag in the building tomorrow. On Sunday, we have Kaya's birthday party. We have a lot of content coming up this coming up this week and this weekend. So get excited for it. I might have Matt Owens, director of the uh, or showrunner of the live action. One Piece coming back on the stream as well soon. Love you all and see you tomorrow. Peace. Review in the P.O. box I'll go you girl's face Sad in this good at prop Great names take on breaks Tiny Bernie Sanders LGBTQ Air Force The hole left at your fingertips On a at your door H3 crowded up, babe, the Young Turks online show. Three full fucking years of this, plenty more. 90 day fiance talks of champagne, bourgeoisie. A Trump rally live reaction on mass riot at DC. There he is again, her son is streaming, her son is streaming. There